Prior to the colonization of Nigeria by the British, there were ethnic groups, kingdoms, and villages existing in the West African country. They had traditional beliefs they lived by. These autonomous units had a well-structured political system, a fully functional government and economic system, religion, and social groups. They had all the basic organs of government and operated the system of checks and balances. The structure suited the culture and traditions of these African people. The existing cultural practices and well-coordinated way of living were disrupted by colonial rule. The European invaders fractured these African systems by superimposing their colonial ideologies, which on several occasions failed to coincide with the political environment. Obafemi Awolowo, in his book, Path to Nigerian Freedom, published in 1947, described Nigeria as a geographical expression and not a nation. To Awolowo, Nigeria is merely used to describe those who live within the boundaries of Nigeria. This is because Nigeria is only a mix of several ethnic groups disintegrated from each other and having their separate geographical and historical backgrounds. Colonialism was a culture for European states to superimpose their way of life and exploit the resources of the African kingdoms. The scramble for Africa by the European countries led to the division of the continent at the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference. The British succeeded in colonizing Nigeria, Ghana, the Gambia and Sierra Leone in West Africa. The 1884 partitioning of Africa led Nigeria to become a British territory and for the next 76 years was directly under British influence. Nigeria's labor and raw materials like cocoa, palm oil, granots, tin and cotton were exploited. Around the late 1880s, the British established a strong influence in the surrounding areas of the river Niger through Christianity and trade. They colonized West Africa to enrich their international trade and commerce. They began making political arrangements after the 1851 bombardment of Lagos, going on to amalgamate the Lagos colony and the Southern Protectorate in 1906. By 1914, the colonization of Nigeria was complete with the amalgamation of the Southern and Northern provinces. To successfully rule Nigeria, the British, under the command of Lord Frederick Lugard, adopted the indirect rule system. Warrant chiefs were appointed under the system to enforce law and order, collect taxes and arrest those who refused to cooperate with the British colonialists. This series looks at the full story of Nigeria and its turbulent history, from the Nok civilization to the 1851 bombardment of Lagos, the 1897 invasion of Benin, the 1902 and 1903 fall of Sokoto and Kano, the 1914 amalgamation of the Southern and Northern Protectorates of Nigeria, the country's eventual independence on October 1, 1960, the military coups, the 30-month brutal civil war, the June 12, 1993 presidential annulment, the Abacha years, and of course, the NSAS protest in October 2020. The terracotta sculptures of the Nok culture or civilization define it as one of Africa's and Nigeria's oldest cultures. The Nok culture was named after the village where the tin miners discovered the first terracotta head in 1928. The discovery of artistic terracotta sculptures was accidentally found during a mining operation by Bernard Fagg in Gemma and another near Enoch village around the middle of the 20th century. 
They were both recovered from the tin mining operations in Joss, Plateau, northern Nigeria. Bernard Fag found more clay figures and during the following years, he began collecting terracotta from tin mines. The sculptures were shaped like humans and animals. The similar features led Bernard Fag to regard it as a product of a single culture. Since the first discoveries, only a few excavations have been carried out in the Nok culture sites. The majority of these excavations took place in 1960. They never provided evidence of the background of these arts, including their settlements, economy, social and political structure of the societies. The only thing known is the terracotta sculptures. The artwork was evidence that specializations in a craft were earlier practiced in sub-Saharan African countries. Other details of the Nok culture art have been revealed by Bernard Fagg's excavation of Taruga. This excavation was carried out in the 1970s and it drew attention to the iron smelting site associated with terracotta fragments and has been dated back to the first millennium BC. The importance of the Nok sculptures has given rise to several speculations. Some believe that the figures represented gods and divinities of a society that believed in rituals and magic to conquer their environmental troubles and threats to their plants and animals being fertile. Others viewed the sculptures as grave gods which were used in burials and shrines. Another speculation was that the sculptures were royal art of a kingdom not known. These speculations lacked evidence. They were mainly discoveries without actual contextual information. The Nok culture has remained an inexplicable entity dated between 500 BC and 200 AD. It is not known when iron culture began in sub-Saharan Africa. Some believe it may have come from Carthage, modern-day Tunisia. Others believe it may have come from the kingdom of Meroe in Sudanese Nubia, where iron was being manufactured around 500 BC. However, the earliest practice of iron smelting technology in sub-Saharan Africa was done by the Nok culture. The iron practice led the Nok culture to move from the Stone Age to that of the Iron Age without going through the Bronze Age as it is noticeable in other developments. The Nok furnaces were known to appear in groups. One furnace was used for smelting process as it gets destroyed while the smelted iron is being removed. The next procedure requires constructing another furnace close to the old one. Thirteen iron furnaces were found in Taruga alone with iron tools like holes and axes which were used for agriculture. Evidence of early iron in the Enoch cultures comes from the Taruga sites excavated by Bernard Fagg in the 1960s. He found iron smelting furnaces dating back to 500 BC. This is also the approximate age of iron in Carthage and Meroe. Taruga excavations expose the older settlement of Nok culture, which was between the 4th and 2nd century BC, based on the radiocarbon data of charcoal found on the iron surfaces. Nok culture in Nigeria covered an area of over 78,000 square kilometers. There were discoveries of weapons like an iron arrow and a spearhead, which suggest that life was not always peaceful among the Nok people or their rivals. Nok culture declined around 200 AD, but the reason remains unknown. It could have been climate change, migration or conflicts with rival kingdoms. Recent research suggests that the Nok culture existed around the middle of the first millennium BC and vanished less than a millennium later. What preceded the Nok culture has not been published. It is impossible to believe that such a display of aesthetic beauty and abilities by the artisans did not have any preface of development. The elegance of the Nok terracotta has led scholars to believe that an undiscovered tradition may have preceded the Nok art. Nok artisans made use of the coil method for their terracotta figurines made from local clays and gravel. 
Their abilities are seen in how these works have survived for over a millennium. This is not to say that the Nox sculpture survived and remained unchanged over time. As a result of the erosion of the sleep, a mixture of water and clay used to give the pottery surfaces a smooth appearance. On many Nox sculptures, they lost their original smoothness and even texture did not reflect the original smooth appearance. The figures, however, explained very little of what their social life was like. Scenes relating to illness, love, war, and so on were depicted in their figures. The sculptures had standing, sitting, kneeling, and genuflecting-like poses. A figure showed a man and a woman kneeling in a romantic embrace. Another showed a man with his mouth open like he was singing with another playing the drums. Another showed a prisoner with ropes tied around his arms and neck. Men and women had eyes shaped like triangles, big noses, mouths and ears with their pupils represented by a small hole. Some were believed to be associated with rituals wearing a particular type of clothing adorned with heavy pieces of jewelry, which were not likely to be worn every day, while some of the figures held weapons and others were seated with an arm resting on a raised knee. Knock artworks were reserved in a national museum in Jos, established by Bernard Fagg. They were gotten from the excavations carried out in the 1960s. The complexity of the Nok culture and its settlement requires an extensive archaeological study. Although the excavations will demand the use of sophisticated logistics, they would help in determining the origin of early figural art in sub-Saharan Africa. The Nok civilization, according to the artifacts, prospered between 500 BC and 200 AD, before it vanished from existence. The Nok arts occupy an important position in Nigeria's history. About some centuries later, another civilization south of the Nok, the Benin Kingdom, would reach its height with even more popular sculptures and bronze heads that are still visible today. Prior to the rule of Oba Oronyo, around the 13th century, the Benin Kingdom was under the rule of the Ogisos. Then, it was known as Igodomigodo, with Ubekun as the capital, until Ogisoere moved the capital to Umundurum. However, the Idu people, now known as Edo, were not satisfied with the rule of the Ogisos, so they invited Prince Oronyo, also known as Oromio of Ileife, to rule over them. After some years, Oronyo left his son Iweka to rule over the kingdom while he left to establish another kingdom known as Oyo, which later became a powerful empire in the 17th century. Oba Iweka would establish the kingdom and rule until his death. Eleven other princes would succeed him until Oba Iware became king around the year 1440 and expanded the kingdom. It was during his reign that the Benin kingdom reached its height. Oba Iware authorized the nationwide construction of hundreds of walls around the kingdom to separate the lands into district areas based on the kind of trade that would be carried out there. His idea ensured that from the exterior to the interior, his kingdom would remain properly secured. Iware also made foreign investments to fund the rebuilding of his city, which had been destroyed during the civil war with his predecessor. The Uzama, a group of hereditary chiefs in the Benin Kingdom, held the power to ordain and limit the power of the king. However, Iwara restricted their powers and empowered his trusted allies. This way, he prevented any uprising or coup throughout his reign and created a new line of succession to the throne. Oba Eware not only succeeded in creating a new line of succession, but he also built a strong economy and security around his borders. His achievements led the people and city into a golden age era, 
making the Benin Kingdom famous for its ivory, bronze and sculptures where a majority are still displayed in British museums today. For nearly 200 years, Portugal dominated world trade as a result of the technological and cultural advantages it possessed. In the 1440s, the Portuguese sent out explorers on voyages to the east to search for a new sea route. It was during one of their explorations that Roy de Sequeira, a Portuguese sailor, reached the Bight of Benin. Sequeira arrived at Benin during the reign of Oba Eware in 1472. He gathered information about the kingdom and saw for himself the rich African monarchical system of the Benin kingdom. Eware at the time was focused on the rebuilding and restructuring of his kingdom and paid no interest to foreign visitors during his lifetime. Therefore, no serious contact was made with the kingdom until 1486 when the Portuguese sailor and explorer John Afonso de Avuero visited Oba Uzulua. Contrary to Oba Iwari, who was focused on the internal affairs of his kingdom and paid no interest to visitors like Sequera, Oba Uzulua welcomed Afonso de Avuero. He allowed the Portuguese to trade slaves and other goods that might interest them. Uzulua had been described as the first Oba of Benin who received the Europeans in his kingdom. Although Sequera was the first Portuguese to visit Benin in 1472, he was unable to establish any serious contact as Iwari, the king at the time, was focused on the domestic affairs of the kingdom rather than receiving visitors. However, Afonso de Avero was able to establish contact with the Benin kingdom. There are several reasons why John Afonso de Avero is more publicized and recognized by scholars. First, Afonso de Avero came into the Benin Kingdom with the full support of King John II, the new King of Portugal, who had ascended the throne in 1481. The king had good reports about the existence of the Benin Kingdom and its structures and sent de Avero to garner more information about the kingdom. Second, Obao Zulua was interested in receiving visitors and carrying out trade with them. He was able to trade slaves and other products with the Portuguese. He sent Ohen Okun, the chief of Ogutsun, with John Afonso de Avero to meet with the king of Portugal to properly discuss the new trade relations. Ohen Okun was the chief of Ogutsun and the chief priest of the Oloku temple. He was a direct descendant of Prince Ekalidera, the only child of Ogiso Owodu the last Ogiso of the Ogiso dynasty in the 11th century. Ugotun, a village and a port in the Benin kingdom, was the place through which the Portuguese voyaged into the city. Ohenokun served as an ambassador under the reign of Oba Ozulua and Oba Esige. He was chosen as an ambassador as he possessed the qualities. According to Roy de Pina, he was a man of wisdom and eloquent speech. These are the reasons why most scholars disregard Roy de Sequeira's visit in 1472 and revere John Afonso de Avuero's visit to the Benin Kingdom. The international trade relation between the Europeans and the Benin Kingdom started around the 15th century. The basic purpose of the international relationship that Benin had with the Portuguese, Dutch, French and British was mostly trading. Other reasons included Christianity and diplomatic relations. From the very first trade relations, the Europeans needed slaves. It was at the port in Guatu, also known as Ugutung, which was a slave factory that they purchased their first largest volume of slave. The English ships came and purchased slaves from the seaport during the slave trade period. These first set of slaves were criminals who had been marked as outcasts. Originally, pepe was the only item that encouraged trade relationships between Benin and the Europeans. The Portuguese sought a particular variety of pepe that could compete with the Indian spice. The pepe found in Benin was provided to be satisfactory and fit the need of the Portuguese. The Oba of Benin was also ready to sell the pepper to them. Aside from the slave and pepper trade, the European traders also purchased ivory, which they sold to English colonies in the West Indies and North America. 
On their return, they would carry colonial produce from these colonies. English ships from Liverpool, England, came to buy slaves from the Benin Kingdom. Most of these English ships belonged to private traders. They bought it twice the price the Dutch offered. Existing records say that about five ships came from Liverpool in 1752 to Benin to buy about 1,280 slaves. Portugal in the mid-16th century, the Netherlands in the late 16th to early 18th century, and Britain in the mid-18th to 19th century were all influential European powers in the Benin Kingdom. They were also the French, Germans, and other Europeans. Manilas and brass bracelets were the popular forms of money used in the slave trade. In 1506, slaves cost about 12 to 15 manilas. The price rose to 57 manilas in 1517. Curry shells later replaced manilas after the 1520s. In the mid-17th to 18th century, slaves became the primary goods purchased by the Europeans. Male prisoners and some of the Benin citizens were sold, unlike in the late 16th to 17th century when Benin never sold its citizens but foreign captives, inclusive of Ijo, Ibo, Sobo and others. In a year, Benin supplied an estimated amount of about 3,000 slaves. In the late 16th century, other European nations, aside from the Portuguese, became interested in West Africa. They included the Dutch, the French, and the British. The British attempted to lessen the Oba's influence on trade. They invaded and conquered the kingdom. They captured the Oba of Benin and carted away sculptures and works of ivory and brass. Some of the artworks the British plundered had been kept in the king's palace. They were made between 1550 and 1650. The institution of slavery had been in existence prior to the exploration of African societies by the Europeans. The diversity in the treatment and use of slaves has over the years transformed in comparison to when this institution started. Slavery as an institution became more prevalent from the 16th century onwards. However, alternative forms of this institution had been in existence. One of such alternative was pawnship, the offering of one of the children of the head of a family to a creditor until the debt is paid off. Slaves had several functions which they performed and in some societies even became an integral part of the development of such societies. The emergence of the Portuguese on the coast of West Africa engendered the plundering of African society even further by the Europeans. The Portuguese were the first set of Europeans to set foot on West African soil and had established a trading station on the coast of Guato, which came to be known as the port of Benin City in 1480. However, trade between Europeans and Africans initially centered on luxury goods such as textiles, pepe, and gold. Slaves only became an important aspect of the trade when plantation labor was established by the Americans in the 16th century. The demand for slavery was on the rise in the first half of the 16th century and between 1600 and 1800, the port of the Bight of Benin had shipped out about 1.5 million slaves. Over 1.2 million of these enslaved Africans were sold in the 18th century alone. By the late 18th century, the European economies began to shift from agriculture to industrialization, and the clamor for the abolition of the slave trade began in earnest. In 1807, the British Parliament passed the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act, which ended the buying and selling of enslaved people within the British Empire. However, Around this period, Usman Danfodio, the pioneer of the Sokoto Caliphate, was waging jihad across present-day northern Nigeria. Around the period the British were abolishing the slave trade across their empire, Usman Danfodio, also known as the Shou, 
was carrying out jihad across the Sokoto Caliphate up to Kanem Borno, where it eventually failed. Dan Fodi was a scholar from West Africa, as well as a religious teacher, revolutionary, writer, and a pioneer of the Sokoto Caliphate. He was the brain box behind the unrest of the socio-political sphere in Hausa land that eventually led to the 1804 Sokoto Jihad, which engulfed present-day northern Nigeria until it was stopped by Muhammad al-Kanemi's forces in Kanem Borno. Usman Danfodi was born in the year 1754 in Marata, Gober, a then Hausa state, but grew up in Dengel town. He and his brother Abdullahi were largely taught the Quran by their father. Their father also provided them with the best Islamic education there was at the time. Little wonder why Usman Danfodi was able to travel throughout Hausa land and as far away as the Saharan city of Agadez, studying under various teachers, notably Malam Jibril and Malam Usman Binduri. When he was about 20 years old, Danfodio became a traveling preacher and teacher while he was still studying. At the apex of his studies, he became an expert in the Arabic language and Islamic theology and was already a master in public speaking and poetry writing. Usman Danfodio used his wealth of knowledge to attract devoted disciples. He rapidly got followership within his community, which encouraged him to travel to other Hausa states where he was met with further luck in attracting more students. Danfodio and his disciples began to call upon the nominal Muslim rulers in Hausa land to accept and practice Orthodox Islam and to remove from their courts non-Islamic customs and habits. He urged them to stop tolerating paganism, worshipping idols, believing in the power of divination and simply to be governed by the strict principles of the Qadiriya law. Danfodio also questioned the unfair enslavement and taxation of the Fulanese by the local rulers. Furthermore, he revolted against the unlawful confiscation of properties belonging to the peasants in the community. Many have also termed Usman Danfodio an activist for women's rights because part of his clamor against the local rulers then was their treatment of women. Women during this period were regarded as second-class citizens. They were denied education as well as other basic social amenities. Even worse, in the name of religion, they were made to observe prada, which often resulted in long-lasting imprisonment. His plights for a fairer and more humanely treatment of his Fulani brethren can be traced to a series of visions he'd had where he'd believed that the Prophet Muhammad and Abd al-Qadri Jilani, the founder of the Qadiriya order, mandated him to pick up the sword of truth for his followers to defend themselves from their wicked and selfish rulers. All of these put Usman Danfodu at odds with the local kings to the extent that in 1802, Yunfa, the ruler of Gober attempted to assassinate him. Danfodio and his followers had to flee into the province of Gudu, where they turned to the local Fulani nomads for help and refuge. By 1804, Usman felt he had no other option but to declare jihad to implement these revolutions which he dearly sought. He took on the role of Amir al-Munimin, commander of the faithful, and the call for jihad traveled far and wide the Hausa land, including notable states such as Kano, Darwa, Katsina, Zaria, Borno, Gombe, Adamawa, and Nupe. These places were largely occupied by the Fulani people. A widespread insurgency began in Hausa land. The insurgents were predominantly composed of an army of Fulanese and other Hausa peasants who had had enough of the oppression of their overlords. They grabbed the opportunity to free themselves from slavery and the illegal taxation to which they had been subjected for years. Worthy of note is that Danfodio never personally led an army nor fought in the battle. His role was strictly spiritual and consultative. He left the army in the hands of his generals, including his brother Abdullahi and son Muhammad Bello. By 1808, 
Four years since the war began, almost all the Hausa rulers had been replaced by Fulani emirs, who recognized and submitted to the supreme authority of Usman Danfodio. The culmination of all the lands they had conquered and taken territory formed the famous Sokoto Caliphate. In 1812, the leadership of the Sokoto Caliphate was divided between Abdullahi and Muhammad Bello, while Danfodio stepped back and retired into a secluded lifestyle where he continued teaching and writing, but distanced from the political matters within the caliphate. The only real opposition to the Fulani conquest was in Borno. In 1808, the Fulanis intended to penetrate the jihad in Kanem Borno, a combination of two states, Kanem and Borno. However, these regions had their clerical class and traditions. Muhammad al Kanemi, leader of the Kanem province, contested the Fulani advance. Al Kanemi was an Islamic scholar and a warlord known Sefawa, who had formed a coalition of Shua Arabs, Kanembu, and other semi nomadic people. He rebelled against the jihad on the ground that the so-called Fulani clerics had no right to interpret Muslim law for the governance of humanity. By 1826, al-Kanemi was the ruling master of a new Islamic state, while the Mays, original traditional Borno state rulers before the merger of Kanem Borno, retained office until 1846. Umar al kanemis son eventually ended this age-long dynasty of the Mays when he succeeded the last standing May. Another reason for the failure of the Usman Danfodio Sokoto Jihad in Kanem Borno may be attributed to the fact that the people believed that the task of making Islam known to all rested on them as individuals. That is, they believed every Muslim has the capacity to carry the message of the Prophet to others. Their prophetic tradition says, preach even if it may be one verse. Thus, the Kanemborunu people preferred an adopted peaceful means of spreading Islam and not the forceful methods Usman Danfodil and his Fulani scholars had used in other states. Not long afterwards, the Kanembronu state was met with a decline because Umar could not meet up with his father's pace and he gradually allowed the kingdom to be ruled by advisors. Eventually, the state was occupied by the British at the turn of the 20th century and joined with other British colonial territories that have become Nigeria today. Usman Danfodio retired after 1811 and continued to write about the moral actions of the Muslim faith. Upon Danfodio's death in 1817, Muhammad Bello, his son, succeeded him as Sultan and became the ruler of the Sokoto Caliphate, which at the time was the largest state south of the Sahara. Usman's brother Abdullahi was appointed the Emir of Gwandu and was put in charge of the Western Emirates of Nupe and Iloring. Thus, all the Hausa provinces, parts of the Nupe, Iloring, and Fulani outpost in Bauchi and Adamawa were all ruled by a single political religious structure. From the time of Usman Danfodio, there had been 12 caliphs until the British conquest of Sokoto, led by Lord Frederick Lugard in 1903. However, before the British conquered Sokoto at the beginning of the 20th century, they had bombarded and occupied Lagos some 50 years before. After the abolition of the slave trade, the British government began to seek ways to end the slave business and introduce a legitimate trade, especially in West Africa. There was no better place to start than Lagos. The city had been a particularly attractive area for the British, who had marked it as the main gateway to the vast, unexplored opportunities of the interior Yoruba land. 
This only meant that if the British were to suppress the slave trade, promote legitimate trade, and civilize the natives, the occupation of Lagos was essential to their mission. At the time, there was a power tussle between Oba Akintoye and Prince Kusoko. Kusoko was branded a notorious slave trader and was seen as an opposition to legitimate trade and an impediment to the general advancement of civilization. He aligned with some war chiefs to usurp the throne he claimed was rightfully his, and after three weeks of what was known as Ogun Olomiro or Salt Water War, Oba Akintoye eventually ceded defeat and fled to Abelkuta where he sought temporary asylum. Since Ado and Ashikba, Akinshimoyi, Ologun Kutere, Eshinloku, Akintoye, and Kusoko were the most active slave merchants in Lagos, transporting more Africans to the Americans than any other king. By 1840, the population of Lagos had exploded and more than half of the people were either domestic slaves or slaves on the verge of being exported. Males were processed for export, while females were mainly enslaved natives. Thus, the proceeds from the slave trade continued to flow in. Slave money was used to buy the 25 guns that lined the Lagos Island, leading to the king's palace. The money accrued from the slave trade was used to purchase velvet clothing, royal umbrellas, caps, and elegant robes worn by obas and chiefs to command respect and adoration among their people. Oba Kusoko, in fact, performed something that no king had ever done before. He acquired slaves he had sold from Bahia, Brazil, because he needed their carpentry, masonry, and coppering talents to build Brazilian-style buildings and manufacture European products in Lagos. Around the year 1821, Ajayi, later Samuel Ajayi Crowther, his mother and sister were kidnapped by Fulani slave raiders when they invaded his town of Oshogun, 140 kilometers from the Lagos coast. After being removed from his family, Ajayi was traded for a horse. A year later, the young boy became ill and attempted suicide after learning that his new owner, planned to export him by transporting him to Little Popo, a thriving high-paying Portuguese slave market that was a key outlet for slaves from the Oyo Empire. In modern-day Togo, Little Popo is now known as Anihu. Fearing that Ajayi's suicide attempt would succeed before the next slave trade, his owner immediately switched him for a bottle of English wine and some tobacco leaves. He was bought in Ijebu and transported to Lagos, where he was sold to the Portuguese slave ship Esperanza Feliz, meaning free spirit. As the ship proceeded towards America, he lost hope and prepared for death. However, on April 7, 1822, the HMS Mermadon, captained by Sir Henry Leake of the Royal Navy's anti-slavery squadron, attacked the Portuguese slave ship in a shootout. Ajayi, the 13-year-old boy captive, and some other captives were rescued and transported to the British settlement in Freetown, today's capital of Sierra Leone. The British started the policy of relocating slaves to Freetown because, earlier on, when captives were handed over to Oba Adele, Eshinloko, and Gezo, or any other monarchy along the coastlines of the Bight of Benin, they were resold into slavery after the British seamen returned to their ships. The Church Missionary Society, CMS, which ran the Freetown settlement, taught Ajayi to read and write, enrolled him at Foray Bay College, and sent him to England to further his education. He was fluent in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, as well as a variety of West African languages. Ajayi's public talks drew large crowds all over Britain because he was a complaining personality, a highly educated black man, an ex-slave, and an established writer. Later, he received an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. 
Sir Henry Leake, the captain of the ship that saved Ajayi from slavery in 1822, traveled over to see Ajayi. Samuel Ajayi Crowther became the first black bishop inducted into the Anglican Church on June 29, 1864, in Canterbury Cathedral. Lady Weeks, his English alphabet teacher, was also present. It was a heartbreaking reunion. Being invited to meet the Queen was the highest honour a visitor could receive in the 19th century England. Crowther was invited to Windsor Castle with Lord Russell on November 18, 1851, where he met Prince Albert and his wife, Queen Victoria. Ajayi described his enslavement, the atrocities he endured, and the state of slavery in Lagos as of 1851. When Queen Victoria inquired about what she should do about the slavery problem on the West African coast, Ajayi Crowther replied, Seize Lagos by fire, by force. One month later, in December 1851, the British attacked Lagos. A sea-to-land struggle broke out between the Lagosians and the British. The first concern was the safety of the supply of gunpowder, which was essential to fighting. The efficacy of the artillery force, which switched from using bows and arrows to cannon fire, rocket fire and muskets, determined whether the war was won or lost. Thus, gunpowder was essential. For the 5,000 men firing muskets, a ridge was built among the marina's 3-kilometer length, offering ideal cover. Due to the lagoon's shallow waters, the larger warships HMS Penelope and HMS Samson, with greater devastating force, stayed at a distance. As a result, the British Royal Navy relied on the HMS Bloodhound, HMS Taser and countless smaller boats from the larger warships. Oshodi Takwa, the commander of Lagos Army, had anticipated this. The odds of wiping out the British increased as the impending battle was reduced to an infantry-to-infantry -infantry contest. The Lagosians might not have a chance if the British ships with their 32-pound caliber cannons engaged. To further prevent any ship or boat from having the necessary navigation depth should they move towards the shore, two rows of spiked coconut tree stems were placed underwater, an engineering masterpiece by the locals. The Lagosians then placed long-range cannons on piles above sea level, ready for the Royal Navy. On Christmas Day, December 25, 1851, Oshodi Takwa gave the order to fire at the British ships that had gathered together for weeks under a white flag of truce to plan their course of action. Takwa wanted to lure them into the waiting danger as swiftly as possible. The British fleet, led by the HMS Bloodhound, started to sail inwards the following morning on Boxing Day, December 26, 1851, and shortly after that, Osho de Takwa's soldiers fled. But that was only a decoy. The British were subsequently ambushed by the Lagosians, who murdered one officer and 13 men while wounding four officers and more than 60 others, including Lieutenant Corbett. Osho de Takwa's soldiers captured one of the boats and it was the turn of the British to flee. It was a bad day for the Royal Navy. The next morning, December 27, 1851, the British forces depended on an artillery storm. They knew that they would lose if they stepped ashore to engage in infantry combat. However, the presence of their dead colleagues on the ship heightened the ferocity with which cannon and rocket fire erupted from the cannons and barraged Lagos. Takwa's soldiers were terrified as the city erupted in a sea of flames and a gunpowder magazine detonated. The result was a display of anguish, blood and tears just like any war. A small community called Agidingbi which is an onomatopoeic description of a deafening pounding of landing cannons, was formed by some of the Lagosians who managed to escape the blaze and fled to the northern outskirts of the city. Kusoko and Oshodi Takba escaped to the eastern part of Lagos. The Royal Navy needed people to spread the news to the remote areas of Lagos that a new force had arrived, so they urged them to flee far from the city. 
Some important letters, 48 of them between Kusoko and his slave traders, were among the royal belongings that the triumphant invaders led by Commodore Henry Bruce took from Kusoko's abandoned palace. The letters are now being held at the British National Archives. After the bombardment and occupation of Lagos, the British reinstated Akitoye as the King of Lagos. On January 1, 1852, a treaty for the abolition of the slave trade in Lagos was signed between Her Majesty Queen Victoria of England and the King and Chiefs of Lagos. Beyond the desire to end the slave trade, however, was also the economic desire to control the trade of Lagos from which they also hoped to exploit its resources. After the death of Oba Akitoye on September 2, 1853, his son Dosumu succeeded him as king. However, Oba Dosumu could neither keep nor suppress the slave trade but would be accused of reviving the slave trade in Lagos. The well-meaning but weak Dosumu was persuaded to cede the ports and island of Lagos in return for a pension. The Oba, afraid that the British might no longer support him, hence allowing the former King Kusoko to strike, gave in to the demands of the British who had threatened to unleash violence on Lagos if Dosumu did not sign the treaty. So, on August 6, 1861, Lagos became a colony of Great Britain. The British colonial authorities then implemented measures to ensure that no harm came to Oba Dosumu. He was given a yearly pension of 1,200 bags of carries, estimated at £1,000 per year, as long as he abided by the treaty. With the annexation of Lagos, the British then took the next step to conquer the whole of Yoruba land, whose different tribes had been fighting a series of civil wars for 72 years. The decline of the Oyo Empire in the early 1800s led to a series of civil wars between different states in Yoruba land, with Ibadan emerging as the most dominant. In 1840, Ibadan became the main bulwark against further progress of the Fulani invasion. The same year, Ibadan defeated the Fulani invaders at Oshubu, which checked the jihad movement of the Fulani to the south of Yoruba land. However, the defeat did not deter the Fulanis, who soon turned their attention to the eastern part, attacking the Ekiti town of Otun. This led to an outbreak of hostilities between Ibado and Ilori. Ibado enjoyed great success as they had developed into a military meritocracy and were able to dislodge the Fulani jihadists at Otun. In 1862, Ibado turned its attention to Ijai and successfully defeated its western rival. At the time, Ibadan had control of Ijai and had turned into a powerhouse amongst the Yoruba people. Seeking to extend its frontiers of domination, Ibadan soon turned its gaze to other Yoruba city-states and this eventually culminated in the Yoruba Civil Wars. The Yoruba Civil War of the 19th century can be divided into three stages. The first stage identified the collapse of Oyo and the breakout of the Owu War, which was the first of the civil war in 1821. The second stage in 1861 was distinguished by the power rivalry between Ibado and the Abel Kuta Ijai forces. There was a struggle for power caused by the decline of Oyo. This period marked the first intervention which the British had with the Yoruba civil wars and their affairs. The third stage saw the rise of the Ekitik Barakbo and other coalition forces of Ijebu and Ilori, who were against the military might of Ibada. The wars ended in 1893. 
The Oyo Empire was one of the largest and most prosperous empires in West Africa between the 18th and 19th centuries. The empire dominated the lives of the Yoruba people for many years. Led by the ruler known as the Alafi, the Oyo Empire had a thriving slave institution which not only helped boost the economy of the empire but also aided in the success of the administration of Oyo. The Alafi, although with supreme authority, was kept in check by a group of chiefs of seven of the non-royal lineages. These chiefs, known as the Oyo Messi, served as the head advisory council to the Alafi. While the role of the Alafi was acknowledged, this system of decentralization was in place to check his authority. However, and unfortunately, the struggle for power and a series of internal conflicts, especially between the Alafi and the Oyo Messi, would lead to the eventual collapse of the great Oyo Empire. The gradual decline of the empire came in the early 1750s when Bashar Ga, the leader of the Oyo Messi, secured the suicides of two Alafins, Labisi and Awobioju. His tyrannical reign came to an end around the year 1770 when Alafin Abiodun sought help from the provinces of Oyo and eventually killed the Bashar. As a result, the influence and power of the Oyo Messi were diminished and the control of the Alafin was never the same again. The most devastating revolt, which dealt a huge blow to the authority of the Alafin, was the one led by Afonja, the Areono Kakanfo at Ilori. As Areono Kakanfo, Afonja was the commander-in-chief of the provincial army and also one of the most important and powerful officers serving the Alafin. Afonja, in a plot with other prominent chiefs of the Oyo Messi, asked Allah Finaole, Abiodun's successor, to commit suicide. This was due to Afonja's lack of belief in the capabilities of the Allah Fien and also Afonja's quest for power. This event occurred in the year 1796, and the Oyo Messi would choose Prince Adebo as the next Allah Fien to the disdain of Afonja. Unable to stomach the turn of events, Afonja declared independence from Oyo and retired to Ilori. He would engage in a series of battles with Oyo which would end in a stalemate for years. Eventually, Afonja would form a coalition with Fulani Muslims who were keen on extending the jihad of Usman Danfodio into Yoruba land. However, the romance would not last for long as a jihadist around the year 1824 turned against Afonja killed him and incorporated Inlori into the Sokoto Caliphate. The Oyo Empire soon began to lose its military dominance. The Egba, a territory under the empire, also revolted and gained independence around 1796. Owu, the empire's main ally, was besieged by Ife and Ijebu forces around 1822. Sokoto forces based in Inlori constantly attacked the city by 1837, Ilori had gained absolute control over Oyo and most of the other important towns within its surrounding areas. The collapse of the Oyo Empire by the Fulanese led to the scampering away to safety by some subgroups of the empire. These refugees regrouped themselves in New Oyo and formed several city-states. These city-states had their political systems and while they functioned as autonomous entities, they maintained technical allegiance to the Alafi of Oyo. Of these city-states, Ibado and Ijai were the most powerful. To check the excesses of the Fulanese in Ilori and to stop any further encroachment, Ibado and Ijai had the responsibility from Alafi and Tiba to provide the needed security for the other city-states. Ijai protected Yoruba towns in the western provinces while Ibado protected the towns in the eastern regions. In 1840, 
Ibano defeated the Fulani invaders at Oshobo, slaughtered them all the way to Ofa, near Ilorin, and captured their horses, which they eventually used as food. Afterwards, in 1862, Ibado defeated Ijai after the death of Kurumi. Several battles fought by the Ibado against the towns of Ikiti and Ijesha were punitive. The wars were to bring independent towns under the authority of Ibado. By 1877, Ibadan had brought almost all the Yoruba states under the authority of the Alafi. Ibadan's presence in the towns were represented by its messengers. The administration was marked by ruthlessness and oppression. The eastern region had become a ground to obtain and draw in slaves for the Ibadan soldiers. A newly installed military commander in Ibadan proved himself by embarking on military expeditions. The war loots were used to increase their wealth and the captives were made as slaves and used to boost their armies. The people of Ijesha and Ekiti found their subjective behavior towards their towns unacceptable. They appealed to the area on Okakanfo, Momodu Latosa, to check the excesses of the Ajeles, but the subjective treatment continued. This built up hostilities towards the Ibadan and the Ijesha, Ekiti and their four forces formed the confederation called Ekiti Parapo to revolt against the Ibado hegemony. The first contact between Ibado and the Eastern Yoruba forces was between Ibado and Ekiti. It was called Ogun Jalumi which ended in a shame of defeat for the Ekiti forces. The Jalumi or the Battle of Ikiru took place in the northeast of present-day Oshun State, Nigeria, on November 1, 1878. It was a fraction of the main conflict called the Ibado War or Ekiti Parakwa War. The Ibadan forces defeated the rebellious Yoruba soldiers from Ilori, Ijesha, Ekiti and Ila, this defeat led the Ekiti to call on Ogidengbe, a tall, fiery fellow, for assistance. He had refused to join the war as the Ibado were his benefactors from where he gained military training. Eventually, Ogidengbe later joined the Ekiti Barakbo. Other Yoruba towns were also enlisted to join the Ekiti Barakbo. They included the Egbe, Akoko, Igbomina, Kaba, and the Oworo. Ijebu and Lagos also assisted in the war. They went against the Western Yoruba Ibado and its allies, like the Mudakeke, the Ofa, and Oyo dominions on the Ibado side. The civil war was a long, bitter one, which was said to have lasted for 16 years with severe casualties on both sides. The original cause of the war was said to have been the decline of the Oyo Empire and the immediate cause being the exertion of dominance by the Ibadan military on the Yoruba towns in the northeastern regions, which caused them to revolt against Ibadan, who had a desire to rule over the towns following the decline of the Oyo Empire. The use of European weapons contributed to the outcomes of the Yoruba civil wars in the 19th century. The Ijebu in the Owu War first made use of firearms. They took advantage of their control of the trade routes to Lagos to acquire European guns. It was in the Owu War that firearms were first used. The fall of Owu was attributed to the lack of European firearms by the defenders. Guns were scarce in the first half of the 19th century. It was weapons like swords, axes and spears that were used in battle. Ibadan was initially involved in another war between Egba and Ijebu over trade in 1877 before their contact with the Eastern Yoruba forces. Egba attacked Ibadan traders who came from Port Novo with firearms. Ijesha and Ekiti took advantage of this war and declared independence in 1878. They massacred Ibadan officials in Igbomina, Ekiti and Ijesha. This war would last for 16 years. The Ibado and Ekiti Parapo forces met at Kiriji. The control of the trade routes was an issue. 
Egba, Ondo and Ijebu were the three main routes. The Ondo route was opened by the British due to the frequent closure of the other roads. Ondo was the main supply route for both sides during the war. With a change in the course of the war, the Ekitikmara soon gained the advantage. They got arms and ammunition from Brazil returnees and other Yoruba people outside the country who supported their quest. They were also supplied with powerful rifles and guns, which gave them an edge over Ibadan. Ibadan faced devastating effects due to the new weapons. If they had not acquired modern weapons from the Ijebu coast, they would have lost the war. Ibadan also faced many difficulties during the war. Apart from how well equipped in weaponry the Akitik Barapo forces were, they also had to fight on five fronts. One in the south against Egba, two in the same south against Ijebu, three in the east at Kiriji against the Akitik Barapo under the command of Ugedengbe, four in the north at Ofa and finally at Ileife, whose soldiers had joined an alliance against Ibadan in 1882. Despite the disadvantage that the Ibadan forces faced, the five fronts could not defeat them. The British colonialists then intervened with interest in trade during the period of the scramble and partitioning of Africa. Attempts to resolve the wars had begun around 1879 and 1880 before the war eventually came to an end 13 years later. The Alafi and the Oni were involved but neither was to be trusted. Lagos was instructed by London and Accra not to intervene even though the war was having adverse effects on its economy. From 1882 to 1884, the British did nothing but after 1885, things changed. The scramble and partitioning of Africa was soon to take place and the British had to act because of the French. Also, those involved in the war were slowly getting tired. In 1886, peace negotiations began and a ceasefire was called through the efforts of Bishop of Undo, Charles Phillips, and the Anglican priest and Yoruba historian, the Reverend Samuel Johnson. Under Governor Corlinius Alfred Moliné of Lagos, the parties signed a treaty to provide independence for Ekitik Barapo towns and Modakeke to be evacuated to suit Ife. Although the war was still dragged on as some of the forces were adamant to disband. In 1888, an employee with a French company had come to negotiate with the Egba chiefs to sign a treaty allowing for the construction of a rail line link with Port Novo. This was a direct threat to the British and their interest. Their fears of the French became justified, although the treaty was not endorsed. Britain began to take aggressive measures in gaining control of the interiors. Governor Gilbert Carter succeeded Moliney and arrived in Lagos on February 3, 1891, and understood that the issue was in the control of the trade routes between Ijebu and Egba. These led to the brutal invasion of Ijebu in 1892. The trade routes of Ijebu and Igba were then opened. In 1893, Governor Carter made treaties with Igba and Oyo and was finally able to persuade the Ekitik Barapo and Ibadan forces to disband. The Igba nation then opened their road to Ibadan and the construction of a railway followed. The Yoruba civil wars majorly brought an adverse effect on the economic activities of the Yoruba land. Oyo, known in the 18th century as the most significant exporter of slaves, declined in a civil war after the 1820s. The new power centers of Ibadan, Owo, Wari and Abeokuta fought for the slave route to access a new supply of slaves. The civil wars gave access to the slave raiding of the Yoruba people by those who needed capital to gain firearms to continue in the vicious wars. The wars also sowed a seed of discord between the people which affected economic progress. The civil war also led to the displacement of people which affected economic activities in Yoruba land. 
there was a southward migration of refugees who had been displaced and rendered homeless by the wars, which increased the population of Ibado and Abelkuta. On the other hand, the wars brought about adverse casualties to both sides. Under the guise of ending the slave trade, the British colonizers stamped their authority over the Yoruba states and annexed all of the West as their dominion. The British set their sight to dominating all of present-day southern Nigeria, especially the Niger Delta, where they sought to control the palm oil trade there. However, the conquest would not be easy as they were met with strong resistance by two prominent leaders in the region. King Jaja of Okobo and Governor Nana Olomu of the Benin River. After the annexation of Lagos and the whole of Yoruba land, the British proceeded to dominate all of present day southern Nigeria. Following the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, Britain would lay claim to this region while expanding its influence. However, it wouldn't be a walk in the park, as the colonialists were met with fierce opposition from several prominent rulers in the area, especially in the Niger Delta region. This opposition would lead to the deposition, removal and banishment of these rulers from their kingdoms. Chief among these rulers were King Jaja of Okobo and Governor Nana Olomu of the Benin River. Born around 1821 in Amaibo village, in the Orlu district of Igbo land, Jubo Jubogba, a name given to him by his master, would go on to rise from penury and slavery into affluence, wealth and extraordinary leadership. He later became known as Jaja of Okobo. As a slave boy in the house of the king of Boni, Jaja proved to be highly resourceful discharging his duties with a tremendous amount of effectiveness and enthusiasm. Following the death of Chief Alali, Jaja was elected head of the Opoboani Pebble Trading House. As an astute businessman, he would go on to expand the influence of the trading house and increase operations in the hinterland. In 1868, a rival trading house led by Chief Oko Jumbo attacked his trading post. Instead of resorting to war, Jaja would relocate his traded house to a new settlement, which he named Okobo. Thus, he became independent of Boni. Within a few years, he expeditiously drew the palm oil trade from Boni as he served as a middleman between the European merchants and the produce sellers in the interior. One of the ways by which the British sought to take over these lands was by the signage of treaties promising the protection of these lands. A notable treaty which Jaja signed was that of 1873. This treaty would see Jaja become recognized as king of Okobo by the British. It also stipulated that no European trading establishments would be permitted in Okobo and that Okobo River would be closed to traders above a certain point. In 1881, Jaja's troubles with the British merchants began. George Watts had opened his factory in Kwa Iboe, a suburb within Jaja's jurisdiction. As a result, Jaja led two disciplinary expeditions to the region on April 11, 1881 and May 16, 1881, respectively. He claimed sovereignty over the Kwa Iboe River and its people. Consul Hewitt, who had the mission of signing treaties, would warn Jaja off, stating that the Kwa Ibo River and its people were under the protection of the British. This would lead to a disagreement which continued until 1884. Another worrying issue that broke out between Jaja and the British was a signage of the Protectorate Treaty. At the time, the trade depression in England from the 1880s spurred the British traders into assuming that their profits would increase if they could thwart Jaja's middleman's role in the eastern Niger Delta. In order to achieve this goal, they sought the assistance of the British Council. The British Consul met with great opposition from Jaja and his chiefs, 
especially regarding a particular clause in the treaty that would have allowed for free trade by the British in every part of the territory. Jaja vehemently refused to sign the treaty until the clause was struck out and after a reassurance that the Queen was not interested in Jaja's country and markets. In addition, the European traders in 1885 requested a reduction in the price of palm oil due to the drop in the world price. However, Jaja refused to heed their request. One of the British firms, Alexander Miller Brother & Company, would break out from the African Association, an amalgamation of British trading firms, and join forces with Jaja. This defection triggered fierce commercial rivalries among British firms. These other firms and the Foreign Council considered that Jaja's attitude might make the exercise of the British protectorate difficult unless he was dealt with. This stance was also shared by Vice Consul Harry Johnston, who felt that the most effective way to support commerce in the area would be the humiliation or banishment of Jaja. On September 19, 1887, Harry Johnston invited King Jaja of Okobo aboard a naval vessel. He assured Jaja that he would be free to leave whenever he wanted to. However, this was not the case. While aboard the ship, Jaja was given two options. He either granted access to the Europeans to trade or risk bombardment and exile. Jaja refused to back down and he was arrested and deposed for obstructing British commercial and political expansion. His trial, which took place in the Gold Coast, present-day Ghana, was slated for November 29, 1887. He was accused of terrorism, administering illegal oaths to natives, apparently to frighten them from dealing directly with European agents, obstructing trade to the inland districts beyond his jurisdiction, and blocking the highway and waterways entrance into Okobo River, thereby flouting the terms and spirit of the Berlin Treaty of 1884 and 1885. On December 1, 1887, Sir Walter Huntgrub found Jaja guilty and he was exiled to the West Indies. Jaja would eventually go on to campaign for his freedom. He appealed against the order through the assistance of Major MacDonald, a British officer who felt that Jaja had been treated unjustly. In May 1888, Jaja was moved to the island of St. Vicente, Cape Verde. His health began to deteriorate and the foreign office decided to move him to Barbados. There, the people of Barbados, having heard of the capture of an African king, felt insulted that he had been subjected to such ridicule and shame. He was welcomed with a loud ovation. The British, afraid that they might hatch an escape plan, sailed back to St. Vicente. After years of appealing against his detention, Jaja eventually won the appeal and the order was revoked by the British Parliament. His health further deteriorated and it was agreed by the Parliament that he should be sent back to his hometown of Okobo. Unfortunately, he would not make the journey home. He was sent first to Santa Cruz, Tenerife to await the arrival of Major MacDonald. On the morning of July 8, 1891, four years after his unjust detention, King Jaja of Okobo died. He was 70. The land of Okobo would rapidly come into ruins after his death as it became plagued with slavery and exploitation of its resources by the British. Nana Olomu, the governor of the Benin River, was another prominent ruler to be deposed and exiled by the British. One of the 106 children of Olomu, Nana was born into nobility, affluence and stupendous wealth around the year 1852 at Jakba in the Itshekiri region. The Itshekiri served as middlemen in the palm oil trade between the Urobos and the European merchants. Nana Olumu's father would go on to establish his own village, Ebrohimi, on the Benin River. Nana Olumu grew up under the influence of his grandmother and he displayed distinguishing qualities of genius, character and enterprise. 
His father, having noticed these qualities, would draft him into war, and Nana helped his father in many wars. The senior Olumu made his son the commander general during the Eku War of 1872. He continued in this position until the death of his father in 1883. Following the death of his father, Nana Olumu would take on the mantle of leadership in 1884 without opposition from any of his peers in the land. Due to his effective control of the trade of palm oil, he was able to build his kingdom and greatly develop the capital of Ebrohimi. In 1885, he was installed into the consul area by Her Majesty and one was presented with a staff of office sent by the Queen. Nana Olomo, like Jaja of Okpobo, signed treaties with the British government, but also struck out clauses that would have allowed the British access to free trade within his kingdom. These uncooperative tendencies would serve as a precursor to the Ebrohimi expedition of 1894. In 1891, following the creation of the Oil River Protectorate, Nana's position as governor, according to the British, became unnecessary. The protectorate was created to impose direct British rule on the natives and depose African chiefs in the area, including Nana Olomu. Before the creation of the protectorate, Nana had a collision with the proud British consul, George Annesley, who broke Nana's staff of office and threw one half of it into the river because, according to him, he had been in the Benin River for seven days and was ignored by Nana. Tension had begun to rise, and tempers would eventually set off the Ebrohimi expedition of 1894. Nana, fully aware of the harsh treatment suffered by Jaja of Okobo in the hands of the British, refused to attend any of the meetings to which he was invited, especially by Ralph Moore, the new commissioner for the All River Protectorate. He vehemently refused to attend any of the meetings. Instead, he would send representatives on his behalf. Due to Nana's resistance to the British government's role in the exploitation of the Niger Delta area, the British laid siege to his town. He had an impressive military machine, enormous wealth and great influence, all of which combined proved to be vital components in his monopoly of the palm oil trade. The resistance put up by Nana against the British in 1894 was daring and remarkably brilliant. The British, having no knowledge of the creeks which they had to sail to reach Ebrohimi and the military prowess which Nana possessed, thought the expedition was going to be a casual military one. The expedition would turn out to be one of their most difficult and costly imperial adventures in West Africa. In fact, they put up one of the best British forces ever up until that time. The crisis worsened and all attempts to capture Ebrohimi by the British failed. Nana had such an impenetrable military force that on three occasions, he impelled the British forces to withdraw with heavy casualties. However, on September 25, 1894, Nana's capital of Ebrohimi eventually fell, mainly because Dobo, a local river of Nana, provided the British with logistic and intelligence support. The expedition would last for three months. After his defeat in 1894, the armed seas in Ebrohimi included 106 cannons, 445 blooder buses, 640 guns, and 10 revolvers, in addition to 1,640 kegs of gunpowder and 2,500 rounds of machine gun ammunition. Ralph Moore issued a proclamation declaring Nana an outlaw and placed a bounty of £500 sterling for his recapture. All his properties were confiscated and later sold. Proceeds from the sale were used to defray the cost of the expedition, marking the demise of Nana's trading empire. During the attack on the town, Nana and many of his followers escaped through a secret canal at the back of the town and dispersed his family in different escape directions. Nana himself escaped to Lagos, outsmarting the invading British force who found his abandoned canoe on the morning of September 28, 1894, 
only to meet Nana's papers and documents in the kennel. While in Lagos, Nana stayed in the house of his long-term Yoruba friend, Seidu Olowu, who would temporarily harbor Nana and his followers. He also wrote a petition of clemency to the governor of Lagos Colony, Sir Gilbert Carter, on behalf of Nana. While at Olowu's place, Nana got in touch with his bosom friend from England, George Neville. Nana surrendered voluntarily to Carter on October 30. However, the governor had no legal right to detain the chief. Hence, he handed Nana over to the British consular court. Nana's trial began on November 30 and he was charged with and wrongfully accused of obstructing trade, terrorizing the Urubo, waging war against Her Majesty and engaging in inhumane slave trafficking. However, Nana Olomo's real offense was that his wealth, position and power gave him considerable influence over the Benin River and the Wari district, making penetration of the Benin traders difficult, if not impossible. His trial, which took place at the consular court in Old Calabar, had an unfair proceeding as Nana had no legal defense nor did he have any witnesses. Meanwhile, the British had seven witnesses who testified against Nana. On December 6, Nana Olomu was found guilty by the court presided over by Sir Cloud MacDonald. He was detained in Old Calabar for two years. The Ichekiri chief was later deported and exiled to Accra, Gold Coast, present-day Ghana, for life. While in Accra, Nana Olomu never allowed his circumstances to affect him. Together with his friend, George Neville, they wrote petitions for clemency for his release. Nana moved on with life in Accra and even had three children with his wife, Mami, whom he took with him to exile. After 10 years in exile, Nana would eventually be pardoned and released to return home. There was wild jubilation in the lands of Ichekiwi and some clans in Urobo, like Agbaro, Agbon and Efron. A throng of the crowd welcomed him as he returned home on August 8, 1906. Chief Nana Olomu settled in New America, now known as Koko. A year later, together with his craftsmen, sons, relatives and followers, he began the construction of his residence. This residence would become the famous Nana's palace. In 1910, three years later, Nana completed his palace. It became a national monument in 1979, but was officially declared as such by the National Commission for Museum and Monuments on September 2, 1990. In 1916, Nana Olumu died and was survived by his over 60 children. He was 64. Of all his contemporaries who were banished by the British, Nana Olomu was the only one who returned home and died peacefully. However, one prominent ruler in Benin, Oba Ovoramwen, Nubaisi, was not so lucky as the British invaded and looted his kingdom while he was sent into exile to Calabar where he died in 1914. On February 9, 1897, British soldiers invaded Benin and brought a classic end to the once powerful kingdom. However, before the invasion, the British and the people of Benin had a healthy trade relationship which started in the 16th century. The Benin sold mainly pepe, palm kernel oil, rubber, local cloth, ivory, timber and slaves to the British who gave them matches, cutlery, small bells, drinking glasses, curries, and so on in return. Their relationship was also solidified with the introduction of Christianity by British Christian missionaries. This British Benin relationship was sustained by trade and religion for centuries. Sadly, the relationship turned sour after the massacre of some British consular officials by Benin soldiers, which resulted in the punitive invasion of Benin. The aftermath of the invasion was the fall of the Benin Kingdom, putting an end to its existence as an independent entity and leading to the region's absorption into colonial Nigeria. 
The British Romans with the Benins began in 1553 when the former sent out two ships to the Benin River under the command of Captain Thomas Windham. The then Oba of Benin, Oba Urugwa, welcomed them warmly and agreed to sell pepper to them. Sadly, Captain Windham and most of his crew members went down with a fever suspected to be malaria between 1553 and 1556, and almost a hundred persons died from the sickness. This resulted in Queen Mary I of England prohibiting all voyages by her subjects to Benin due to the loss, but other European vessels still berthed at Benin and traded with them. After a while, the British resumed their visits, but the most impact was made by James Welsh and his crew who were able to withstand the fever and from January to April 1591, carted 589 salmons of pepper, 32 barrels of palm oil and 150 tusks back to their country. This success was the breaking ground for trade relations between the British and the Benin Kingdom for many years. Pepe was at first the major commodity of choice between the British and the Benin Kingdom. All the earlier voyagers had recorded successful collections of Pepe, some gold and ivory, despite the health tragedy they suffered. Another notable item of trade were slaves. The slave trade was still in full force then and English ships regularly came to Benin through the Ugoton seaport to the Benin River to buy slaves. In fact, the British paid twice the price for a slave than the Dutch. By the 1730s, they wholly dominated the business. Some of the slaves the Benin people sold were casualties of war, prisoners and trade between neighboring states. Sometimes, slaves were presented as gifts to these foreigners. Ivory was another commodity that was in high demand as also cloth, but all these items paled in comparison to the slavery business. Women slaves were sold more than the mills as the sale abroad had been forbidden since the 16th century. By the 1800s, regular trading with the British brought abundant prosperity to the Benin Kingdom, but midway through the century, the supply of slaves began to decline. English ships preferred to sail to Bonny, where they would get more slaves instead of the Benin River, which was running short of supplies. The Benin people had to even acquire slaves from the Ishekiris in order to meet up. The first reason for this shortfall was the embargo placed on the sale of male slaves by the Oba of Benin which had been necessary as the kingdom had faced some military challenges and it was imperative that the large army Oba Uzulua had commissioned be secured to handle threats from their enemies. Oba Akenzua I, who ruled from 1712 to 1740, lifted the ban during his reign. Another reason was the medical challenges the crew members faced whenever they anchored to the Benin River. Ugoton Seaport was soon viewed as a deadly zone due to the high death rate among traders stationed there. The third reason was the unhealthy state of the Benin River compared to other rivers and only small ships could get to Ugoton Seaport, which prolonged the ship's stay at the port, completing their cargoes. The final reason that hit the nail on the probable coffin of slave trading was the prohibition of the trade by British ships. On the bright side, the abolition of the slave trade encouraged Liverpool merchants to develop trade in palm oil production on a commercial scale. The oil demand increased as it was being used to manufacture lubricants, margarine, soap, candles and pharmaceutical products. The canner was being used as livestock feed. The Benin people increased their production of palm oil to be able to have enough for both their consumption and for export to Europe. Hence, after the abolition of the slave trade, palm oil became an important item of trade between the British and the Benin Kingdom. Trade relations between both parties got a boost because of the abundant palm oil which was necessary for industrial expansion. The industrial revolution that sprung up at the time led to the building of factories for mass production using machinery instead of the domestic production that was at play. At this time, the steam engine was invented, which paved the way for industrial mechanization. A new method of making steel was also discovered and new and stronger tools and machinery were made in vast quantities to complement the modern types of machinery that were revolutionizing the agricultural sector and the weaving industry. 
With palm oil becoming the new substitute for slaves, the British Benin trade relations were further strengthened. So, palm oil, elephant teeth and tusks, native cloths and utensils were often exchanged for European commodities. The Oba still held monopoly rights over certain items of trade, especially the oil palm and canals in the waterside trade with the Europeans. Rubber trading was another feature of the British Benin trade relations. The British invasion in 1897 opened up over 3,000 square miles of rubber forests. Exploits of the rubber forests at a commercial level intensified after the invasion and looting. Local production of rubber increased substantially to the extent that Yoruba and Calabar migrants were employed yearly for rubber tapping apart from the local Benin laborers. By the last quarter of the 19th century, Benin experienced the rubber boom with the invention of the pneumatic rubber tire by Scottish veterinary surgeon and inventor John Boyd Dunlop, which increased the demand for rubber. This breakthrough encouraged the British traders to promote their trade with Benin through their king, Oba Ovoramwe Nobaisi, who had complete control over the Benin forest and must give approval, which he did. Another notable item of trade between the British and the Benin Kingdom was timber. The Benin forests boasted of a rich supply of timber reserves, which could be used for either domestic or commercial purposes. Mahogany in particular was in high demand and was shipped to Britain for manufacturing, furniture making, panelling, shipbuilding and other construction activities. Other species such as obiche, iroko and other species abound in the forest, making Benin a tourist attraction to European merchants and traders. Not to be left out was ivory, which was of great interest to the British traders. The ivory trade started around the 16th century and lasted to the end of the 19th century. It was reported that the Oba usually claimed one tusk on every elephant killed and bought the second one from the hunter. Therefore, there was a stockpile of ivory that had accumulated over the year. A lot was sold before the invasion, but even much more was looted after the fall of the Benin Kingdom. Other articles of trade were locally tapped wine, honey, plantains, oranges, yams and locally made cotton cloth. As a means of exchange, the British brought into Benin a lot of luxury items such as Holland cloth, bracelets and necklaces, ironware, glass beads, caries, knives, belts, red caps, canvas, scissors, drinking glasses, cutlery, mirrors, matches, hatchets, small bells and so many others. Regardless of the healthy trade relations between the British and Benin, the love story ended in a tragedy when the British invaded the city in February 1897, burnt it up and left it in ruins. Trouble started when some Niger Coast Protectorate officials, led by the acting consul, General James Phillips, ran into an ambush at Ubine. With the hidden intention to depose Oba Ovoram when Nubaisi, who was the king at the time, Phillips sent messengers to inform the king of their arrival in a bid to see him. However, according to the Benin tradition, the people were celebrating the Agu festival and it was a taboo for the king to see strangers during the celebration. Oba Ovoramwe sent the messengers to inform General Phillips and his men that he would not be able to see them during the period until the next two months. Instead of the general to comply with the tradition of the people, he responded by saying that he would not wait for two months before seeing the king, as he had so much work to do in other parts of the protectorate and would prefer to speak with the king about several issues. The consul's message was viewed by the Benin royal house as a slap on their faces. Despite the intense warning from Oba Ovoramwe that none of the protectorate officials should be killed, Eyase, who was the war chief under the command of Olobosere and a senior army commander, saw the visit of the officials as a signal of war, and so he, along with some Benin warlords, ambushed the officials and killed them, all except two of them who ran into the forest. They hid in the forest for some days before escaping through Ugoto Creek. The response of the British to the massacre of the officials was to invade the city. 
Ignoring their long-standing view against the use of force, immediate steps were taken and a formidable force was assembled by the British to take down Benin City. Towards the end of the first week in February 1897, about 1,200 men, including marines, sailors and protectory troops were assembled and prepped for the assault. Real Admiral Harry Rawson was appointed to lead the invasion, which was planned to take place from three fronts. The first column was to advance by way of the Olubo Creek. The second front was to advance by way of the Jemison River line up to Sakomba, and the third was to maintain a joint attack through the Ugoto Creek. On February 9, 1897, the invasion finally started and by the 18th of the same month, the Benin Kingdom fell, ceased to be an independent entity and was annexed to the Niger Coast Protectorate. The city was set ablaze, although the British would later claim that it was accidental. Although the Benin soldiers put up stiff and heroic resistance to defend the sovereignty and territorial integrity of their kingdom from the invaders, Rawson's British troops had superior war weapons and were able to defeat them. The British Expeditionary Force looted the city of Benin during and after the invasion and carted away the city's precious artworks. Over 2,400 ivory, bronze and wooden artifacts were stolen. Most of these stolen booties are today being sold out at auctions by European and American art collectors and exhibited in Western museums, mainly in Germany. Many buildings were burnt down including the famous King's Court. Oba Ovoramwen was deported and exiled to Calabar, where he lived until he died in 1914. The Benin Native Council was then established to replace the institution of the monarchy and the absorption of the kingdom into colonial Nigeria. After the invasion and looting of Benin, the British then sought to make the whole of Nigeria a single colony and property of the British Empire with the sacking of the Royal Niger Company in 1899 and the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorates in 1914. The Royal Niger Company was established as a United Africa Company in 1879 the founder, George Goldie Topman, who arrived in the Niger Basin in 1877, had developed a single-minded intention of imperial acquisition of the Niger territories. Different firms had earlier been established by British and other European merchants. Upon Goldie's arrival, he sought to establish a trading monopoly maintained by political control and to have the different British firms under one conglomerate. In 1879, he successfully pulled together the three biggest firms operating on the Niger, Holland Jacques and Company, Miller Brothers and James Pinnock, to create the United African Company. The amalgamation of these individual firms into one would lead to an expansion of the company, and in 1882, the company became known as a National African Company. In 1884, Gordy brought out three French competitors, two small French companies and the all-important Compagnie Française de l'Afrique Équatoriale, making the company by far the largest firm on the Niger. This was no small feat, and it was achieved just two weeks before the Berlin Conference. This feat allowed the British the right to claim a protectorate over the Niger districts. However, this protectorate was threatened by French and German expansionist desires for trading outlets in the niger benue area. Hence, the British had to take some action to protect their territory. At the time, Goldie Tubman was pressing for a royal charter. Seeing how the activities of the company were instrumental to its gaining ultimate control of the Niger and Benue, the British, in July 1886, granted a National African Company a royal charter despite reservations expressed by some groups of traders such as the Liverpool traders. The company would go on to change its name to Royal Niger Company in order to reflect its elevated status. 
The Royal Charter gave the company the power to control the political administration and trade policies of any local territories which it could gain legal treaties, provided that the company did not interfere in local religions, laws or customs, except if it was necessary to discourage a practice of slavery. Goldie's aim of monopolization led him to put in place some destructive measures. First was the circumvention of the coastal middlemen. This led to the undercutting of the commercial activities of the Liverpool merchants who traded through these middlemen. Also, he went on to replace the monopoly of the coastal middlemen with that of his own company. The company acted as a monopolist in supplying imported goods to African producers. At the same time, it manipulated the prices at which the producers supplied goods, hence forcing them to supply at prices well below that in neighboring territories. Furthermore, there was the establishment of high tariffs on imports and exports. The trading license was set at £150 per annum. This struck out the African middlemen. As for the bigger firms, an additional fee of £100 was to be paid if they intended to trade in alcohol. Import duties were set at a near 100%, thus discouraging these firms from trading. As a result of these policies, the Royal Niger Company would come under a lot of backlash. Several complaints and petitions were written against its conduct. Vice Consul of the Oil River Protectorate, Harry Johnston, wrote a detailed complaint. Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowther was also critical of the company's conduct. The German firm, Honigsberg, laid out a complaint against the Royal Niger Company for its oppressive trading practices and the obstruction of its vessels despite having paid the requisite license fees. However, with the aid of the Marquis of Salisbury, the Royal Niger Company was able to ride past the waves of criticism. In 1887, the British sought to amalgamate the Oil River Protectorate and the Royal Niger Company. This would trigger immediate objection and opposition from several quarters. At the same time, the Liverpool traders would go into intense negotiation with the company and the British government to extend the charter to the Oil River Protectorate. The implementation of this scheme would, however, fail largely due to the strong opposition and powerful lobbying by big shipping companies in Britain. The amalgamation was suspended and the scheme was a total failure. This was the start of the decline of the Royal Niger Company. In 1895, two crucial events occurred and were major factors in the collapse of the Royal Niger Company. First was the appointment of Joseph Chamberlain as colonial secretary. He was an avowed opponent of Salisbury, he opted for the position of colonial secretary so he could influence government policies in the colonies and protectorate as part of his own imperial philosophy. The other event was the attack on the Royal Niger Company's principal port facilities at Akasa by the Nembe of Brass. These middlemen had been severely oppressed by the company's policy. They took temporary control of the station at Akasa. The British led a counter-attack and raised Nembe to the ground. Thereafter, a special commission was set up to investigate the complaints of the brass people. The special commission, led by Sergeant Kirk after a thorough investigation, did not apportion blame to either party. Instead, he devised a plan known as a Kirk plan, that is, the transformation of the Royal Niger Company into a purely administrative body with £400,000 working capital and an annual dividend of 5%. The end of the Royal Niger Company would eventually come when proposals for the revocation of the charter were made by Sir Ralph Moore, the High Commissioner of the Niger Coast Protectorate. However, as a result of the charter's non-provision for legal consequences of revocation and the cost which the company had incurred, the Royal Niger Company was to be paid a compensatory sum of £500,000. This was reviewed and later set at £700,000. 
Eventually, the total appropriated sum by the British Parliament was £856,895, of which £556,895 was paid directly to the Royal Niger Company. In addition, the government agreed to pay the Royal Niger Company one half of all royalties on minerals produced in much of the former Niger territory for 99 years. The revocation of the charter was first recorded in a letter written in June 1899 from the Foreign Office to the Treasury. It was completed by a warrant signed by Queen Victoria in December 1899 and the handover of assets was finalized on January 1, 1900. The terms of revocation and compensation were reduced into an Act of Parliament, the Royal Niger Company Act of 1899. Afterwards, the company became the Niger Company. It was eventually bought for £8.5 million in 1920 by the Lever Brothers of the Unilever Group. It was traded under its original name, the United African Company, UAC, and it's still a part of the Unilever Group even to this day. By the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, the British had gained absolute and overt control over the territory now known today as Nigeria. There was a complete annexation of Lagos in 1861. Also, by 1885, after the Berlin Conference, the Southern Protectorate was claimed by the British. Following the conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903, they had the Northern Protectorate under their wings. Hence, there were three separate territories, the colony of Lagos, the Southern Protectorate, and the Northern Protectorate. In 1906, Sir Walter Egerton fused the colony of Lagos with the Southern Protectorate. This event laid the foundation for the eventual amalgamation of the Southern and Northern Protectorate in 1914. The Southern Protectorate was far more prosperous than the Northern Protectorate. The latter lacked outlets for the exportation of its agricultural produce or imports of essential goods, and it was constantly in need of revenue to develop its railway lines and improve social amenities. As a result, the North ran at a severe deficit and relied heavily on the British Treasury for financial support. At the time, the deficit was met by a subsidy from the Southern Protectorate and the British also gave an imperial grant in aid of about £300,000 a year. As of 1914, the economy of the Northern Protectorate had struggled under the indirect rule and had not become self-financing. The colonial office and Lord Frederick Lugard believed that centralizing the protectorates under a single administration would be economically beneficial. The unification of the protectorate would bring better financial management to the country. Lugard, after the conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate, left northern Nigeria in 1906. He was, however, brought back in 1912 to oversee the amalgamation of the protectorates. The Hausa land in the 18th century had been plagued with excess socio-economic issues ranging from social degeneration to oppression, corruption, frivolities and the likes. Sheikh Usman Danfodio would lead a jihad or a holy war in 1804 as a reaction to the prevalent hypertensive materialistic individualism in Hausa land. By 1810, Danfodio had gained absolute control over the entire Hausa states. The caliphate would be ruled based solely on Islamic laws and values. The influence of the caliph would now grow rapidly, covering an expanse of land including Bida, Yola and Ilori. The Royal Niger Company at the same period had set up protectorates in different regions such as Benin and Calabar. Ultimately, these regions became known as the Niger Coast Protectorate. The advancement of the French towards the Bainway, despite the presence of the company on the Niger, would lead the company to conquer Nupi and Ilori, both in the north. However, their goal was to capture the entire Sokoto Caliphate. Following the revocation of the Royal Charter in 1900, the company's northern territories became the protectorate of northern Nigeria. 
Frederick Lugard, a one-time employee of the Royal Niger Company and head of the West African Frontier Force, was appointed High Commissioner by the Colonial Office in London. Earlier on in 1899, the Royal Niger Company had attempted to erect a military post and a British resident in Sokoto. They would, however, be met with severe opposition from the Sultan. Lugard feared the growing influence of the Sultan might lead to an undermining of his authority and, most importantly, internal revolt within the British-controlled territories. This convinced Lugard that the only effective way of securing the protectorate was the military conquest of Sokoto and its assimilation into the protectorate of northern Nigeria. Lugard began his conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate with the conquering of the Emirates of Bida and Kontagora on the Niger and Yola on the Benue. He deposed the emirs of these emirates and installed new emirs whose primary qualification to rule was a willingness to submit to Lugard's authority. Thereafter, Lugard and his forces moved into Bauchi and Gombe, and in 1902, Lugard conquered Zaria. The news of the conquest had spread to Kano and the cities began to prepare for war. The walls were rebuilt and further strengthened. The British forces would be met with heavy resistance in Kano. On February 3, 1903, Lugard invaded the Kano Emirate with 24 officers, 12 non-commissioned officers, 2 medical officers and 722 rank and file made up of 550 foot soldiers, 71 artillery men and 101 mounted infantry with 75 mm guns and 4 Maxim guns. The walls of Kano were impregnable. Unfortunately, this would not be for long. The British found their way through the gates in the west and broke into the strong resistance of Kano. The Emir fled and the Kano troops surrendered. Up next was Sokoto. As a result of the decentralized nature of the caliphate, Sokoto had no standing army that could be dispatched almost immediately. Hence, the sultan at the time, Atahiru, met with his men and began preparations for the impending war. On February 27, 1903, Lugard and his forces converged in Kwara Namuda. No sooner had the sultan and his men begun preparations than the British struck. The British Army had an arsenal of 25 officers, five non-commissioned officers, two medical officers and one medical non-commissioned officer, 68 gunners, 656 rank and file, 400 carriers, four maxims and four 75mm guns. On the contrary, the Sokoto warriors were armed with spears, arrows and Dane guns. Just as it was in Kano, the British would be met with stiff resistance. As the war progressed, the superior weapons of the British forces outweighed those of the Sokoto forces. On March 15, a few days after the start of the war, the Sultan was impelled to flee and Sokoto surrendered to the British. Lugard would, however, pursue Sultan Atahiru and on July 27, 1903, his soldiers killed him at the Second Battle of Brumi, about 200 miles southeast of Kano, present-day Gombe State. Once Sultan Atahiru's corpse was identified, his head was cut off and the photos were circulated to stem further opposition and to prove to his surviving supporters that their revered Sultan was dead. Lugard would then incorporate all these emirates into the northern protectorate, signaling the end of the Sokoto Caliphate, with the emirs willing to rule under British authority to keep their positions. On January 1, 1914, Lord Frederick Lugard amalgamated the southern and northern protectorate into one geographical entity called Nigeria. Following the amalgamation in 1914, the protectorate was divided into two spheres, the southern and northern provinces, each under a lieutenant governor responsible to and on behalf of the governor general. Lord Lugard would go on to become the first Governor-General of the newly unified Nigeria and would remain in power until 1919. He set up a system of administration, the indirect rule system that allowed traditional chiefs to continue ruling their communities 
albeit as subordinates to British colonial officers. With the complete domination of northern Nigeria, the British would continue their invasion into the Igbo heartland with the destruction of Arochuku. The history of the Igbo people cannot be told without the kingdom of Arochuku. The early 18th century witnessed the establishment of this great and domineering kingdom. The foundations of the kingdom were laid by slaves who had revolted against their Ibibio masters. This led to the Ibibio conquest of 1634. This conquest saw them gain ownership of the powerful and famous oracle, the Ibini Upabi. The Arochuku kingdom soon became a powerhouse economically, politically, and also oracular, as it was home to the Ibini Upabi oracle, high priests, influential traders, and Aro diplomats. Arochuku dominated the other Igbo communities and was more prominent than their neighbors for obvious reasons. First was the ownership of the famous and powerful Ibini Upabi oracle, which gave them an advantageous influence. The god conferred on the Aro people the title Umuchuku, meaning children of the high god, thereby making them untouchable in the Igbo territory. Also, the Arochuku people were able to exert more influence than others because of the nature of their trading activities and their geographical location which added to their influence and dominance. Arochuku was located strategically around Enyon Creek, which was favorable to the Aro people, and they maximized this to their advantage. In addition, the Aro military alliance was always in place to ensure the protection of Aro interests in the region. The activities of the Arochuku people helped the flourishing of city-states in the Niger Delta. City-states such as Okubo, Boni, Nembe, and Calabar formed a strong trading network with Aro. These city-states soon transformed into important centers for the export of palm oil and slaves. Hundreds of communities also soon metamorphosed into powerful kingdoms. The Arochuku kingdoms comprised 19 villages. At the start of the 19th century, the Arab people migrated and expanded their frontiers into many other city-states. They became a force, particularly in the economy of the region. The Arab people thrived in the slave institution before the advent of the British on African soil. The dominance and influence of the Arochuku kingdom were second to none. This would lure the British into capturing the kingdom to expand its colonial powers. The British, seeking to extend their authority over the vast geographical entity, knew too well to capture the Aro Kingdom if their mission was to be a success. Several factors led to the expedition and destruction of Arochuku or Aro in 1902. The Berlin Conference of 1885 saw European powerhouses scramble for Africa, and this led to the division of the land into several colonies. These colonies, blessed with raw materials and market outlets for industries, were advantageous to the colonial masters. Ownership of these colonies meant prestige and inheritance of diplomatic weapons. Also, the abolition of the slave trade and the movement for the establishment of legitimate trade by the British was another reason for the expedition of the Arrow Kingdom. In addition, there was the exaggeration of the inhuman practices of the Oracle and the power of the Arrow. In 1899, the British sought to conquer the Arrow Confederacy. However, they met with strong resistance from the people of Arrow and their allies, who had been readily prepared before the attempt by the British. The brewing tension between the British and the people of Aro soon escalated into what is today known as the fall of Arochuku. By November 1901, the gradual decline of Arochuku began. The British eventually had their way in the Aro expedition, which lasted not more than two months, and the Aro Confederacy collapsed.
The protest, known as Ogu Umuwani, among Igbo women, occurred from November 23, 1929 to January 10, 1930. The protest spread across several areas in the eastern region with thousands of women participating in the revolt. Women from six ethnic groups, Ibibio, Ogoni, Boni, Okwobo, Andoni and Ibo all took part in the protest. Several plausible reasons have been given as to what led to the women's protest. One of the major reasons for the revolt was the imposition of direct taxation on the natives. Direct taxation never existed in the East until 1926, when it was introduced by the British. A census was carried out that same year to determine who and how much they would pay as tax. The men folk had been exploited by this system. In 1928, however, an order was given to the local Warren chiefs to conduct another census. Before this, there was an economic depression in the early 1920s that led to the impoverishment of women as the terms of trade were not favorable to them. The remote census, together with the burden of the economic depression, triggered the women's protest. Another factor was the lack of participation of women in the political and administrative policies of their communities. Before colonial administration, women had a role in the political and administrative affairs of their communities. However, the advent of the British colonial rule brought an end to that. The colonial rule gave women no part in the administrative and political affairs of their communities. The policy of the indirect rule system and the creation of warrant chiefs was another factor that led to the protest. These warrant chiefs had no prior legitimate authority in the indigenous political system. Their appointment led to the intensification of conflict in society. These warrant chiefs would also enrich themselves and forcefully recruit men to build railways, roads and government houses. The women, during the protest, complained bitterly about forced labor and the deprivation that came along with it. Their complaint was aimed at forestalling the taxation of women and seeking redress for the injustices in the economic, social and political system. The protest led to the destruction of the buildings of the native courts, dispensary and staff quarters in Okobo town. Also, several casualties were recorded and over 50 women were killed. On January 2, 1930, a commission was set up by the government to investigate the roots of the protest. The reports of the commission convinced the government to carry out administrative reforms, including the abolition of the warrant chief system and the reorganization of the native courts. The women's protest was instrumental in the restructuring of the system of government and a more indigenous system of government similar to the one practiced before the advent of the British government was clamored for. It also marked the rise of gender ideology as it gave women the opportunity to engage in social actions. The Abba women's protest of 1929 led to an engendering of resistance, conflicts and ultimately nationalism which would eventually end with the independence of Nigeria in 1960. During the 1940s, agitation for better treatment of workers and a raise in salaries by the colonial masters became the order of the day. At the time, nationalism had become entrenched in the hearts of many Nigerians and the clamor for self-rule had begun. Aggrieved over the cost of living as a result of the effects of the Second World War, the technical workers demanded an increase in the cost of living allowance. However, their demands were ignored and this led to the strike action of 1945. Veteran labor leader Michael Imudo was pivotal to the success of the strike action. The strike, which began on June 22, 1945 and lasted 45 days, saw the unification of both the public and the private sectors as over 200,000 workers from 17 different work unions took part in the strike. The trade unions transcended the division of ethnicity, religion, and regionalism. The strike struck the most devastating blow against colonialism in the country. 
It also affirmed the capability of Nigerian workers in making a forceful assertion of their rights, which the government must respect. The Nigerian general strike of 1945 had provided a much-needed outlet for the steam which might have pushed people into the war of independence. A few years later, another strike action known as Go Slow would take place, this time in the coal city of Enugu. Enugu was the capital of the eastern region and it had also become the coal capital of British West Africa and an anchor of Nigeria's production. Nigerian coal had been of strategic importance during the Second World War. It was also vital in the rebuilding of infrastructure by the post-war British government. During the war, inflation raged terribly because many of the men had been called upon to serve in the British armed forces, having been led to believe that their sacrifices would create a better world. By 1949, Enugu had developed into a town with wide international sophistication, having about 25,000 inhabitants and approximately 8,000 employed coal miners. The city was home to two main mines, the Eva Valley and Obweti, of which Eva Valley was the leading coal mine in the country. At the time, the miners supported maternity clinics, road building, and clean water supplies using their regular income for the development of their communities. However, the lives of the miners were not rosy. They lived in terrible conditions in the valley with low oxygen, low morale and even lower remuneration. The workspace was dangerous and highly depressing. This was in sharp contrast to the living conditions of the Europeans who were clean-cut, well-paid and worked above the ground. The miners had strict work demarcation, which was imposed by the British. Some were hewers, while some were top men. By late 1949, there was an increasing resentment for the unfair treatment and equally unfair payment of Nigerian workers. The miners began to make demands regarding the dreadful conditions, pay and reinstatement of unfairly sacked workers. Their demands were, however, rejected. At the time, Agitation for self-rule, nationalist movement and the cry for better treatment of workers became even more pronounced. Enugu was the abode for the Zikist independent movement. Hence, the political environment was becoming increasingly radicalized and the European community viewed nationalist agitation with fear. The Zikist General Secretary, Okudili Azaya Oji, well-versed in colonial labor law and aware that striking was illegal, incorporated the Dorhiam miners' Kakani go slow tactic and spent days in the mine teaching it to the miners. The new method of protest, go slow, meant that the workers worked very slowly, thereby affecting production. The miners produced a handful of coal as opposed to the wagon loads of coal they used to produce. A series of negotiations ensued, and although an agreement was reached, the colliery managers would fail to honor their words, and between November 10 to November 12, in 1949, 200 more miners were sacked. The miners, fighting for back pay owed them, known as roistering, and which was later declared illegal, would occupy the mine. The government had attempted to remove mine explosives from the Eva Valley mine, Whilst the removal of explosives was successful at Obweti, it was unsuccessful at Eva Valley as the workers would not assist the colonial officers. The removal of the explosives signaled a lockout, one which the miners had suffered during the general strike of 1945 and were not about to go down that road again. What started as a simple tactical protest became a stay-in strike. From November 16 to 18, the decisions made by the political officials stemmed from false assumptions, misunderstandings and enshrined derogatory ideas about African workers. On November 17, 1949, about 900 policemen were dispatched to Enugu, 
many of them Hausa soldiers from the north. The following day, November 18, 1949, saw the police officers led by Captain F.S. Philip, senior superintendent of police, swam the mine. The miners, in their custom, had tied strips of red cloth to their helmets and began to dance and chant to boost morale. The captain, ignorant of the Igbo language and unfamiliar with the traditions of colliery protest, began to panic. To him, they dangerously indulged in dancing and their organization was along military lines. Philip's inability to understand the miners led to his ordering of shooting. He took his revolver and shot Sunday Anyasodo, one of the miners at Eva Valley. A sporadic rupture of gunshots followed and 21 miners were killed with several others shot in the back. 51 workers were injured as they scampered for safety. The massacre at the Eva Valley Mine transcended every other event in the country at the time as ethnic, regional and class divisions were dumped in order to build a collective momentum to do away with British rule. The Eva Valley Mine Massacre led to a series of mass protests around the country. Places like Port Harcourt, Abba and Oweri witnessed a breakout of protests. The Nigerian Women's Union boycotted all foreign-owned businesses. Ibado Ex Servicemen's Association expressed their dismay and an 18-man National Emergency Committee, NEC, was set up to conduct the national response to the crime. The massacre was the last straw for the British. The movement for independence became even more pronounced after the killings. Following the massacre, the Governor General of Nigeria, Sir John McPherson, set up a commission of inquiry which began on December 12, 1949. The Fitzgerald Commission, as it was called, demanded the resignation of the Chief Commander for the Eastern Region and the return for every police officer involved in the killings to Nigeria for trial. One thing was clear after the massacre. The time for self-rule and independence had come for Nigeria. However, before independence, Nigeria fought two world wars for the British and the country's mineral resources were used to fund these wars. November 11, 1918 marked the end of the First World War. It was a day that the German army on one hand and the Allied army of Britain, France and other powers on the other hand signed the armistice that marked the end of over four years of fighting on the battlefield of France, the Western Front. It was one of history's worst wars, although the Second World War was even worse than the First. While the First World War lasted for four years from 1914 to 1918, the Second World War lasted for six years from 1939 to 1945. So, what was Nigeria's business with these wars? The First World War was as a result of a disagreement between European powers which directly or indirectly involved Africa. Campaigns were done on African soil and over a million soldiers or even more were involved in these campaigns that significantly had implications in Africa. Women and children were forced to be recruited to act as carriers. They would carry the supply of the military who could not move their supplies through roads, animals or rails. When the enlistment drive ended in September 1919, about 2,000 enlisted carriers, 35,000 non-enlisted carriers and 17,000 combatants were made to participate in the German East Africa and Southern Cameroons campaign. About 150,000 soldiers lost their lives in the war, while others were left injured and disabled. By the end of the war, most African countries had chosen a side. The French, Italian, British, Portuguese and Belgian administrations were allied against the German colonies. The colonies had also participated chiefly in the war. 
they had gone to fight in lands far away from their home. The French also made use of their colonies in Africa. There were combatants and non-combatants who had been enlisted. This had a different impact on the country's workforce. The Nigerian Regiment was a group of Nigerian soldiers who, in September 1914, supplied shock troops to the Cameroon's Expeditionary Force. They fought the German army with British soldiers. There was also Nigeria's overseas contingent who, in December 1917, campaigned in Tanganyika. The British had conscripted Nigerians along the northern and eastern borders for military service. The war had an economic impact on Nigeria. Nigeria's raw materials were at Britain's disposal, which encouraged them to wage war. They also supplied troops for the campaigns held within Africa, the campaigns against German East Africa and German Cameroon. The First World War was an important phase in Nigeria's history. The war had a significant consequence for the country. The veterans who served in the war became catalysts for change on their arrival back home. They were more enlightened and their mental horizons were broadened. Their language, attitude and ideas had been altered by the war. Their adaptation to change compelled others to follow suit. Also, two years after the armistice had been signed in 1920, the National Congress for British West Africa was created in Accra to campaign for African rights. Lagos, two years after, in 1922, drafted a new constitution which allowed for the elected Nigerian representatives to sit in the Legislative Council of the Governor-General. It is believed that the aftermath of the First World War initiated the modern nationalist movement. Often described as a European war, the Second World War caused great destruction to people and world societies. After France fell, the British reached out to other Commonwealth nations like Canada, South Africa, Australia and India to help them as they continued the fight. They also had the full backing of their colonies. The Ututu Clan Executive Committee of the southeastern part of Nigeria on September 3, 1939, when Neville Chamberlain declared war on Germany, pledged their loyalty to the monarchy of the British Empire. They wrote, Though we are but poor farmers by trade, we are quite prepared to render any assistance which may come to our reach to our British government, which is fighting for world peace. Local leaders had called for an opportunity to unite and fight against the common enemy to defeat Adolf Hitler. Oba Akenzua II of Benin advocated that Nigerians bury all differences and use their resources to defend Nigeria and Britain. The newspapers such as the West African Pilot and Nigerian Daily Times also aided in gaining support from Nigerians as regards the war. In short, the general Nigerian population were ready to donate their funds and resources towards the war. In 1948, Author Richards, the Governor General of Nigeria, attested to the generous contributions of Nigeria to the Second World War. The Nigerian population as a British colony were not mere spectators. They effectively participated and fought in the war. However, history has neglected the important roles African colonies played for their colonial masters in the war. Nigerian soldiers, mostly the Hausas and Yorubas, were enlisted to fight for the British Empire. Their agricultural products were also not spared, especially when Japan cut off Asia from supplies when they entered the war. The British regulated internal and external trade in Nigeria to increase production for export. The two world wars drafted millions of Africans to fight against German imperialism. They fought for the freedom of the Allied powers when they were barely free from the shackles of their European colonial masters. 
The Africans, especially Nigeria, had no business with the wars, but they fought regardless. However, the Second World War was beneficial to Africans. They gained military knowledge, improved communication skills, and self-confidence that they would later use to gain their independence. Nigeria too was not left out. After a series of constitutional conferences, the country eventually gained its independence on Saturday, October 1st, 1960. On January 9, 1950, the northern, eastern and western regions delegates came as a body and met in Ibadan to discuss the issues of the Macpherson constitution that the Governor-General Sir Johnson Macpherson was drafting. Only one woman was present, Mrs. Fumilayo Ransom Kuti. The conference was an effort by Sir Macpherson to create a constitution which the people would find acceptable as there were complaints about the Clifford Constitution of 1922 and the Richards Constitution of 1946. The then Attorney General, Sir Gerard Howe, chaired the conference. Several issues were raised at the conference, issues ranging from revenue allocation to the system of government and political administration of Nigeria. The original delegates wanted a change in the system for government, they wanted to adopt the federal system of government, which would grant them autonomy and allow each region to develop on its own level. They wanted to be regarded as an administrative region, vested with powers to decide and pass laws that would not be under the authority of the central legislature. The northern delegates had asked that a majority of the seats be allocated to their region. This request was refused by other delegates as such an act would give the northern region absolute control. The failure of the central government and the northern threat of secession called for a review of the constitution that will address the situation and allay fears. The result was the Littleton Constitution that has been through a series of constitutional meetings in 1953 and 1954. The Littleton Constitution, unlike the Macpherson Constitution, was different in the fact that it introduced the federal system, which granted more autonomy to the regions. Other constitutional conferences followed in 1957 and 1958, before Nigeria attained its independence in October 1960. The Littleton Constitution went through two constitutional conferences presided over by Mr. Oliver Littleton, the Secretary for the Colonies. These conferences, the London Constitutional Conference of 1953 and the Lagos Constitutional Conference of 1954, also led to the adoption of federalism in Nigeria. Littleton discussed with the British House of Commons the situation in Nigeria in May 1953. He said that a constitution would have to be withdrawn to provide greater autonomy for each region. A constitutional conference was then summoned in London, chaired by Littleton. On July 30, 1953, the conference recommenced on August 22, 1953, as there was a need for a new constitution after the failure of the Macpherson constitution. For proper representation and considerable political opinion, Nigerian leaders from six major political parties were invited to London by Oliver Littleton to review the constitution. The parties were Action Group AG, National Interest Party NIP, National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons NCNC, Northern Elements Progressive Union NEPU, Northern People's Congress NPC and Cameroon National Congress KNC. Also, a team of 19 delegates comprising six from each region were also sent to London. The conference was held to analyze Nigeria's issues and find ways to alleviate tensions. They discussed the failure of the Macpherson Constitution, the changes required to correct these effects, how these changes would be implemented, and self-government for Nigeria in 1956. The agreements brought forward were 
the establishment of a federal system where the residual powers should be vested in the regional government. Lagos to be made a federal territory and separated from the Western region. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II to grant self-government to the regions that wanted it in 1956. That the legislative powers be shared between the central and regional legislatures. The Governor of Nigeria be referred to as the Governor General and the Regional Lieutenant Governors be referred to as Governor. Finally, subject to approval by a conference held in Lagos in 1954, there would be an established regional administration in Cameroon if the people of the territory agree through a referendum. The Lagos Conference of 1954 was held in a bid to address certain unresolved political issues not attended to in the London Conference of 1953. It was decided and agreed that the concept of needs and national interest, which was part of the four principles of revenue allocation, should be removed from the revised constitution. Sir Louis Chick was assigned as the sole fiscal commissioner. The conference reviewed his report of his fiscal commission published in December 1953 and concluded on the following decisions. In accordance with the concept of federalism, the judiciary and public service be regionalized. That southern Cameroon be granted autonomy and that it has its own territorial legislature comprising of the governor general to approve bills, a represented commissioner, 13 elected members, six native authorities, three ex-official members and two other members to act on behalf of the interests of the communities not properly represented. That Southern Cameroon has its own legislature, remaining a part of Nigeria's federation as a quasi-federal territory. On a final note, the allotment of financial resources to the federal and regional government should be centered on the principle of derivation. The 1957 London Constitutional Conference was held in London from May 23rd to June 26, 1957. The 1953 London Constitutional Conference resolved that within three years, beginning from August 31st, 1953, the new constitution, the Littleton Constitution, be revised. The conference was initially scheduled for 1956, but was a setback because of a political crisis that ensued in the eastern region. The political crisis was a result of an accusation raised by the chief whip of the NCNC, Mr. E. O. Ayo. He accused Dr. Nnamdi Azikiwe, the premier of the region, of diverting public funds into the African Continental Bank, ACB, for his personal use. This accusation led Mr. Alan Lennox Boyd, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, to set up a panel to investigate the accusation. However, the 1957 London Constitutional Conference reached the following decisions. 1. That self-government be granted to the eastern and western regions in August 1957. 2. An organization of a commission of inquiry was to be organized to attend to the minority groups. 3. The independence of the northern region in March 1959. 4. The Premier, as appointed by the Governor of the region, should be the person who commands the most majority in the House of Assembly. 5. The police remain a federal institution. 6. The Southern Cameroon have its own region and Premier. 7. The Governor appoints ministers on the recommendation of the Premier. 8. The Prime Minister, as appointed by the Governor General, should be the one who commands the majority in the House of Representatives. 9. The new membership of the House of Representatives at 320 when the term of the existing old house dissolves in 1959. Finally, members of the regional and federal legislature be elected by universal adult suffrage in the East, West, Lagos and Southern Cameroon and in the North, adult male suffrage. The 1958 Constitutional Conference was the last conference Nigeria had before its independence in October 1960. 
It took place in Lagos from September 29 to October 27, 1958. The conference addressed issues such as creating more regions or states to dissuade the fears of minority groups. The conference also granted Nigeria her independence in 1960. Before the independence, general elections were to hold in 1959 for the position of the House of Representatives. The NPC won 142 seats, the NCNC and NEPO won 89 seats, and the AG won 73 seats. The United Nations requested that plebiscites be held in northern and southern Cameroon to know if they would prefer to join the Republic of Cameroon or Nigeria. The plebiscites were held on February 11 and 12, 1961. The results showed that southern Cameroon wanted to join the Republic of Cameroon. They became part of the Republic of Cameroon on October 1, 1961, while northern Cameroon preferred to remain with Nigeria. They became part of northern Nigeria on June 1, 1961. Finally, the conference also entrenched a list of human rights that would protect the citizens of the Nigerian constitution as well as a process of amending the constitution. National independence refers to the freedom from dependence or control by another state. Existing evidence shows that almost all African countries today were under colonial rule. It was a period of brutality, oppression and exploitation of the resources of the colonies. The colonial situation thus gave the right to the struggle for independence. This fight for independence started in the 19th century, which was a period that incited the spirit of traditional nationalism. The traditional nationalists were traditional rulers and a few elites in present-day Nigeria. The opposed given up their territories as they were denied respectable positions in their own land because of their race. The nationalist movement in Nigeria emerged in the 20th century with political organizations that contributed enormously to Nigerian independence. These political organizations created political consciousness among Nigerians. They enlightened Nigerians about the country's situation. They also had newspapers which played an important role in further enlightening the public. The Nigerian Youth Movement, formed in 1935, was another political organization. It was regarded as a core of Nigeria's first authentic nationalist organization. It was initially known as the Lagos Youth Movement, founded in 1934. It aimed for unity in the nation amidst all diversity. The movement championed universal adult suffrage, free education, severance of the judiciary from the legislature, and that all provinces be represented in the Legislative Council. It also encouraged trade union formation. The National Congress for British West Africa was formed in 1920 by Joseph Ephraim Casely Hayford and Dr. Akinwade Savage. The organization petitioned the Secretary of State for the Colonies with the following demands. A legislative council in all West African territories belonging to the British with Africans forming half of its members. That the judiciary be separated from the legislature. Ending racism in the civil service. Formation of a university in West Africa. Creation of municipal governments and the removal of objectionable ordinances. These demands led to the initiation of the elective principle in the 1922 Clifford Constitution, which gave Nigerians a chance to become elected members of the Legislative Council. The Nigerian National Democratic Party, NNDP, was another political organization that was formed on June 24, 1923 by Herbert Macaulay. The organization was created to contest elections that year. The NNDP criticized the colonial government based on the reformation of provincial courts, Nigeria's resource development, the 1927 income tax, equal economic opportunities for all Nigerians, and the establishment of educational institutions. Their demand led to the formation of Yaba Higher College in 1932. Aside newspapers and political organizations, there was an emergence of the professional unions that aided the nationalist movement. They were the Taxi Drivers Union in 1938, the Women's Sellers Union in 1940, 
the Railway Workers Union in 1932 and the Canoe Transport Union in 1938. The Railway Workers Union provided physical and financial support to the nationalist movement. With the nationalist movements and the constitution serving as a huge landmark in the struggle for independence, a motion was passed in the Federal House of Representatives in January 1960 to appeal to the British monarchy that Nigeria be granted her independence that same year. The Federation of Nigeria conventionally attained its independence and joined the list of Commonwealths of Nations in 1960. On that day, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Baliwa was appointed as the head of government or prime minister of Nigeria. Similarly, on November 16, 1960, Dr. Nnamdi Azikiwe, the former premier of the Eastern Region, was appointed as the head of state or governor general and a representative of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. On October 1, 1963, Nigeria then became a republic with Sir Abubakar Tafawa Baliwa as the Prime Minister and Dr. Nnamdi Azikiwe as the President. But that republic would last for just two and a half years before the military struck. Nigeria's independence on October 1, 1960 was met with joy and sighs of relief. Nigerians would finally run the country. However, at the beginning of the First Republic in 1963, the lofty expectations expected of Nigeria were rapidly dashed. Nigerians entered a destructive age that would demonstrate their incapacity to rule themselves. After gaining independence from its British colonial masters, Nigeria automatically joined the Commonwealth of Nations, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the leader of the Northern People's Congress MPC in the House of Representatives, was appointed Prime Minister, while Dr. Benjamin Namdi Azikiwe, the first Premier of the Eastern Region, was named the Governor General. The Governor General served as Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's envoy in Nigeria at the time, so the independence was only partial. This system was in place for three years following Nigeria's independence until October 1st, 1963, when Nigeria became a republic. Nigeria became a republic in 1963. The First Republic was accompanied by several problems brought on by the forced union of the various regions, including the 1914 amalgamation, the fall of the constitutionalism, the federal system's design, political instability, electoral fraud, abuse of the rule of law, foreign media interference, and others. These problems grew to be inconsequential factors in the First Republic's early collapse. The multifaceted crisis that defined the period's politics and contributed to the Republic's demise were what made it so politically unstable. When officially distinct political units were combined in 1914, the nation was created under false pretenses and without any attempt at real integration, just for the colonial power's administrative convenience. The British policy of divide and rule, which encouraged deliberate efforts to foster discord among Nigerians to prevent their growing stronger against colonial powers, made matters worse. So, it was not surprising that the impacts of divisiveness were felt by the promising nation. The top parties in each region gained the majority of seats in the 1959 federal elections held in anticipation of independence and the establishment of the First Republic, but none of them was deemed stable enough to form a national government. A coalition between MPC and NCNC was required. The regional premiers were Ladoki Akintola in the West, Michael Okpara in the east, and Amadou Bello in the north. The establishment of Nigeria's First Republic was already precarious due to the numerous inconsistencies in the independence constitution of 1960 that led to the dissolution of law and order. 
The president's authority or relationship with the prime minister was likewise unclear. As a result of the political importance given to the population, the 1962 and 1963 census had an impact on the political unrest. The census's results became highly contentious as one region accused the others of inflating the numbers and counting both persons and items in order to outperform them. Serious political riots like the Western Region Crisis and the Teve Riots in which many lives and properties were purposefully destroyed in a wanton manner occurred in the First Republic. The federal government undertook a national enumeration exercise on May 13, 1962, among other things to enable it to decide how to distribute or allocate seats in the parliament and to establish the foundation for the distribution of federal resources for economic and social development. It was discovered that the figures had been improperly adjusted. Ibrahim Waziri, the then Minister for Economic Development, insisted that the numbers for the eastern region were reportedly exaggerated to give the region an unfair edge. Once more, while the eastern and northern regions immediately reported their results before mid-1962, the western region's results arrived November 2, 1962, after the deadline. Therefore, the minister decided that a second round of the enumeration should be conducted in November 1963. Serious animosity and rancor spread throughout the regions as a result of this debate. The 1962 census was adopted as a yardstick by the southern political parties, especially the resentful NCNC, in their quest to rule the political scene. Every region had hoped for a large headcount, which would ultimately determine the allocation of parliamentary seats, which took the strength of these regions into account. The scale used to allocate resources to areas was based on population because it was so significant. It was also used to assess whether a new territory would be viable. The census, however, evolved into a conflict between the nation's regions for control of the nation's soul. Due to the intense competition, there was a great deal of lawlessness, including electoral violence, falsification of election results, distortion of demographic numbers, and other problems. Despite evidence of falsified numbers being found in the southern regions by the head census officer, the northern region continued to have the numerical edge. The results of the 1962 counts were cancelled after the South failed to obtain dominant seven-figure results and a new census was undertaken in 1963. After a protracted legal battle, the NCNC finally agreed to recognize the 1963 census. The establishment of the Midwestern region was a contributing factor to another issue Nigeria faced in the First Republic. In July 1963, the Western region was split to form the Midwestern region. The formation of the region was loaded with controversy, politics, and arguments. All three political parties, the NPC, AG, and NCNC, had political arguments for or against the region's development. In the end, the area was established with Dennis Osadebe serving as the first premier. The dread and mistrust against the regions increased when the Midwestern region was established. The problems with the 1962-1963 census gave rise to the crisis of the 1964 general elections. To win the elections, all major parties participated in widespread election cheating. The political parties rejected the results and accused one another of manipulating the elections in areas where they did not win, effectively calling into doubt the legitimacy of the government established as a result of such elections. Electoral manipulation, therefore, led to such a high level of distrust across the regions that it served as a key catalyst for the protracted chain of events that ultimately led to the First Republic's collapse. Widespread violent protest and commotion followed amidst doubt, quarreling and accusations. This resulted in numerous fatalities. There was a destruction of property worth millions of Nigerian pounds. 
According to the BBC, there were 700 people dead and 1,000 people injured. It was widely known that each political party orchestrated riots during the 1964 general election campaign. The opposing party made counter charges of thuggery and hooliganism against party members. This quickly turned into intra tribal conflict, especially between the Hausa and the Igbo. This was demonstrated in 1964 when the NPC administration forbade the NCNC party officials from entering Bauchi for a meeting. Numerous violent occurrences that included numerous fatalities during the election campaigns were mostly the consequence of the two alliances' private armies. The opposition party was allegedly intimidated and subdued by the government of each region. Nigerians held their first ever general elections in 1964, at a time when the nation's politics had become bitterly divided and had devolved into a fight between two rival coalitions. The Nigerian National Alliance, which consisted of the NPC and NNDC on one hand, and the United Progressive Grand Alliance, OPGA, which was made up of the NCNC and the AG on the other hand. Each regional party openly intimidated its rivals during the elections. The nature of Nigeria's independence caused an economic crisis to grip the First Republic as well. The contradiction inherited from the new colonial political economy was not resolved by the Nigerian state. The government surrendered its economic strategy to a foreign exploitation and put it under the political control of the Western superpower. Conflict also existed around the distribution of revenues and allocation of various industries. In general, these honest politicians grossly mishandled and embezzled the economy. The wealthy prospered while the underprivileged kept suffering. In the first five years of independence, along with rising inflation, the wealth disparity against upper and middle classes widened quickly. This economic disparity and the widening class gap did not foster regional unity. Another issue with the First Republic was the absence of effective leadership. A lack of strong, effective, purposeful and energetic leadership prevented a young country from reaching its full potential. The political authorities of Nigeria were unable to fix the nation's socio-economic issues Instead, they turned to corruption. By 1965, they were renowned for their consumption and disregard for the masses. They failed to cooperate to work for the benefit of the country as a whole because of their greed. They were unable to deal with pressing national issues including development, national integration and ethnicity. Instead, they started manipulating local socio-cultural concerns to dupe the populace. There was skepticism that tolerance and compromise were the types of leadership traits required for the nation's survival at the time. This was because such characteristics were crucial for the management of a large and diverse nation like Nigeria. Because they lacked the political culture to uphold democracy, it was clear that the politicians were not devoted to making the system workable. Further conflicts for state control among competing parties were fostered by the uneven character and nature of development among areas and groups. These factors exacerbated intergroup, interethnic, and interregional tensions, which eventually aided the Republic's dissolution. Despite the optimism and fervor of the early Republic politicians, parliamentary democracy in that period soon lost its direction and instead of being patriotic and nationalistic, government officials gravitated towards ethnic, tribal and occasionally religious leaders. The West, on the other hand, had internal problems in the action group, while the South felt that the North was too dominant. After that, the bloody conflict between the fractions of the troubled action group led by Chief Samuel Ladoki Akintola and Obafemi Awolowo on May 29, 1962, led to the declaration of a state of emergency in the Western region, which eventually served as a necessary prelude to the fall of the First Republic. The confluence of all these problems that surfaced before and during the First Republic hampered politics. 
These problems appear to be the cause of the Republic's downfall since the coup of January 1966 was allegedly motivated by corruption, political squabbling, the incapacity of the ruling class, repeated allegations of electoral fraud and general unrest, among other things. In September 1963, Awolowo and other defendants were found guilty of treasonable felony and handed a 10-year prison term in the case of Awolowo. Awolowo's imprisonment was a final nail to the coffin of the Dead Action Group Party. Due to a series of problems, the Action Group AG lost its power in 1963. When Obafemi Awolowo was the leader of the party and the federal opposition in 1962, the Western area became embroiled in a political conflict. The Western region's premier at the time and the action group's deputy leader was Samuel Ladoke Akintola. There was distrust between Awolowo and Akintola. Akintola had been charged with treachery and insincerity by Awolowo for attempting to form an alliance with the Northern People's Congress. This infuriated Awolowo, who interpreted the action as part of a scheme to convert the Yorubas into northerners. This split culminated in a string of disputes that disturbed the calm in the Western House of Assembly. The conflict between the house groups of Awolowo and Akintola turned physical on Friday, May 25, 1962. Following this, the Western region was plunged into a serious crisis that was later known as Operation Wetsie. Majors Emmanuel Ifrajuna and Kaduna Nziogu used Operation Wetsie as a main justification for their January 15, 1966 coup that overthrew the First Republic. It was so brutal that political party thugs raced after people, especially members of the opposition party, grabbed them, tied them up, doused them in gasoline and petrol, and then burned them on fire in the open. Seven police officers and almost 200 civilians died as a result of the crisis. The outcome was that the federal government declared a state of emergency in the area in order to take direct control of the region. The federal government's actions put the AG on a life support machine. In the midst of all of these, the police discovered enormous quantities of weapons and ammunition in the possession of AG members in addition to the accusations of poor administration and misuse of finances. The party was accused of planning to overthrow the government. The federal government would eventually pull the plug on the Action Group's life support machine when the party's leadership and Chief Awolowo were pronounced guilty of a treasonable felony. Awolowo would be sentenced to 10 years in jail while another stalwart of the party, Anthony Enahoro, bagged a 15-year sentence. During Awolowo's testimony in the witness box, he dismissed on April 2, 1963, all claims that he and his followers planned to overthrow the government violently using torches and weapons, claiming that no evidence of such an event could be shown in court. Chief Awolowo announced from his box seat that it was a realistic objective to seek to win the office of head of state in any prospective election. Chief Obafemi Awolowo accepted any punishment the judge would impose on him before he was handed a 10-year prison sentence and sent to Calabar. Several events led to the fall and death of the action group in the Western region despite the successes the party recorded before and after independence. Chief among them was the Western Regional Election of October 1965 and Operation Wetsie. When Major Kaduna Nziogu and his colleagues struck on the morning of January 15, 1966, to end Nigeria's First Republic, one of their grievances was the political unrest in the Western region of Nigeria. There were riots, looting, arson, and murder. Political opponents were burned alive. The West, which had been the epitome of development, was now a political war zone where thugs and urchins engaged in wanton killings and destruction of properties. 
The event came to be known as Operation Wetsie, and the Western region was nicknamed Wild Wild West. The 1959 federal elections put Chief Obafemi Awolowo of the Action Group Party, AG, as the leader of the opposition in the federal parliament, while his deputy, Chief Samuel Akintola, became the premier and the leader of the government of Western Region. Pragmatic leaders had chosen Akintola to succeed Awolowo when the latter resigned from the premiership of the Western Region to contest the 1959 federal elections. The reason that Akintola was a logical choice, not only because of his previous association with the party, but more so because of his hometown in Yoruba land. The Action Group party had never won the Ibadan constituency and other constituencies around Ibadan. There had always been intra-ethnic rivalries between Oyo and Ibadan on one hand and Ijebu on the other hand. Chief Akintola was from Ogbumosho, which was in the old Oyo kingdom. Chief Awolowo, on the other hand, was an Ijebu Yoruba. The different intra-Yoruba rivalries did not encourage harmonious unity within the party. Alhaji Adeguke Adelabu, a Yoruba from Ibadan and a member of the rival National Convention of Nigerian Citizens, NCNC, had always successfully exploited the action group's intra-party rivalries to his party's advantage. With Awolowo going to the federal parliament and Adilabu dead due to a motor accident and hence out of the political scene, the AG could win all the seats in the old Oyo kingdom as a result of the traditional son of the area, Akintola as a premier of the region. This strengthened the party's power in the western region and fortunately it gained the Ibado area which was a previous stronghold of the NCNC when Adilabu was alive. With the Western region in the grasp, party leaders started plans to gain power at the federal level, having won 25 seats in the North and 14 seats in the East in the 1959 elections. But the party could not form the federal government through votes based on the conditions of the country as the Northern region alone was two and a half times the size of the other regions, that is, the Western and Eastern regions put together. So. They suggested that the only way to power at the federal level was to form a national government which would comprise all the ruling parties in the different regions. The implication was that the Action Group Party would refrain from any serious political activities in the other regions where it had established a small but viral political base. Akintola was in strong favor of forming a national government which would include all the ruling political parties and advocated an approach to the Northern People's Congress, MPC. But Awolowo and other party members were opposed to it. Instead, they suggested that the party should make advances to the Southern NCNC and not to the Northern MPC. They hoped that the AG and the NCNC could team up together to contest the next federal elections and would break northern Nigeria and the east into more regions. From these two different suggestions, rose opposed factions within the Action Group Party, one under Akintola and the other under Awolowo. The conflict continued discreetly within the party until February 1962 after the party's annual convention at Joss when Akintola, Ayo Rusiji, the party secretary, and some Western regional ministers walked out of the convention because of disagreement on several matters. As disciplinary measures, the party relieved Rusiji as secretary and was replaced with Samuel Ikoku, leader of the opposition in the Eastern House of Assembly. More importantly, the post of the party's deputy leader, which Akintola held, was abolished. The executive committee of the party also found Akintola guilty on 24 charges to which he pleaded guilty and asked for forgiveness. The party held firm and decided that Akintola should be removed from the positions he held as its deputy leader and the Western Regional Premier. 
The former was done by the party and the latter was to be executed by the governor of the western region, Oba Sir Adesoji Aderemi. Akintola accepted the first punishment but rejected the second and maintained that he had not been given the chance to test his popularity on the floor of the Western House of Assembly. A majority of the members signed a petition withdrawing their support from Akintola and presented it to the regional governor. More importantly, they asked the governor to use the powers conferred on him under Section 33, Subsection 10 of the region's constitution to remove Akintola from office, to which the governor complied. The relevant section of the constitution states that the governor shall not remove the premier from office unless it appears to him that the premier no longer commands the support of a majority of the House of Assembly. As expected, Akintola challenged his deposition in a lawsuit at the High Court of Western Nigeria, which then transferred it to the Federal Supreme Court in Lagos to rule on the constitutionality of the dismissal. Meanwhile, the Action Group Party chose a new premier in Alhaji Dauda Adigbenro, whom the governor appointed. The new premier was to seek a vote of no confidence in the Western House of Assembly on May 24, 1962, when Akintola's faction chose to disrupt the proceedings and, because of the ensuing fracas, had the federal government dissolve the House. At the time the legislature was to meet, some members of Akintola's faction in the House went in and smashed windows and furniture and beat up members of the parliament. Chief Odebiyi, Minister of Finance and Leader of the House, was about to move the first business motion of the day when Mr. E.O. O.K. Ogbomosho Southwest jumped up, raised an alarm and flung a chair across the floor of the House. Mr. F. Ebubedike, Badagri East, seized the mace and smashed it on Mr. Speaker's table. Mr. S. A. Adenia, Oyo East, then seized the chair and hit the Minister of Trade and Industry, Mr. K. S. Y. Momo, on the head. He was rushed to the hospital for treatment. At this stage, members of the Akintola faction, assisted by the NCNC opposition, smashed chairs and tables, and the police had to use tear gas to disperse the scuffling. After both premiers Adigbenro and Akintola petitioned the Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Baliwa, the assembly was reconvened again. Unfortunately, the outcome was as severe, even worse, according to witnesses, as the first time. At once, the Akintola faction and the NCNC opposition began to shout and bang their chairs. Chief S.A. Tinubu sat on the floor beside the speaker's chair and continually rang a bell. Mr. J.O. Adigun threatened to throw the record book at the speaker. Mr. Akinyemi smashed one dispatch box and Mr. Adedigba threw the other at Alhaji Adegbenro before it was caught by the sergeant at arms. Mr. Adenia then hit the speaker with a chair while the NCNC members smashed theirs or threw them at opponents. All this time, the police had been begging the speaker to let them act and when he finally did so, they used their clubs, released tear gas again, cleared the house and then locked it up. Because of the chaotic atmosphere, the Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, declared a state of emergency in the West on May 29, 1962, before an emergency session of the federal parliament. Obafemi Awolowo, leader of the opposition, replied that a state of emergency did not exist in the Western region as the violence was only confined to the regional House of Assembly, while the rest of the West was calm and quiet. Awolowo's objection was to no avail and the federal parliament passed a bill that declared a state of emergency in the West with the rights to detain and restrict persons and the imposition of curfews with the appointment of Dr. Moses A. Majekodumi, a distinguished gynecologist, a senator and federal minister of health as the sole administrator of the West. Maja Kodumi's first act was the service of restrictions on a number of people. 
These included the two premiers, Akintola and Adigbenro, Obafemi Awolowo and Remileku Fani Kayode. While the restriction orders on Akintola's faction and NCNC members were lifted in barely two months, those of the action group members remained restricted. Dr. Majako Dumi also instituted a commission of inquiry headed by George Baptist Ayodola Koka of the Lagos High Court into corporations owned by the Western Region and the commission revealed instances of poor administration and misappropriation of public funds for the benefit of the action group party. The report came down hard on Awolowo and other AG members in his faction but exonerated Akintola. The stage for the final act was set in the commission's report of a treasonable felony on Awolowo and his AG members. Searches the Nigerian police carried out in the country during emergency period in western Nigeria revealed large quantities of arms and ammunition which some AG members imported into the country to be used allegedly to overthrow the federal government. Obafemi Awolowo, Anthony Enahoro, as well as some two dozen others were charged with treasonable felony and conspiracy to overthrow the federal government. Awolowo was sentenced to 10 years, while Enahoro and others were sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. These actions led to the death of the action group and on December 31, 1962, the state of emergency was terminated. On January 1, 1963, Akintola was reinstated as Premier of the Western Region and the head of the new government at Agudi, Ibadan, the seat of the regional government with the formation of his new party, United People's Party, UPP, which consisted of those former Action Group Party members he was able to win to his side on his expulsion from the AG. It was a coalition government which was formed by the UPP and the NCNC which had previously formed the opposition. The Action Group Party, which had previously formed the government of the Western Region, now moved into the opposition. In 1964, the UPP had evolved to be the Nigerian National Democratic Party, NNDP, with Akintola as the leader and as a friend of the ruling party, NPC. Hence, the 1965 Western Regional elections gave the NPC another chance of maintaining its political power in the country a hegemony that other political power found irksome. More importantly, the NNDP was determined to remain in power in the face of all overwhelming odds against the NNDP. Should the elections be free and fair, it was left with one alternative, to rig the elections. Whether or not the NNDP was following precedents established by previous political parties, the massive rigging of the Western Regional Elections of October 11, 1965 was flabbergasting. The methods of electoral fraudulence employed were familiar ones, but the scale to which they were used was overwhelmingly much more severe. The Electoral Commission led by Mr. Ayo E. Eshua publicly admitted that electoral officers were kidnapped and therefore could not carry out their duties, while some refused to accept the nomination papers of certain candidates and others failed to report for duty. Many candidates who had obtained validity papers were elected unopposed. The inability of the candidates to register aside, there were questions about ballot papers floating around in the West despite the precautionary measures of giving the ballot papers to the police. The use of party agents and thugs camouflaged as members of the local government police was common and rigging was employed in every conceivable means. Counting was not completed in some polling units before the results of these polling units were broadcast over the radio. Some candidates were declared elected although their opponents scored higher votes. As a result of the grave irregularities, the NNDP won the elections, 16 of its candidates having been returned unopposed at the close of nominations. It was publicly charged that the NNDP victory was due to fraud.
The political atmosphere in the western region looked bleak and dismal, and the after effects of the elections were even more severe and devastating. Defeated political candidates had in the past run to the court to challenge irregularities at elections. This time, they did not go to court. Instead, the people took the laws into their hands. Riots, looting, arson and murder were the rule of the day. Party thugs poured gasoline on opponents and set them on fire, a situation then known as Operation Wetie. Properties, bags of cocoa and other produce of opponents awaiting shipment were also set ablaze. Without a doubt, the destruction of property was not as horrifying as setting human beings on fire. By November 1, 1965, a riot at Ekiti resulted in the death of 15 people, while a fresh riot four days later caused the loss of 20 lives. 16 people were killed in Ijebuode and Ondo areas on November 7, 1965. Houses and vehicles were set on fire, and to travel within the western region and from other regions into the west was a menace because of thugs and gangsters who took laws into their own hands while the police failed to maintain law and order. There was tension and wanton destruction of human life and property. Nigerians looked to the federal government to step in to arrest the situation in the region, but all pleas were to no avail. Meanwhile, the riots and killings continued and the NNDP government of the western region imposed curfews in Mushi, Ikeja, Agege, Ajerumi and Awori districts. Yet, the disturbances continued and each day brought a new toll of rioting, arson, looting and murder. The crisis over the struggle of political power during the Western Regional Elections of October 11, 1965 was the last straw that broke the camel's back, which really convinced the January boys of their military putsch on the morning of January 15, 1966. This military coup would lead to the end of the First Republic and the emergence of Major General Johnson Agui Ronsi as Nigeria's first military head of state on January 16, 1966. On January 15, 1966, a dissident unit of the Nigerian army led by Majors Emmanuel Ifajuna and Kaduna Nziogu carried out Nigeria's first coup d'etat. The coup would lead to the end of the First Republic and the assassination of the Premier of the Northern Region, Sir Amadou Bello, the Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the Premier of the Western Region, Chief Samuel Ladoki Akintola, and the Minister for Finance, Chief Festus Samuel Okuti Ebo. Also, some senior military officers would lose their lives. However, the coup was not entirely successful as the most senior officer in the Nigerian army, Major General Johnson Thomas Omonakwe Aguyi Ronsi, foiled the coup, rounded up the boys and took charge of the country. On Monday, 17 January 1966, Aguyi Ronsi suspended the Nigerian constitution and instituted the Supreme Military Council the military era had begun. Major General Johnson Agui Ronsi, the Nigerian Army's commanding officer, rapidly took over and set about re-establishing law and order. However, the fundamental objectives of the Ironsi dictatorship coincided with those of the coup leaders, restoring law and order, preserving basic services, eliminating regionalism and tribalism, and putting an end to corruption. Ironsi predicted that his administration would last only until the people's wishes were reflected in a new constitution. In each of the regions, Ironsi appointed military governors and outlawed political parties. Lieutenant Colonel Chukwe Meka Odumegu Ojuku, the new governor of the eastern region, was one of these new military governors. At first, especially in the South, the military takeover and Ironsi's ascension were cheered. For many people in the South, the overthrow of the civilian government signaled the end of a plan for Northern domination. 
Jubilation greeted the fall of the unpopular NNDP rule in the western region and the violence and turmoil that had dogged the area since the elections in October came to an almost immediate halt. The ensuing policies of Ironsi as head of state, however, frightened many northerners who began to see the coup and Ironsi as components of a scheme by southern, mainly Igbo officers to use the military to impose a new period of Igbo dominance. Circumstantial evidence supported this theory in numerous ways. First off, the ring leaders of the January coup were Igbo. Only one was Yoruba. Also, the majority of the casualties were northerners. The two most important politicians in the north, Balewa and Belo, together with their ally Akintola, were killed, although the premiers of the Midwestern and Eastern regions were detained but later released. Many believe that this pattern demonstrated that the coup was essentially an Igbo attack on the north. Ironsi made various decisions in the first half of 1966 that worsened the situation by giving many northerners reason to think that he was part of an Igbo conspiracy. Instead of having the coup plotters put on trial for the crimes that the northerners believed they had done, Ironsi stalled and jailed them. Additionally, Ironsi was resented for accelerating the promotion of Igbo officers more quickly than their peers, even though it was merited. Decree No. 34 of May 24, 1966, in which Ironsi formally abolished the federal system and replaced it with a unitary system, was in the eyes of Northerners the most damning piece of evidence against him. The regional organization of Nigeria vanished and was replaced by groups of provinces. The military and civil service, which had hitherto been administered locally, were to be combined and run from the same location. The Northerners feared and saw this as an actual evil dominance. Now, the possibility of having Southern military officers occupy it and Southern civil officials run its government existed. As a result, there were massive protests against the Irunsi regime across northern Nigeria. The situation reached its peak on July 29, 1966, when a group of northern non-commissioned officers and officers of the 4th Battalion in Ibadan arrested the head of state and killed him. The Agui Irunsi regime had come to an end. July rematch was the code name of Nigeria's second military coup. The fact that the majority of the coup plotters were Igbos and the coup was labeled an Igbo coup was one of the causes of the counter coup in Nigeria on July 29, 1966. Although the coup was planned by military commanders from several ethnic nationalities in Nigeria, not simply Igbo military officers, the northern military officers then promised to exact revenge. They were angry at Major General Aguyi Ronsi for doing nothing, so they held diverse meetings to plan a counter coup. With assistance from the local government, roving gangs committed the program in May 1966. Furthermore, it is generally known that the already high level of tension was exacerbated by some of the unruly behavior of the international press. Also, Plans by the northern elites to instigate violence included fabricating news reports to Radio Kotunu and replaying them over the BBC's Awusa station, documenting inflated attacks against northerners in the east, which led to the brutal slaughter of eastern Nigerians on September 29, 1966. Estimates from British newspapers at the time placed a death toll among the Igbo at between 10 and 30,000 in September 1966. This murderous rampage and carnage, which began in late September and occasionally had the help of soldiers, was aimed at the entire northern region. On July 28, 1966, after midnight, a mutiny led by Lieutenant Colonel Murtala Mohammed turned into a coup. General Johnson Agui Ronsi, the first military head of state of Nigeria, and Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle Fajuyi, who was hosting Agui Runsi when he was visiting Ibadan, were both killed. Disgruntled northern non-commissioned officers committed the assassination. Lagos also turned violent at the same time and a sizable number of Igbos, likely over 250,000, fled to the east from the north. 
Between September 29 and October 4, 1966, nearly 2,000 Igbos were killed in the north, according to existing records. For three days, Nigeria struggled without a leader until the most senior northern officer in the Nigerian army, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon, was chosen as a new head of state and supreme commander of the armed forces. He was just 31. Quickly, Gowon repealed Decree No. 34 in a bid to please the northerners and the regime's commitment to federation while honoring regional differences. However, in the eastern region, the Igbo military governor, Lieutenant Colonel Emeka Ojuku, had severe misgivings about the legitimacy of the counter-coup and refused to recognize the new leadership in Lagos. Ojuku argued that even if Ironsi was dead, there were still living senior army officers who had a greater claim to the title of Supreme Commander than Gowon. These officers all had higher ranks and more experience than Gowon. Ironsi's death and Gowon's ascension, however, did not stop the wanton killings of the Igbo people in northern Nigeria, and this was more of a concern for Ojuku than Gowon's new office. Even though Gowon denounced the killings, the federal military government did nothing to stop it, and about 80,000 Easterners were killed in a series of massacres during this time the deadliest of which was committed on September 29, 1966, by northern soldiers. Retaliatory deaths of northerners living in the eastern region resulted from these massacres. Such occurrences made Ojuku doubt if Igbos could ever coexist peacefully inside a federal Nigeria. In addition to advising other northerners in the east to follow suit, he pleaded with all easterners who were outside the region to return home. As a result, there were significant demographic shifts in the second half of 1966 and the beginning of 1967. Gowon was adamant about keeping the East within the Federation, even as Ojuku was considering secession because the Easterners were no longer safe in one Nigeria. The tension between the two leaders would last until January 1967 when Gowon and Ojuku met at a neutral ground outside the country in Aburi, Ghana to reach a peaceful agreement and the way forward for Nigeria and its political system. On January 4 and 5, 1967, Delegates and representatives from both the federal government of Nigeria and the eastern region, led by Lieutenant Colonel Emeka Ojuku, met in Aburi, Ghana, to agree on what is now known as the Aburi Accord. The meeting at Aburi was supposed to be the last opportunity to avoid any conflict or civil war. Unfortunately, it was not to be. After the first military coup that installed Major General Johnson Thomas Agui Ronsi as Nigeria's first military head of state on January 16, 1966, the Northern soldiers had started planning, by May 1966, the revenge of their leaders who had been murdered in January. The Northerners were the major casualties of that coup that was carried out by soldiers mainly from the East. To them, it was an Eastern-favored coup as Agui Ronsi's regime was believed to be extremely partisan. This highlighted the feeling of insecurity of other groups. It created more problems than it solved old ones, which led to severe criticism of the Supreme Commander. The general himself may not have been necessarily nepotistic. Rather, he failed to see the sectional and clannish implications of events policies and appointments that were made during his tenure of office. 194 days after taking office, Agui Ronsi was murdered in a northern counter-coup on July 29, 1966, and for three days, the nation had no recognized leader until Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan succeeded the late head of state on August 1, 1966.
The immediate significance of the July coup was that it forced a return to an ethnic balance within the army as neither the major ethnic groups, Hausa or Yoruba, was placed in power, but a minor ethnic group from the northern region in present-day Plateau State. In the confusion that followed the second coup d'etat, the slender confidence that remained between the Igbo and the northerners was shattered. Disturbances broke out in the east, but even more so in the north after August 1, 1966. The mass killings of the Igbo in the north were a deplorable act that was condemned by Nigerians, including the military governors. With a counter coup of July 29, 1966, the political development of Nigeria's federal structure took a different turn. It was accentuated even more by the fact that the Eastern Regional Government in Enugu immediately threatened secession if certain grievances and demands were not met. The immediate concern of the federal government, therefore, was for it to find ways to appease the East, so long as such concessions were within the framework of one Nigeria. Claiming he was not safe outside the East, the Eastern Military Governor, Lieutenant Colonel Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku, refused to leave the region for any meeting anywhere in Nigeria. In a rejoinder, the federal government too argued that the Nigerian leader, Yakubu Gowon, should also not go to the East for a meeting. His life, they also claimed, was not safe there either. Tension mounted, and Lieutenant General Joseph Arthur Ankara of Ghana offered a neutral meeting place. The venue was Aburi, Ghana. The Aburi meeting started on January 4, 1967 and lasted for two days. Aburi was significant for several reasons. First, that the leaders met at all was an achievement in itself. But even more tangible was the fact that the leaders agreed that force would not be used to settle the brothers Palava. There was also the question of the disposition of Nigerian troops and the reorganization of the army after the second coup on July 29, 1966, and the subsequent killing that followed in May and September. Further, Ojuku said that his region was perturbed that contrary to Gowon's promise on August 9, 1966, that all soldiers would return to their region of origin, northern troops still occupied the western region. Gowan replied that his promise of August 9 applied to the repatriation of soldiers of northern origin stationed in the east back to the north and those of eastern origin stationed in the north back to the east. He had fulfilled his promise, he said. He then emphasized that soldiers of northern origin would remain in the west since there were only a few Yoruba in the Nigerian army. Ojuku was not satisfied and further insisted on a reorganization of the army on a regional basis. Gowon was also firmly opposed to splitting up the army. Ojuku claimed that Nigeria did not have a central government since the country, as a result of the second coup and its aftermath, resolved itself into three separate sovereign areas, the Lagos West-North area, the Midwest area and the East area. But Gowon insisted that Nigeria was still one nation an entity composed of four regions and a central government in Lagos. Ojuku then proposed that the situation in the nation necessitated a drawing apart of the regions because the separation of forces, the separation of the population is, in all sincerity, necessary in order to avoid further friction and further killings. The other leaders who all wanted one Nigeria agreed to Ojuku's proposal but apparently without understanding the implication. This was a bombshell of Aburi. By agreeing to Ojuku's argument that the region should first pull apart in order to stay together, the other leaders in effect sanctioned Biafra's secession, hence the end of Nigeria as a single nation. They attended and left the Aburi meeting with a firm belief that Nigeria should and would continue as one nation.
but they had gone to that meeting, as it seems, without adequate preparations in terms of a crew of legal and political advisers which such a meeting demanded. They had gone to Aburi in a spirit of comradeship. Ojuku, on the other hand, meant business. He arrived in Aburi with a strong team of legal, political and economic advisers, secretaries and realms of paper. Not only did the other leaders agree with Ojuku that the regions and people of the nation should first draw a pact, but they also agreed to the latter suggestion that there should be no more supreme commander of the army, hence no head of government or head of state. What Ojuku wanted was that whoever was at the top should be a titular head who would only act when all of them have met and taken a unanimous decision. Since the unanimous decision of all the regions was required before he could act on all matters which affected any of the regions or the nations as a whole, the commander-in-chief and head of the government was only so in name he would still be a titular head. The point of the agreement at Aburi was that each region would be responsible for its own affairs and that the federal military government would be responsible for matters that affected the entire country, a simple enough concept. Afterwards, the officers toasted their reconciliation and agreement with champagne. The federal delegation's jubilation was such that on his plane flight home, Ojuku asked one of his secretaries whether the federal delegation had fully understood the implications of what had been agreed. However, no one at Aburi other than Ojuku really understood the constitutional implications of what had been agreed. Ojuku was obviously delighted with this, hence why he was in such a hurry to implement the decisions that were taken and why Gowon had to break his promise. Federal permanent secretaries who headed the various ministries of the government as of then, as well as political and legal experts in the country, were appalled at the content of the Aburi Agreement when their leaders returned home. The permanent secretaries met on January 20, 1967 to evaluate the agreement and they rightly argued that the title of Commander-in-Chief was a subtle way of either abolishing the post of the Supreme Commander or declaring it vacant now that its previous occupant, Major General Agui Ronsi, was dead. They further reported that the proposal that all appointments to top posts in the military, civil service and a diplomatic corps be unanimously approved by the Supreme Military Council would tend to paralyze the functions of the Federal Public Service Commission. They also noted that the allegiance and loyalty of the regionally appointed officers of the federal government would be to regions, meaning in effect that there would be no federal public service. The summary of their report was that the Aburi Agreement summed up to a confederation. The leaders themselves were shocked. Then, from February 16 through February 18, 1967, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan summoned a meeting of the secretaries to the military government and other officials which was held in Benin City over a memo one of the permanent secretaries had written concerning the Aburi Accord. The memo traced the long, hard road that Nigeria had traveled and stressed the need to keep a united nation. The permanent secretary who wrote this memo was Prince Solomon Akenzua, who later, as Ere Diawa I, became the 39th Oba of Benin on March 23, 1979. However, Prince Akenzua was an outstanding civil servant. In fact, he rose to become the Federal Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health, before he retired in 1973. Akenzua in the memo said that Gowon had given too much away in Aburi and that it would lead to the destruction of the country. He also said that Gowon had legalized total regionalism, which would make the center very weak. Prince Akenzua further alluded in his memo that a weak center would lead to a confederation and a total disintegration of Nigeria. The shocking revelation of the meeting of the Aburi Agreement overshadowed some of the important decisions the leaders agreed to at Aburi in their search for peace and for a new basis of a stable federal union, or at least, a national unity. Aburi on the whole was a big success, but the interpretation of what transpired at the meeting devalued the success. 
Ironically, implementing the decisions agreed on at Aburi was necessary. Ojuku then set March 31, 1967 as a deadline for the unilateral implementation of the Aburi Accord. Gowon, on the other hand, broke his promise and restated that the constitutional changes the East proposed would not work because such changes would result in the end of Nigeria as a single nation. As Prince Akenzua had written in his memo, Gowon had given too much away in Aburi that would have led to the destruction of the country. He legalized total regionalism, which would make the center very weak. And a weak center would eventually lead to a confederation and total disintegration of Nigeria. While the federal permanent secretaries were evaluating the document to which their leaders were signatories, Ojuku and the East had grown tougher with their demands. On their own, the other military leaders on March 17, 1967, issued a significant policy, Decree No. 8, which conferred far more powers on the regional governments than ever before. This was deliberately done in the hope that a new and greater decree of decentralization would placate the East so that it would not secede and a potentially subsequent brutal war would be avoided. This decree number eight ignored the report of the permanent secretaries but did not fully concur with Ojuku's demands. It also decentralized the government to such an extent that the regions were virtually autonomous units in which each of the regional governor had executive powers. However, Ojuku would reject the decree because a part of the decree stated that no region shall exercise its executive authority so as to impede or prejudice the exercise of the executive authority of the Federation or to endanger the continuance of federal government in Nigeria. Further, it provided that the Supreme Military Council can also take appropriate measures against the region that attempts to secede from the rest of the Federation and could take over the functions of that region. The part Ojuku and his Easterners hated the most stated that the federal government could declare a state of emergency in any region which violated any of the above provisions on the consent of the remaining three regions instead of the unanimous decision of all the four regions. As a result, Ojuku set March 31, 1967 as the D-Day for the unilateral implementation of the Aburi Agreement. But the East did not secede. Instead, it seized all federal revenue that came from that part of the country. In the meantime, the Yoruba people were dissatisfied with the presence of troops of northern origin who occupied the western region and the decision to recruit Yoruba people into the army did little to ease those feelings. So, the Yoruba through Chief Obafemi Awolowo proposed that should Ojuku and the East secede, the West would feel free to follow suit. The federal government was caught pants down while Ojuku and his followers in the East popped champagne. While the federal government was still trying to steady itself from these revelations, the northern leaders made an astonishing suggestion, the creation of more states. The nation was stunned. The question of the creation of more states, particularly in the north, had been a perennial issue which northern politicians had always resisted. Thus, southerners had accused the north of trying to dominate Nigeria forever. They also believe that the Nigerian crisis would be over if the North accepts that power can be shared. Breaking up the North into more states, which was what the East and other parts of the nation wanted, would provide the answer. The Northern decision was a pleasant surprise to most of the nation, particularly the minority people of the North, that is, the Middle Belt areas and those of the Cross River, Ogoja Rivers area, which Ojuku would later claim as part of Biafra. Because of this, Ojuku did not agree to the Northern Declaration for the creation of more states. 
The Yorubas, who had been one of the ardent advocates for the creation of more states, felt pleased with this unprecedented northern move, and they eventually threw their support behind the federal government. Now energized, the federal government was ready for a showdown with Ojuku as the authorities in the eastern region executed some acts which provoked the federal government. These acts included the seizure of over £200,000 worth of produce belonging to the Northern Region Marketing Board that was in Port Harcourt in the east, awaiting shipment. The confiscation of the one-third of the entire rolling stock of the Nigerian railway as well as 115 oil tankers. Other acts included the seizure also at Port Harcourt of a Nigerian Airways DC-3 aircraft that had left the Ikeja airport earlier on the same day on April 5, 1967. A week later, three Igbo gunmen in civilian clothes hijacked another plane belonging to Nigeria Airways which was flying from Benin in the Midwest region to Lagos. The federal government immediately halted all further flights to the eastern region. Terrorist activities in Lagos and other parts of the country heightened tension. Before long, the sanctions against the East were beginning to bite as a result of an economic blockade of the Eastern region in early May 1967. A few days later, on May 26, 1967, Ojuku addressed the East's consultative assembly consisting of some 300 delegates from all provinces in the East. He declared, and I quote, there is no power in this country or in all of black Africa that would be able to subdue us by force. End of quote. It was left to the assembly, Ojuku continued, to choose one of these three alternatives. 1. Accepting the terms of the North and go on and thereby submitting to the domination of the North. 2. Continuing the present stalemate and drift. Or 3. Ensuring their survival by declaring their autonomy. The assembly got the message. For whatever it was worth, it gave Ojuku the powers and urged him to declare at an early practicable date for Eastern Nigeria as a free, sovereign and independent state by the name and title of the Republic of Biafra. The authorities in Lagos had anticipated the move and had prepared for it. On May 27, 1967, Gowon declared a state of emergency for the entire nation and announced that he had assumed full powers for the short period necessary to carry out the measures which were now urgently required. Decree number 8, which was promulgated deliberately to appease Ojuku and the East, was abrogated. Gowon also announced that Nigeria was divided into more states 12 in all. Nigerians were jubilant as the minorities felt secure and out of domination by the majority of people within the former regions. The northern region was broken into six states, Northwestern, North Central, North Eastern, Benue Plateau, Kano and Kwara, thereby cracking its monolithic posture. The east was broken into three, with the Igbo people having their own state East Central and the non Igbo minority peoples in the East, two of their own states, Rivers and Southeastern. The Midwest remained as it was. Some areas of the Western region, like Yaba, Ikeja, and Ikurudu, were carved out and merged with the federal territory of Lagos to form Lagos State. What remained of the Western region became Western State. The creation of more states in the country pushed the East Central State the Igbo heartland into an interior pocket, cut off from the coastal oil reserves and its two seaports of Port Harcourt and Calabar. Thus, the lack of seaports for the East Central State was not unique. For the secessionists, the creation of more states was a bombshell, a political reality which they refused to accept or even believe. They began to speed up the withdrawal of the eastern region, which would include, according to them, the two new states of Rivers and Southeastern, with capitals in Port Harcourt and Calabar, respectively. 
On May 30, 1967, Ojuku proclaimed that the territory and region known as Eastern Nigeria, together with her continental shelves and territorial waters, shall henceforth be an independent, sovereign state of the name and title, the Republic of Biafra. A new flag was hoisted in public buildings in the east, and the police and army appeared in different uniforms. A national anthem that sounded like Sibelius Philandia, and which Dr. Nnamdi Azikwe later claimed was plagiarized from his poem Ode to Onicha, was broadcast. While nothing particularly dramatic happened for the next 30 days, the atmosphere was tense. Though Gowon had his own share of the blames, especially his carelessness after Aburi, he did everything possible to prevent the Nigerian balloon from bursting and to appease Ojuku to the extent that many Nigerians were doubting whether the federal government was a sick dog that could neither bark nor bite. Nigeria's political instability had now been pushed to its limit. On July 6, 1967, the federal government mounted what she initially termed a police action to arrest the secession. Subsequent events soon showed that it was not a mere police action. It was much more serious than that, particularly with the rebel capture of the Midwest region through another Igbo engineered plot in the small Benin garrison on August 9, 1967. The assault on the Midwest had been a miscalculation that led to the Midwest boomerang when the federal military government mounted a counter-offensive with Lieutenant Colonel Murtala Mohammed at the forefront. The secession was now such that it could not be stopped by just a police action and the result was a 30-month cruel civil war in which over 1 million innocent civilians' lives were lost equipment worth billions of dollars wasted, and thousands of stalwart soldiers on both sides dead. For three key reasons, Biafra could not simply be left to separate, according to Gowon and the federal military government. First, Gowon believed in the viability of war Nigeria and was prepared to battle for its preservation. Second, allowing Biafra to secede would open the door to any minority group in the Federation to leave at any time. The federal military government did not relish the idea of Nigeria breaking up into numerous small unfriendly states. The last and most important one is that 67% of Nigeria's known oil reserves were located in the territory claimed by Ojuku's Biafra. Thus, the cessation of Biafra put at risk the FMG's potential for a sizable source of income. As a result, civil war broke out on July 6, 1967. The Nigerian Civil War or the Nigeria Biafra War began as a police action and would rage for 30 months. In contrast to the Nigerians, the Biafrans saw the conflict as a war for their very lives, as according to Ojuku, they were under the threat of genocide. Ojuku and his group of advisors were successful in focusing Biafra's public opinion around a developing Igbo nationalism, while also winning widespread foreign support by portraying the war as primarily a self-defense action. Gowon's efforts to maintain the Nigerian Federation in some respects seem to confirm Biafra's perception that the regime's primary objective was the destruction of the Igbo. Isolating Igbo territory and destabilizing Biafra were the main goals of Gowon's war plan. On May 27, 1967, Gowon announced the formation of new states and proclaimed a state of emergency in Nigeria after Ojuku proclaimed Biafra's independence three days later on May 30. Twelve new states were formed from the three regions and the federal capital territory of Lagos, with three of the states being founded in the former eastern region. Gowon used this tactic to placate national minority groups who had been calling for new states since the country's inception. Only one of the three states formed from the eastern region, the East Central State, had a significant Igbo population. Additionally, 
the East Central State was a landlocked state, while the other two states in the eastern region, Rivers and Southeastern, covered all of Biafra's coastline and held the majority of the nation's oil wealth. Although the establishment of these states within Biafra was largely symbolic, because Biafra already controlled the entire area of the former eastern region, it did reduce support for the Biafran government among non igbo citizens who saw the state's establishment as proof that a federal military government could act in their best interests. It was a complete masterstroke on the part of Guon. While the establishment of new states was intended to further divide the Igbo and complicate political issues for the Biafran government, Gowon also made steps to stifle the Biafran economy. A military cordon surrounded the nation and the coast was under blockade, making it a challenge for Biafra to import or export food and other supplies. Even while the federal military government did permit routine shipments of aid handled by humanitarian organizations, the embargo's overall impact was negative. In January 1968, Gowon announced that the Nigerian currency would change. This meant that any Nigerian money the Biafrans had accumulated to finance the conflict and their administration swiftly lost all of its value. These economic considerations eventually had an adverse effect on Biafra. Food became more and more scarce, and Biafra's rampant inflation rendered even existing products unaffordable. For instance, the price of beef increased from 3 to 60 pence per pound, the price of dried fish from 5 to 60 pence per pound, and the price of a chicken soared from 15 to as much as 30 pounds at the end of the war. Following some early military gains by the Biafran army, which in the early stages of the conflict captured the Midwestern region and threatened to invade the Western region, the Nigerian forces started to advance, gradually driving the Biafrans back well into their region. On October 4, 1967, federal troops took control of Enugu, Biafra's first capital, and by October 18, they had captured Calabar. Federal forces swiftly drove the Biafran army from the Midwestern region. The federal government appeared to have won the war quickly, but the Biafrans resisted giving up so lightly. The war first ceased for a while after the capital was relocated to Umwahia in the south. This was partially motivated by Gowon's expectation that the people of Biafra would rebel against the Biafran government on their own as a result of his policies of economic stifling and political favoritism of minority groups. It turned out that this was a mistake. Rapid increases in malnutrition and starvation in Biafra allowed Ujuku and other Biafran leaders to use Gowon's policies as evidence of a plot to exterminate the Igbo. Massive amounts of propaganda were produced in Biafra, and the country even hired a foreign European advertising agency to spread the word about the Biafran cause, particularly the claims of genocide to other countries. Deprivation was a key component of the federal military government's agenda, although Gowon constantly disputed charges of genocide while pointing out that millions of Igbos were already living in peace in areas controlled by federal forces. However, the propaganda created by Biafra helped to incite Igbos outside the country and abroad to feel strongly against Nigeria and garnered support for Biafra from numerous worldwide sources. There was clear international involvement in the civil war. The Nigerian government received military support from the Egyptian government in the form of military planes and pilots. On July 8, 1967, the Emperor of Ethiopia and the heads of state of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda and Zambia made a joint call for a truce and diplomatic talks. The government of Nigeria rejected the East African community's invitation to deploy a four-person conciliation panel of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda and Zambia to mediate the dispute. In August 1967, the foreign minister of Dahomey, Emil Zinsu, proposed acting as a mediator, but the Nigerian government declined. 
On August 9, 1967, the British government gave the Nigerian government military support. Ten days later, on August 19, 1967, the government of the Soviet Union gave the Nigerian government military aid in the form of combat planes and 170 military technicians. On September 14, 1967, the heads of state of the Organization of African Unity, OAU, denounced the uprising and constituted a consultative committee under the leadership of Ethiopia's emperor, Haile Selassie. On October 4, 1967, government troops seized Enugu, the Biafran capital. On October 16, 1967, Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin promised Nigeria financial support. On October 18, 1967, a government attack on Biafran separatists near Onitsha resulted in the death of over 2,000 soldiers. Beginning on November 20, 1967, the World Council of Churches, WCC, a non-governmental organization with headquarters in Switzerland, started a mission to offer humanitarian aid to people displaced by the violence. In January 1968, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, began a mission to offer humanitarian aid to people displaced by the fighting. More negotiation and diplomatic efforts were rendered, yet the war continued in full swing. On February 3, 1968, the Society of Friends, Quakers, organized a three-person committee to assist in the discussions between the parties. On March 20, 1968, the Vatican and WCC jointly urged for a ceasefire, but the parties rejected the request. Onisha was taken by federal forces on March 22, 1968. Beginning in April 1968, the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, created an operation called International Airlift West Africa to deliver humanitarian aid to those who had been displaced by the fighting. On April 13, 1968, the Tanzanian government offered Biafra diplomatic support and recognition. On April 24, 1968, the government of Czechoslovakia implemented military sanctions, the stoppage of weaponry shipments against Nigeria and Biafra. On May 18, 1968, the government of Gabon offered Biafra formal support and diplomatic recognition. On May 9, 1968, Military aircraft from the government struck insurgent sites in Port Harcourt and Aba, killing 150 civilians. On May 15, 1968, the Ivory Coast recognized and offered diplomatic support to Biafra. On May 18, 1968, government soldiers took control of Port Harcourt. On May 20, 1968, the government of Zambia granted Biafra official support and diplomatic recognition. From May 23 to 31, 1968, formal negotiations between the parties were conducted in Kampala, Uganda, by the Commonwealth Secretary General Arnold Smith and Ugandan President Milton Obote. Apart from mediation efforts, the Biafrans were also subject to military restrictions, all in a bid to quell the war. The Nigerian government and Biafra were subjected to military restrictions the stoppage of weaponry shipments by the Dutch government on June 6, 1968. They were also subjected to military sanctions, the suspension of weaponry shipments by the Belgian government on July 5, 1968. From July 20 to 26, 1968, in Niamey, Niger, the OAU Consultative Committee presided over by President Hamani Diori of Niger mediated initial talks between the parties. However, on July 31, 1968, the French government declared its support for Biafra and starting in August 1968, it gave Ojuku military aid, that is, guns and ammunition. It was more like Nigeria was caught in the web of international politics since France was Britain's rival and would want to form an alliance with whichever side Britain was against. Nevertheless, the OAU continued her peacemaking efforts. Between August 5 and September 9, 1968, the OAU Consultative Committee, which was led by Ethiopia's Emperor Haile Selassie, sponsored formal negotiations between the parties in Addis Ababa. As the war continued, Aba was taken over by government forces on September 4, 1968. 
Beginning on September 7, 1968, the governments of Britain, Canada, Poland and Sweden created a four-person fact-finding team to look into claims of genocide by federal forces. On September 16, 1968, government military planes bombed the Aguleri market close to Odisha, killing 510 people. On September 28, 1968, government military planes bombed Umahia Township, killing 31 people. On September 30, 1968, government troops in Okigwe killed two members of the ICRC, two members of the WCC and 100 civilians. In September 1968, the OAU's chief of state urged for a ceasefire. The Catholic Relief Service, CRS, Caritas International, the Vatican City-based organization providing humanitarian aid, and Church World Service collaborated and formed the Joint Church Aid, JCA mission, to also render humanitarian aid. Also, the AFSC and the Mennonite Central Committee, MCC, started a mission in January 1969 to give humanitarian aid to Nigerians. From March 27 to 31, 1969, British Prime Minister Harold Wilson made an effort to mediate a deal between representatives of Biafra and the Nigerian government. From April 17 to 20, 1969, in Monrovia, Liberia, the OAU Advisory Committee conducted negotiations between the parties. On April 20, 1969, the OAU Consultative Committee requested a ceasefire. On June 5, 1969, a government military aircraft shot down an ICRC plane and the ICRC ended its airlift operation in Biafra on the 10th day of June that same year. On October 2, 1969, the ICRC called its humanitarian operation in Nigeria to a close. In November 1969, the Quaker mission called a stop to its efforts to mediate talks between the parties. On December 15, 1969, the OAU Consultative Committee was dissolved. They had completed their work. The nationwide fire had been quenched. On January 11, 1970, the Biafran leader, Colonel Emeka Ojuku, fled the country for the Ivory Coast. Beginning on January 12, 1970, the government of Denmark, Ireland and United States offered humanitarian aid to refugees. The next day, the governments of Australia, Ethiopia, Italy, Norway and West Germany also offered humanitarian aid to refugees. The JCA was outlawed by the Nigerian government on January 14, 1970. On January 15, 1970, Biafra formally gave up its independence and surrendered to Nigeria. The war had finally ended, but Nigerians had to leave with the agonizing effects. About 45,000 government soldiers, 45,000 Biafran fighters and 30,000 civilians lost their lives at war and around 500,000 people perished from famine and starvation. In fact, during the fighting, around 3 million people had become internally displaced. Despite the swift reunification of the nation and Nigeria's NS effort to put the past in the past, the civil war did leave a lasting impact on Nigeria, one that would get worse with the military's continued hold on power following the war. The period of the war had come to an end and the expectation was that the Nigerian state would finally enjoy a breath of fresh air. But that was not the case. The post-war period came with coup after coup and conflict after conflict and Nigeria would not return to the democratic system of government until 1979. On July 29, 1975, General Yakubu Gowon was overthrown in a military takeover and Brigadier Murtala Muhammad took his place. The 1975 coup was a bloodless one. 
The 40-year-old Gowon was in Kampala, Uganda for a summit of the presidents of the 46 countries that made up the OAU when the Lagos radio proclaimed the end of his nine years in power. Colonel Nanven Garba, the commander of the Elite Guards Brigade, who had previously guarded Gowon in his Lagos headquarters and was regarded as one of his closest friends, made the announcement. Colonel Garba made no mention of the recent events that had driven the military to act against General Gowon, but months of labor and student unrest in Nigeria had preceded the military's actions. The campus unrest brought on by the students' demand that the pledge of handing over to a civilian government be upheld resulted in the closure of several institutions in February 1975. The nation, which was one of the richest in Africa because of its vast oil production, was however plagued with regular strikes and demands for greater wages from worker unions. Calls for the expansion of the 12-state federation were also ignored by the Gowon regime. On the ninth anniversary of the army takeover that led to General Gowon's establishment, the military takeover announcement was made and after that, everything in Lagos seemed to be calm. The majority of the streets were clear and most people appeared to be in a relaxed mood. All airports and border crossings were alleged to have been closed and a dusk to dawn curfew was also declared. Communication with the outside world was reportedly shut off and Nigeria Airways flights were cancelled. Armed personnel carriers reportedly drove through the neighborhood and troops were stationed all around the Lagos airport. A new government was now in charge. This new government would be headed for four years by a troika of Brigadiers Murtala Mohammed, Olushegun Obasanjo, and Theophilus Danjuma until October 1, 1979, when it handed over power to the civilians. On July 29, 1975, Brigadier Murtala Mohammed succeeded Yakubu Gowan as Nigeria's third military head of state after the latter was overthrown in a bloodless coup. However, Mohammed would rule for just 200 days before he was assassinated in an abortive coup on February 13, 1976. As a result, General Olushegun Obasanjo, who had been his second in command, took his place and continued with his predecessor's policies. The Murtala Obasanjo regime would create a new constitution in 1978 and a new civilian government, the Second Republic, the following year on October 1, 1979. Murtala Mohammed's decisive leadership and the revolutionary changes in both domestic and foreign affairs won the hearts and minds of many Nigerians. On July 30, 1975, the Libyan government offered diplomatic support to the Mohammed administration, and two days later, on August 1st, the British did the same. On August 6, 1975, the Supreme Military Council, SMC, selected the 25 members of the Federal Executive Council. On November 18, 1975, the 50-member committee that Murtala Mohammed created to design a new constitution met for the first time. He purged those alleged to be corrupt, slothful or ineffective from public service ministries, universities, parastatals, and other state and federal government organizations. To provide recommendations on the establishment of further states, Mohammed established a commission under the direction of Justice Ayo Irikefe. In 1976, seven new states were founded as a result of its findings. A group headed by Justice Akintola Aguda was also established by Murtala Mohammed to decide if a new federal capital should be established due to the congestion in Lagos. As a location for a new capital, the group suggested Abuja in the southern portion of the old northern region. A significant change from the ostentation of the Gowon era, Murtala Mohammed instituted the low-profile strategy due to economic concerns. 
Murtala Mohammed removed state governors from the SMC membership while maintaining the basic principles of military federalism. He then established a new body, the National Council of States, in which they were a central component. This body's establishment highlighted the status of the state government as subservient because it was presided over by the head of state and reported to the SMC. In comparison to Gowon's regime, this system allowed the head of state to have more influence over the state governors. Murtala Mohammed pursued a ferocious foreign policy that put Africa at the forefront and actively supported liberation movements on the continent. The program of transition to a civilian government that Mohammed started before his death, however, was the one that had the greatest impact on all of his activities. His successor, Obasanjo, carried out the program as intended. The stages of the transition agenda included expanding the number of states, reforming local administration, creating a new constitution, establishing political parties and ultimately electing a new government. On October 1, 1979, civilian rule returned, marking the completion of the transition process. On Friday, February 13, 1976, Colonel Buka Dimka carried out an unsuccessful coup which resulted in the death of the head of state, General Murtala Mohammed. It appeared that Dimka's goal was to reinstate Gowon as the head of state by bringing him back from his self-imposed exile. However, it failed. Subsequently, Lieutenant General Olusegun Obasanjo became Nigeria's fourth head of state. Although first compared negatively to his predecessor, Obasanjo was successful where the more obstinate Murtala Mohammed had failed. The new head of state developed a skilled political leadership that was committed to preventing the country's Muslim, Christian and North-South divisions from worsening. The Obasanjo regime initiated several reforms in public life in addition to carefully managing every phase of the transition to civilian rule in October 1979. The creation of public complaints commissioners in each of the 19 states of the Federation, as well as the federal capital, served as the principal vehicle for this procedure. Even though specific instances of corruption and abuse of power were made public, there was little headway achieved in halting the growth of this disease in the society and economy. Olusegun Obasanjo expanded the Gowon Initiated Economic Indigenization Initiative. Additionally, it employed a land use decree of 1978 to organize the nation's disorganized tenancy laws, lessen ruinous land speculation, and stop the ongoing disputes over private and public property rights. In a similar spirit, Operation Feed the Nation OFN was introduced by the Obasanjo regime to combat the sharp increase in food exports. Although none of these attempts was effective, the initiatives provided information on the kinds of tactics Nigeria would need to use to change its economic imbalances. In retrospect, it appears that the Murtala Obasanjo regime tried to take on too much too fast given the difficult process of the transition to civilian control and the numerous reforms that were implemented during their four years in office. Obasanjo imposed several austerity measures during his final year in office and ordered that all government employees maintain a low profile. Despite its all wealth, the head of state was aware that Nigeria was still relatively underdeveloped, with the majority of its business people serving as agents or middlemen for international corporations. Such a commendable approach, however, was quickly forgotten as the successive civilian administration rode the wave of a new rise in oil prices, spent resources more quickly than they could have recovered, and left the nation with a massive debt load and an almost bankrupt economy when it abruptly came to an end on December 31, 1983.
On September 21, 1978, General Olushegu Obasanjo repealed the prohibition on political parties. The Constituent Assembly then delivered a draft constitution that same day that established Nigeria's presidential system of government and would usher in the Second Republic. It was modeled after the American presidential system. On September 22, 1978, three political parties were established. The Unity Party of Nigeria, UPN, the Nigerian People's Party, NPP, and the National Party of Nigeria, NPN. The NPN won 168 of the 449 House of Representatives seats when the legislature was chosen on July 14, 1979. While 111 seats in the House of Representatives were won by the UPN. On August 11, 1979, the NPN candidate Alhaji Shehu Shagari won the presidency with 34% of the vote. On October 1, 1979, he began his tenure as Nigeria's first executive president and the revised constitution became operative. Shehu Shagari's second term was brief. It lasted for just three months. The president was deposed by some senior officers of the Nigerian army on December 31, 1983. This military coup would lead to the fall of the Second Republic. The Second Republic of Nigeria's demise was caused by a variety of circumstances. These are a few of them. The mismanagement of public funds came first. More than anything else, the mishandling of funds by Shagari's administration led to a period of economic hardship. Although there was a global economic downturn, poor management made it worse in Nigeria. In fact, Many ministers and political advisers were appointed by the federal and state governments. In addition to a large number of permanent secretaries, commissioners were also appointed in each state. In addition to this, each state had a House of Assembly that contained at least 60 lawmakers. The appointment of board and government parastatal chairs became the norm. They were chosen based less on qualifications and more on political considerations. This substantial contribution severely harmed the country's already perilous financial situation. Senators and House members in the Senate and House of Representatives had unique pay scales that made it impossible to compare them to those of other countries. Hence, their numbers in the body could not be counted. It is a common belief nowadays that Nigerian lawmakers receive the highest salaries worldwide. Legislatures spent their time deciding on their pay scales, fringe benefits, and unnecessary foreign travel rather than focusing on their official duties. They did not consider the state of the economy or the welfare of the constituents they were supposed to be representing. The politicians decided to borrow to save Nigeria from the financial crisis they had put the country in, which resulted in a significant national debt. In addition to these allegations of embezzlement, this was a time when the political class allegedly violated the constitution willfully and disrespectfully. They did this on purpose to advance their political goals. People looked to the legislative arm of the government, which was given the authority to check and balance the executive branch of government to ensure that good governance was present. Due to their participation as active collaborators, the legislators were powerless to stop the executive's sway. They were distracted by other matters that did not advance the interests of the constituents they were tasked with serving. Also, the president was not given the authority to deport a fellow citizen under any provision of the constitution. However, the then president deported Shugaba, the speaker of the dissolved Brno State House of Assembly, in violation of the constitution. This was the maximum extent to which people could abuse the opportunity that was provided to them. Shugaba was only able to return to the country through legal action after the embattled speaker successfully contested the president's action in court. In addition to corruption and the abuse of authority, there was increased indiscipline in the public sector. 
inflation of government contracts in exchange for kickbacks, falsification of accounts in the public sector, malpractice in examinations in educational institutions including universities, receiving and giving of bribes, and the perversion of justice among law enforcement, the judiciary and other institutions responsible for the administration of justice. To make matters worse, the elections in September 1983 were anything but free and fair. Rigging and falsification of results were the order of the day. Thus, the signs that the Shagari administration would not last up to 1987 were gloomy. Although a majority of the senior officers in the army did not support the transfer of power to the civilians in 1979, the failure of these civilians and the grave economic and political situations Nigeria found itself in gave them the perfect opportunity to strike. On December 31, 1983, the army overthrew the civilian government of Shagari and effectively ended the Second Republic. On January 1, 1984, Major General Muhammad Buhari made his maiden broadcast as Nigeria's new head of state. He would be the fifth military man to assume power. If the Shagari administration was a frying pan, the Buhari regime was fire. On December 31, 1983, the army struck again. This time, the justification for military intervention was the blatant corruption, economic mismanagement and the alleged incompetency of the Shehu Shagari-led civilian government. After the fall of the Second Republic, the succeeded Muhammad Buhari-led military regime subsequently declared war on indiscipline and Nigerians would suffer for another 10 years of draconian and repressive rule emboldened with decrees until the June 12 annulment and the short, ineffective interim national government of Chief Ernest Shunekon in August 1993. The Buhari Diagbo regime is how many analysts refer to this government because of the enormous power that Buhari's deputy, Major General Tunde Idiagbon, the Chief of Staff at Supreme Headquarters, was thought to possess. The regime described itself as an offshoot of the previous military government of Generals Mortala Mohammed and Olusegwo Basanjo. The Supreme Military Council, comprised of Major General Muhammad Buhari and other 19 members, came into power on January 3, 1984. Buhari then placed some senior political figures of the Second Republic in detention and held them accountable for the previous civilian administration's economic excesses. A number of organizations were restricted, including the Nigerian Medical Association, which was proscribed, and the National Association of Nigerian Students. Buhari also issued two decrees that limited press freedom and stifled opposition to the administration. Decree number four prohibited any journalist from publishing anything that could be embarrassing to a government official. Under the decree, two journalists, Tunde Thompson and Nduka Irabo, were found guilty. Decree number two provided the chief of staff, Supreme Headquarters, the authority to hold anyone deemed a security danger for up to six months without charge or trial. Special military tribunals superseded the courts, while the National Security Organization, the State Security Organization, was given more authority. The Buhari Idiagwa regime also initiated efforts to address indiscipline issues related to public decency, environmental sanitation, corruption, smuggling, and disrespect for flags and national anthems, among other issues. 
The regime proclaimed a war against indiscipline and outlined appropriate ways to conduct oneself in public, such as the obligation to form lines at bus stops. However, the state of the country's economy worsened. A comprehensive set of austerity measures was unveiled by the government. It imposed harsh import limits and high fines for currency and smuggling offences and temporarily blocked the nation's land borders in order to locate and deport illegal alien workers. Many local businesses had to shut down or operate at significantly reduced capacity as a result of the austerity measures making it difficult for them to obtain necessary imported raw materials. To improve its cost effectiveness, the government itself retrenched a large number of employees. High inflation accompanied each of these moves. Even for the wealthy, living became more and more difficult as the cost of staple foods increased. Even though Buhari and his allies handled a complex national situation which enhanced efficiency, the regime's rigidity led to unrest. The latter was a primary explanation offered for General Babagida's ouster of Buhari in a palace school on August 27, 1985. However, personal ambition was a significant contributing element. Also known as the evil genius or Maradona, Ibrahim Babangida was Nigeria's sixth and most prominent Nigerian military head of state. He ruled Nigeria for eight straight years. Babangida had a different leadership style from Buhari and was a bit more political. Buhari was firm and determined, but Babangida was clever and strategic. Since the 1966 July counter coup, Babangida had participated in every coup in Nigeria and was unpredictable. He was a proponent of human rights when he first came to office, but with time, his record in this regard declined. The majority of the politicians Buhari had imprisoned were gradually released by him. Nevertheless, he frequently persecuted opposition interest organizations, particularly those of labor and student unions, and imprisoned numerous radical and anti-establishment people for a variety of violations. As of 1990, the terrible decree number no. two was still in effect, enabling these oppressive behaviors. The Babangida dictatorship proclaimed a national economic emergency a year after seizing control. According to the head of state, the country had two choices either accept the terms of an international monetary fund loan or implement more stringent economic policies that would necessitate significant sacrifices. Although the populace preferred a non-IMF option, they soon saw that the hardships ultimately imposed did not differ significantly from the IMF's requirements. The World Bank's suggested economic recovery program was implemented as a self-imposed structural adjustment program, entailing a significant reorganization of the nation's economy. Under SAP, food prices drastically rose, unemployment rates skyrocketed, and numerous user fees for health and education services were implemented. These difficulties did not stop the administration from implementing the HASH program, which it saw as the only solution to the nation's social and economic issues. Although SAP's advantages such as lower inflation and a more balanced budget started to be felt, it was less strictly followed in the late 1980s. The Babangida regime carried out additional market-oriented economic and democratic political improvements. Significant changes were made to military federalism core concepts. Babangida also adopted the title of president, possibly to emphasize the administrative authority that he wielded. The Supreme Military Council was replaced with the Armed Forces Ruling Council, AFRC, as the principal legislative body. 
a new Armed Forces Consultative Assembly acting as a transitional legislative body between the AFRC and the rest of the Armed Forces was founded in 1989. Babangida skillfully increased the authority of his position despite these intricate institutional changes. The state governors and ministers were routinely replaced by him. Even allegedly powerful administration officials were strictly controlled, as indicated by the resignation of his second-in-command, Commodore Ebitsu Ukiwe, in October 1986. Babangida replaced him with Rear Admiral Augustus Aikiomo, the previous chief of the naval staff. The most major of these changes happened at the end of 1989, when Babangida moved key officials, notably General Domkat Bali, the influential defense minister and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Southerners and Christians saw the development as culminating in an AFRC dominated by Northern Muslims. The army, navy and police leaders were all Northern Muslims, with the exception of the chief of the air staff, who was a Southerner. These Northern Muslims held the most powerful cabinet positions, including the Ministries of External Affairs, Petroleum Resources, Internal Affairs and Defence. These measures sparked fierce debate and anti-government protest among Christians in some Northern cities. However, Babangida emerged from the changes stronger than ever. Babangida also made significant changes to the civil service, police, armed and security forces, and the political system. His government's policies increased religious tensions. Beginning in 1977, when Muslims began seeking the expansion of Sharia law, which is the Muslim religious law from state courts in the north to federal courts, the country's religious divide had become increasingly politicized. Islamization of the nation was desired by militant Islamic organizations in the north during the Second Republic. Babangida enacted several initiatives after assuming office in 1985 that were perceived as favoring Muslims and jeopardizing the secular nature of the Nigerian state. It was highly divisive when Nigeria decided to join the Organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC, a global organization of Islamic states in which Nigeria had long served as an observer. Contrary to appearances, Babangida survived numerous crises involving religion by insisting that the federation was secular. He once created a religious advisory group to serve as a mediator in disputes between different religions. A coup attempt on April 22, 1990, led by Colonel Tony Nyam, Major Saliba Mukoro and Gideon Oka, came dangerously close to toppling the Babangida regime. The insurgent soldiers severely damaged the presidential house at Dodan Barracks, but the head of state managed to flee. The degree of civilian engagement in this coup attempt, which was purportedly funded in part by Nigerian citizens, was a distinctive aspect of it. When the rebels took charge of the Lagos radio station, they aired a critique of the government that included criticisms of its totalitarian nature and widespread corruption, as well as threats to expel the far northern states from the federation. Babangida and all other key members of the dictatorship survived, which allowed the government to continue its policies, including the anticipated switch to a civilian administration in 1992. However, the incarceration of many journalists and other opponents of the military government, as well as the temporary shutdown of some newspapers, showed that the government realized it had overstayed its welcome and would need to impose even harsher controls than previously. The National Republican Convention and the Social Democratic Party state congresses, the only two legally recognized political organizations, were convened in the summer of 1990 at which point the campaigning got underway. <music> 11th 
elections began and the Social Democratic Party gained 314 out of 593 seats in the House of Representatives in the legislative elections that were held on July 4, 1992. In the House of Representatives, the National Republican Convention gained 275 members. On January 4, 1993, the military government was replaced by the Transitional Council, a civilian administration led by Ernest Adegunle Shunekan. On June 12, 1993, Mashoud Abiola of the Social Democratic Party won the presidency with 58% of the vote. Eleven people lost their lives in rioting in Lagos on July 5, 1993, as a result of Babangida annulling the results of the presidential election on June 23, 1993. On July 13, 1993, the European Community initiated military sanctions, an arms embargo against the administration. On August 26, 1993, Babangida stepped aside for the Ernest Adegunle Shonekon led interim national government to establish a transitional civilian administration. The civilian administration, which was to hold new elections in February 1994, did not last for long. On November 17, 1993, General Seni Abacha overthrew the civilian government and called for the dissolution of parliament. This short civilian rule is referred to as the Third Republic of Nigeria and was a failed attempt to re-establish democracy in the country. When General Babangida gave the order to halt further disclosures, the 1993 election results from 21 of the country's states had already been tallied and announced, and one state's results were still pending. He claimed that the country's business survival and best interest were at stake in the annulment of the election. Many believe that the annulment was a consequence of General Babangida's covert plan to extend the military's hold on power. Many academics also think that the decision to declare the election invalid lacked any justification. General Babangida made the decision to stand down amid this upheaval and quickly formed an interim national administration led by Chief N.S. Shoneka, a Yoruba man, in order to placate the Yoruba people. The temporary administration was without a doubt doomed to failure. It was also beyond a shadow of doubt that Babangida himself was dishonest in creating it and was aware that it was only a temporary arrangement intended to help General Abacha realize his dream of becoming the head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. When General Babangida decided to stand aside and leave General Seni Abacha in charge, he retired all the other senior army officers. In addition, the decree creating the interim administration stipulated that the most senior official in the government, in this case Abacha, will assume control in the event of the resignation or death of the interim national government's leader. These appear to be all part of a premeditated scheme. In fact, the Third Republic came to an end as soon as General Seni Abacha assumed control when Chief Ernest Shoneka resigned after just 82 days in office. General Sani Abacha, the erstwhile Secretary of Defense, became Nigeria's seventh military head of state after a successful palace coup against the Ernest Shoneko led interim national government. As the first Nigerian army officer to obtain the rank of a full military general without skipping a single rank, Abacha had been an active participant in Nigeria's previous coups and was not an amateur in the game. As a matter of fact, Sani Abacha announced the coup that brought General Muhammad Dubuhari to power on December 31, 1983. He also announced the coup that deposed Buhari on August 27, 1985. Apart from the massive looting of Nigeria's resources, the Abacha regime was marred with human rights violations and critics of the head of state were either imprisoned or sentenced to death. 
Notable among them were the Ogoni 9 activists who were executed on November 10, 1995, including the renowned playwright and environmentalist Ken Sarawiwa, who had found the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, Mosop, in 1993 to demand the rights of his people in having a larger share of oil revenue. They were hanged after facing a military tribunal and found guilty of the alleged murder of four Ogoni chiefs who had turned up dead. Abacha also imprisoned or eliminated progressives who had formed an association known as a National Democratic Coalition, NADECO, to insist on the restoration of MKO Abiola's mandate as a civilian president of Nigeria after the former had reportedly won the election on June 12, 1993 but was annulled by the then head of state, General Ibrahim Babangida. One such person was Abiola's wife, Kudirat Abiola. She was assassinated on June 4, 1996. Another notable event that defined Abacha's regime was a trial and death sentence of alleged coup plotters, including his second-in-command, the chief of general staff, Lieutenant General Oladipo, Dia. Other alleged coup plotters who were sentenced to life imprisonment were former head of state Olusegun Obasanjo and his former deputy Shehu Musa Yaradua, who unfortunately died in prison in 1997. While planning to transition to a civilian government with himself at the helm, General Sani Abacha, according to government reports, suffered a heart attack and died on June 8, 1998. He was 54. Abacha's death marked an end to his reign of fear, terror, and dictatorship, and Nigeria's transition to democracy on May 29, 1999. Sani Abacha was born in Kano, northern Nigeria, on Monday, September 20, 1943, to parents of Kanuri descent in Borno. He schooled in Kano and joined the Nigerian army after high school. Although he kick-started his professional military career at the Nigerian Military Training College in Kaduna, Abacha went on to receive further training abroad. Sani Abacha came into the Nigerian limelight when he announced the end of President Shehu Shagari's civilian government after a coup which led to the fall of the Second Republic and brought Major General Muhammadu Buhari into power. During General Buhari's regime as head of state, Abacha was assigned as a general commanding officer of the 2nd Mechanized Division, Ibadan, and was also a member of the Supreme Military Council. A year later, Abacha would also announce the overthrow of General Buhari's government and General Ibrahim Babangida became the new head of state. The new regime moved Abacha up the military hierarchy, retained his membership in the SMC and named him the new chief of army staff. In 1992, Abacha became a full general and was the minister of defense and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Finally, on November 18, 1993, Abacha made his maiden broadcast to the nation as a new head of state after he had successfully supplanted the interim national government of Chief Ernest Shonekon the day before. After the annulment of what was presumed to be the freest and fairest election Nigeria ever had by General Babangida, an interim national government was formed with Chief Ernest Shoneko appointed as the head. However, this did not stop the country from moving from one crisis to another, even though Shoneko tried to win public support by releasing political prisoners, pardoning political offenders, removing restrictions on the press, and dismantling the bureaucracy of the oil industry. His promise that a new presidential election would be held on February 19, 1994, also did nothing to assuage the anger and demands of the Nigerian people, who kept on insisting that the winner of the election, Moshud Abiola, be allowed to rule. Although Shoneko's government was working towards the democratization of the country, 
He was overthrown in a palace coup led by General Sani Abacha less than three months after he assumed office. At the time, General Sani Abacha was the country's Minister of Defense and he capitalized on the unrest of the polity to seize power. As a specialist in military coups in Nigeria, Abacha was able to douse tensions in the country with his takeover. Not a few political elites welcomed the change, thinking it was a right step in the right direction in their dream of returning the country to civilian rule as Abacha promised to do so by October of the next year. However, Abacha's first show of power was to dissolve the ING and declare himself head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Meanwhile, MKO Abiola had traveled outside the country to garner international support in order to reclaim his mandate and even took Abacha's seat at the inauguration of South Africa's president, Nelson Mandela, in 1994. Upon his return to the country, Abiola declared himself president on the eve of the anniversary of the annulled elections, June 11, 1994, at Ekpetsedo in Lagos State. His speech was dubbed the Ekpetsedo Declaration. On June 23, 1994, Abacha promptly had Abiola arrested and charged him with treason. He will die in detention on July 7, 1998 exactly 30 days after Abacha himself had died. Slowly and surely, General Abacha's regime became unpopular with the people owing to his intolerance of dissent and opposition. He ruled the nation with an iron fist. Bowing to pressure to implement political reforms, his government announced plans for a constitutional conference and on August 27, 1994, Abacha inaugurated the National Constitutional Conference made up of elected and government-appointed delegates. He charged them to create a workable constitution for Nigeria. Their proposal of the creation of six geopolitical zones and 13% derivation for all producing states, amongst others, was submitted to the head of state a year later. Abacha did this against the backdrop of the clamor for a sovereign national conference. The NCC was mildly successful because it was perceived as an exercise having the aim of transmuting General Abacha from a military ruler to a civilian one. In October 1995, Abacha oddly confirmed the suspicions by announcing a three-year transition program to a civil rule which was under his firm control. The transition program embodied the making of a new constitution, establishment of a new electoral body, lifting of the pre-existing ban on political parties, creation of more state and local government areas, and conducting local, state, and federal elections. In line with this, Abacha established the National Electoral Commission of Nigeria, NECON, empowering it to create electoral laws and conduct elections that would usher the nation into the Fourth Republic. Only five political parties were registered by NECON to participate in the transition program out of the 15 parties that signified interest. The parties were Congress for National Consensus, CNC, the Democratic Party of Nigeria, DPN, the Grassroots Democratic Party, GDP, the National Center Party of Nigeria, NCPN, and the United Nigeria Congress Party, UNCP. The regime got the five parties to nominate Abacha as a sole presidential candidate. This led the late Bola Ige to describe the parties as the five fingers of a leprous hand. General Abacha further established a constitutional conference commission charging it with the responsibility of creating a new constitution for the upcoming republic. The CCC went ahead to organize a constitutional conference election committee and at the end of its deliberations, a draft of 1995 constitution was presented to the government. Thereafter, Abacha proceeded to the next phase in the transition program by announcing the creation of six new states in 1996. Thus, by Yelsa, Ebonyi, Ekiti, Gombe, Nasarawa, and Zamfara states were birthed, 
bringing the total number of states in Nigeria to 36 as it remains to this day. The head of state equally carved out 138 new local government areas. While Abacha and his supporters were working towards his self-succession bid, the opposition, both within and without the country, was planning to put an end to his dream. The opposition organized campaigns abroad for economic sanctions against and for diplomatic isolation of Nigeria. One noteworthy opposition was the National Liberation Council of Nigeria, NALICON, set up by renowned writer and Nobel laureate Wale Shoinka, also, in June 1995, a guerrilla radio station was established by Lemi Olalemi. It was called Radio Freedom. The station mobilized people against Abacha's regime, exposed government secrets, and challenged his authority. The radio station was operated secretly in an unknown location and broadcast between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. daily. Soldiers were deployed to fish out operators of the radio station, and many people were wrongfully detained but they were unable to locate the station. In August 1996, the radio station was later renamed Radio Kudirat in honor of Mashud Abiola's wife, Kudirat Abiola, who had been assassinated by the regime. The station went off air on January 1, 1999. In 1994, a joint strike by the National Union of Petroleum and Gas Workers, NUPENG, and the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Pegasen, in protest to compel the military to revalidate the annual June 12 presidential election, led to the crippling of the economy. However, the unions were disbanded and their general secretaries were thrown in prison without trial for the duration of Abacha's reign. The executives of the oil unions, alongside those of the Nigerian Labour Congress, were also dissolved and sole administrators were appointed to supervise them. Later on, in 1996, the Academic Staff Union of Universities also embarked on strike action, demanding improved conditions of service and increased funding for universities, but were ignored by the government, leading to a protracted closure of the higher institutions. Unfulfilled promises to increase the wages of workers marked the Abacha regime and multiple taxations weighed the people down. It was clear to all that the government was not interested in getting the cooperation and participation of public sector workers. Every level of society felt the brunt of Abacha's oppression and repression. Political assassinations were the norm. Victims included Kudirat Abiola and Chief Alfred Rewane, a major financer of Nadeko. Luckily, Chief Abraham Adesonya, chairman of the pan Yoruba Social Cultural Group, Afeni Ferry, escaped assassination. Likewise, the publisher of The Guardian, Alex Ibru. Those who were thrown into prison include Chief Bolaege, a former civilian governor of Old Oyo State, Olaoni, a retired university teacher, Alhaji Lam Adesina, and a host of others too numerous to mention. Others like Professor Wale Shoinka, Chief Anthony Enahoro, General Alani Akinriade, a former army chief, and Chief Colinius Adebayo, a former executive governor of Kwara State, went into self-exile. Bombs were set off in several cities such as Lagos, Ibadan, Kaduna, Kano, Port Harcourt, Ilori, and Zaria to fuel insecurity, and Nadeko was blamed for these events. The press was not left out, as Abacha had them censored. Several journalists were thrown into prison and tortured for years without trial. Nigeria became unsafe for business and was ranked high among countries known for violating human rights. Corruption has always been the bane of the Nigerian society, with different regimes having to battle with embezzlement and looting. However, the Abacha regime remains the most prominent. 
Illegal dealings boomed during General Sani Abacha's rule as head of state. Public funds were stolen directly, projects were awarded under murky circumstances, government institutions had multiple financial misappropriations, and government lands were acquired at ridiculous prices. It has been reported that illicit dealings and corruption thrived on a large scale under Abacha, and this caused a serious strain on the country's economy. Oil facilities and oil workers were attacked by the oil communities, and oil pipelines were vandalized, leading to a fall crisis across the nation, which in turn opened the door to hoarding, black markets, clandestine selling, and profiteering. A ripple effect occurred because the increase in oil prices led to a rise in transport fares and businesses were affected negatively. The government established a military task force on fuel distribution in each state of the Federation, but the task force personnel were brutal. They invaded petrol stations, assaulted civilians at will, and participated in large-scale diversion of petroleum products. Abacha himself has been described as a major looter of Nigeria's treasury. He reportedly amassed wealth for himself and his allies while the Nigerians suffered economic hardship and a precarious political atmosphere. Even more than two decades after Abacha's death, Nigeria is yet to fully recover all the money his regime allegedly stashed in foreign accounts. Although the total amount looted cannot be accurately calculated, Transparency International once put the figure at about $5 billion. The monies were reportedly stashed in four countries, namely the United States, Jersey Island in the United Kingdom, Liechtenstein and Switzerland. Each succeeding government since Abacha, from General Abdusalami Abubakar up to President Muhammad Buhari, except late President Umaru Musa Yaradua, has recovered some monies, but it seems inexhaustible. Unavoidably, General Sani Abacha, who has been jokingly described as the ancestor who keeps sprouting money from the grave, would always be remembered not just for his signature dark glasses or his brutal dictatorship, but for his alleged fraudulent and financial embezzlement of Nigeria's treasury. However, Abacha's death on June 8, 1998, at the age of 54, would lead to Nigeria's transition to democracy and the birth of the Fourth Republic with the swearing-in of Chief Olusegun Obasanjo on May 29, 1999. Following the assassination and death of General Murtala Mohammed on February 13, 1976, General Olusegun Obasanjo, who was his deputy, assumed office as the fourth military head of state of Nigeria. Interestingly, Obasanjo would hand over power to a democratically elected civilian administration in President Shehu Shagari on October 1, 1979. Chief Olusegun Obasanjo was the first Nigerian to have served the country as both a military head of state and an elected civilian president. Obasanjo first gained prominence for being the officer who accepted the surrender of Biafran forces after the civil war which lasted from July 6, 1967 to January 15, 1970. As a retired general, Olusegun Obasanjo strongly criticized human rights abuses committed during General Sani Abacha's regime, and the latter jailed him in 1995. However, Obasanjo was released after Abacha's death, contested elections, and in 1999 became Nigeria's first civilian president in 16 years. He was re elected for a second term in 2003. Obasanjo became Nigeria's democratically elected president, winning on the platform of the People's Democratic Party with his vice, Atiku Abubakar. He was sworn in as president on May 29, 1999. The day was named Democracy Day and was celebrated as a public holiday to signify a new beginning for the nation 
until 2019 when President Muhammadu Buhari reversed Democracy Day to June 12 of every year. Buhari did this in honor of MKO Abiola, who had allegedly won the country's presidential election on June 12, 1993. Before he assumed office as the president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria, Olusegun Basanjo had spent three years, three months, and three days in prison. Obasanjo had been loudly vocal, speaking against General Seni Abache's human rights abuses, and the former had him arrested on March 13, 1995, in his home on charges on a coup plot against the government. The former head of state was arrested alongside 29 others and sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. Fortunately for Obasanjo, General Abacha died on June 8, 1998, and he was released on June 15, 1998. Obasanjo later revealed that his prison experience was a good school which gave him leadership training and prepared him for high political office. He said it gave him the opportunity to read, pray, and think. This positioned him to be in a good state of mind when he became Nigeria's president. Working with his campaign slogan of he did it before and he will do it again, the new president of the Fourth Republic of Nigeria got to work. Olusegun Obasanjo secured $18 billion in debt relief and reduced the country's overall Paris club debt of $30 billion, paying off a balance of $12.4 billion to creditors over a six-month period. This was a fulfillment of one of his promises made during his inaugural speech when he was first sworn in as president. Obasanjo had stated that one of his priorities was to reduce the country's internal and external debts. In line with his goal, the Debt Management Office DMO was established in 2000 to maintain a reliable database of loans accrued to the nation and implement a plan to effectively manage external and domestic loan obligations to facilitate economic growth and development. Consequently, President Olusegun Obasanjo established the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFCC, Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission ICPC, the Budget Monitoring and Price Intelligence Unit, the Due Process Office and the Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative NIETI, to fight corruption. His administration equally adopted an economic reform program called the National Economic Empowerment and Development Strategy NEEDS at the federal level and State Economic Empowerment Development Strategy SEEDS at the state level with high hopes that the international community would support the nation's efforts to reduce her debt. All of these and more culminated in the country finally securing a debt deal that ushered her exit from the Paris Club as Africa's largest debtor. Although he was heavily criticized as his actions were seen as one who pursued international glory, Obasanjo was undaunted and paid no heed to naysayers. Obasanjo's administration carried out extensive socio-economic and political programs. The provisions embedded in the 1999 constitution, which was enacted on May 29, 1999, enabled his administration to ensure that inherent structural and institutional defects in Nigeria's federalism are corrected. Federal character principle, concept of zoning, and power sharing were aptly put to work. Major political positions within the federation were allotted to qualified individuals within the six geopolitical zones. This led to the formation of the National Political Reform Conference, NPRC, in 2005, and a consensus was reached on the devolution of power to federating units, resource control, and recognition of ethnic nationalities that had otherwise been overlooked. Obasanjo upgraded telecommunication in the country as a needs initiative under its economic and empowerment agenda, increased the telephone base in the nation from below 1 million in 1999 to over 38 million in 2007. Needs also reformed the banking sector by carrying out a consolidation exercise in 2005. 
89 banks were merged into 25, with each of the banks having a minimum capital base of 25 billion naira. The anti-corruption agencies EFCC and the ICPC played crucial roles during Obasanjo's administration, tackling financial corruption and prosecuting offenders, irrespective of their position. Although the EFCC was accused of being a tool of the Obasanjo's administration to which haunt his political opponents, the agency succeeded in unearthing so many financial discrepancies. Over 5 billion naira of stolen funds were returned to the nation's treasury and 80 individuals were prosecuted for corruption charges by 2006. These feats achieved by the EFCC also led the United States to remove the country from its money laundering watch list in May 2007. Despite the highs of his time in office, there are also some lows, especially in the area of religious tensions. One of them was the controversial introduction of Sharia, which is an Islamic law code by the then governor of Zamfara state, Ahmed Yerima. Other northern states followed suit and this made Christians wary of living in places where Sharia was used in governance. In fact, after Agbani Darego won Miss World Beauty Pageant in 2001, Nigeria was supposed to host the next edition in 2002. But with Sharia law in place, the venue for the event was moved from Abuja to London in order to douse religious tensions. Another low point of Obasanjo's administration was his inability to nip in the bud ethnic tensions across the country. The movement for the sovereign state of Biafra, Masop, was founded in the southeast by Ralph Nwazurike in 1999, campaigning for the reassertion of the state of Biafra. The Old Dua People's Congress, OPC, in the southwestern part of Nigeria was in constant contention with the administration, arguing that government policies were not in favor of the Yoruba people. The OPC also contended with Obasanjo for his administration's refusal to recognize the purported winner of the June 12, 1993 presidential elections, MKO Abiola, and immortalize the late businessman and philanthropist. The Niger Delta was not left out, as the fight for resource control and seeking an end to the pollution of their lands turned violent between the Ogonis and other ethnic minorities. Several militias were formed, the major one being the movement for the emancipation of Niger Delta, MEND. The men were heavily armed and terrorized the region, kidnapping foreign oil workers and destroying oil installations. Men's violent activities brought about a reduction in oil production, which in turn affected Nigeria's revenue. In response, the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, was established in June 2000, to see to the socio-economic needs of the people of the Niger Delta. Infrastructures were built and investments were encouraged in the region. The NDDC also tackled the problem of youth restiveness, which was threatening the oil-producing region as the youth were coming together to form militia groups to fight the multinational oil corporations in the region, thereby affecting the activities of oil extraction and exportation. The Joint Task Force, JTF, a special military unit, was birthed to flush out such militants from the region. One of the deepest lows of the Obasanjo administration was the Odi massacre on November 20, 1999. Odi, a densely populated town in Bielsa state, was razed down by Nigerian soldiers. The death toll was put at about 2,500 people, including the king of the town, as rounds of shells were rained on the populace and houses were bombed by fighter jets. Obasanjo was criticized for ordering the invasion, but he defended his actions by saying that four policemen on legitimate security duties were killed, and five soldiers who had been sent to investigate the killings 
were equally killed. Nearing the end of Obasanjo's second term in office, there arose wild speculations that the president was brewing a tenure elongation plot, which was to be done through amendment of the constitution. Members of Obasanjo's self-appointed political conference group were rumored to be at the helm of the plot, which, if achieved, would allow the president to rule for one more term, even after he had ruled for the constitutionally allowed two terms. Political maneuverings began in late 2005 when Obasanjo sought to alter the provisions of the 1999 constitution that placed a two-term limit on the presidency. As soon as the plan came to light, several political opposition parties, senators and House of Reps members condemned the move. Even Atiku Abubakar, his vice, strongly opposed him. The motion for the amendment of the 1999 constitution was rejected at the Senate on May 19, 2006, bringing an end to Obasanjo's dream of a third term in power. The elections of 2007 were held with Obasanjo supporting the PDP presidential candidate Umaru Musa Yaradua to victory. On May 29, 2007, Yadua was duly sworn in as the second civilian president of the Fourth Republic with Goodluck Jonathan as his vice. For 78 days between November 23, 2009 and February 9, 2010, Nigeria had an unavailable president and an available but powerless vice president. The last time the country had seen her president alive was on November 23, 2009, when President Umaru Musa Yaradua traveled to Saudi Arabia to receive treatment for a fatal heart condition known as pericarditis. For the next five months and a half, the condition of the president's health was shrouded in secrecy, and since power was not handed over to the vice president, good luck Jonathan, the country was somewhat at a standstill. This was until February 9, 2010, when after a vote by the National Assembly, Jonathan assumed the position of acting president. Unfortunately, when Yaradua did return from his trip on February 24, 2010, he was allegedly on a life support machine and died on May 5, 2010 in Asso Rock. He was 58 years old. Described as calm, humble, and incorruptible, Umaru Musa Yaradua was the first governor of a state and the first president of Nigeria to publicly declare his assets, stating that he had nothing to hide. Yaradua, who was the first graduate Nigeria had as a president, upheld the rule of law and was impartial in his decisions when implementing court judgments. An example of this was seen when he restored Peter Obi as governor of Anambra State in 2007, following a court judgment. Obi had previously been impeached by the State House of Assembly due to corruption charges. Yaradua articulated his goals for the country through his seven point agenda, which included a focus on critical infrastructure, food security, human capital development, land tenure reform national security and intelligence, the Niger Delta, and wealth creation. Although only the amnesty program for Niger Delta militants was quite successful, his efforts to actualize his vision for the country cannot be undermined. His death brought an end to a promising rule, but his legacy of transparency, electoral reforms, and the Niger Delta amnesty would never be forgotten. Umaru Musa Yaradua, the son of a former Minister of Lagos Affairs in the First Republic, Musa Yaradua was born on August 16, 1951, in Katsina, present-day Katsina State. His primary education began at Rafuka Primary School in 1958 and ended at Dotsima Boarding Primary School in 1962. 
He then attended Government College, Kefi, from 1965 to 1969, before proceeding to Barewa College, where he obtained his higher school certificate in 1971. Yaradua got his bachelor's degree in chemistry education from Amadu Bello University, Zaria, in 1975, and also a master's degree in analytical chemistry in 1978 from the same university. He started his working career at Holy Child College, Lagos, from 1975 to 1976, before serving as a lecturer at the College of Arts, Science and Technology, Zaria, between 1976 and 1979. Yaradua left the teaching profession in 1983 and became the general manager at Sabo Farms Limited in Funtua, Katsina State. Whilst there, he was a board member of the Katsina State Farmers Supply Company and was also a member of the governing council of both Katsina Polytechnic and Katsina College of Arts, Science and Technology. Umaru Musa Yaradua also served as the board chairman of the Katsina State Investment and Property Development Company between 1994 and 1996. Yaradua's political journey began during Nigeria's Second Republic when he joined the Leftist People's Redemption Party, PRP. He was also one of the foundation members of the People's Front of Nigeria, PFN, a political association which had his elder brother, the retired Major General Shehu Musa Yaradua, as the leader. The PFN was formed during the transition program to restore the country to civilian rule and birth the Third Republic instituted by General Ibrahim Babangida. It later transformed into the Social Democratic Party and Yara Dua became the party's state secretary in Katsina. He contested on the party's platform during the 1991 governorship election but lost to the National Republican Convention candidate Saidu Bada. Seven years down the line, Yaradua was part of the founding members of the K-34, a political association formed at the inception of General Abdul Salam Abu Bakr's administration in 1998, which later evolved into the People's Democratic Party, and on this new platform, he once again contested for the governorship position in Katsina State and won. Umaru Musa Yaradua resonates in history as the first governor to publicly declare his assets. He was seen as an incorruptible governor who, in line with the promise he made when campaigning, ran an effective public administration, overseeing and ensuring that various developmental projects were carried out accordingly, and he made education a priority for his people by building several schools in local areas. Yaradua was re-elected for his second term in 2003. Reflecting on Yaradua's legacies that laid the foundation for the growth of Katsina State, his former commissioner and secretary to the state government, Mustafa Inua, said his late boss was a firm believer in financial discipline and did his work diligently. He stated that when Yaradua assumed office as the governor of Katsina State, the state treasury had just 10 million naira with a debt of over 550 million naira. But against all odds, he embarked on and completed so many projects in the state. He was able to repay the state's debt and even accumulated a surplus of 50 million dollars. Yara Dua was among the very few governors in Nigeria who were not handed corruption charges by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC.
The seventh leader is here was a slogan that Yaradua's campaign group employed to woo Nigerians into believing that a leader who was ready to serve the country and her people had arrived. Indeed, the phrase aptly projected Yaradua as a Nigerian politician who was neither proud nor authoritative but had the good of the country at heart. Also, Many Nigerians thought that they deserved a break from the somewhat authoritative role that had been experienced since the country gained its independence. Even Olusegun Obasanjo's presidency was seen as a dictatorship, as he was once a soldier and ruled as a military head of state. However, Yaradua's emergence as the flag bearer for the People's Democratic Party for the 2007 presidential elections was not a smooth one as the people saw him as an imposition by Obasanjo. Despite their inhibitions, Yaradua, who was 55 years old at the time, clinched the ticket after beating 11 other contestants by getting 3,024 votes from the 4,000 delegates who voted. Obasanjo congratulated him, calling him a worthy successor, and the journey to the presidency began. The governor of Bayelsa State, Goodluck Jonathan, was picked as his running mate, and this was seen as a move to placate the Niger Delta as militants, where at the time, attacking all facilities. The 2007 presidential election was quite significant in Nigeria's history, as it would be the first time a civilian government would hand over to another civilian government. So, every antenna, so to speak, was tuned in and logged on to see the outcome of the elections and what would happen thereafter. The election was a litmus test to determine if Nigeria's democratic government would stand or collapse. President Olusegun Obasanjo was the first to hit the polity by declaring the elections as a do-or-die affair. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, also did not help the situation as there were so many irregularities. First, the voter's registration exercise was done shoddily and many people were unable to register so could not vote. Second, the electoral body did not display the voter's register as required by the electoral law, which led to numerous litigations against the commission. Finally, INEC refused to include the names of some candidates for the election. All these and more deemed the possibility of an election holding at all. Interparty clashes were not left out as candidates jostled to come out as the flag bearer of their parties, and it was a messy affair all around. Irrespective of all the happenings, the governorship and presidential elections were duly slated for April 14 and 21 respectively. During the governorship elections, there was a heavy security presence in some polling stations, but this did not prevent electoral violence. Ballot boxes were snatched, electoral materials arrived late, voters were intimidated, election results were rigged, and some people were not even allowed to vote. Human Rights Watch described the elections as marred due to late commencement and voting, non-availability of voting materials, massive disenfranchisement of potential voters and intimidation, rigging and violence. INEC had to rerun elections in some places that were affected by such irregularities. Due to the imperfections of the governorship elections, 18 leaders of political parties, including Atiku Abubakar and Muhammad Buhari, clamored for the cancellation of the governorship elections, postponement of the presidential elections, and disbandment of INEC as an electoral body. All their efforts were in vain as the elections still held amidst tensions in the country. The same scenario played out during the presidential elections, and there was a low turnout of voters. The election result was announced on April 23rd, and the PDP won, with Umaru Musa Yaradua polling about 70% of all the votes. Understandably, this victory was not acceptable to the leaders of opposition parties and their platform. The Conference of Nigerian Political Parties, CNPP, 
rejected the result and called for an interim national government of unity to be constituted, otherwise they would cause civil unrest on the handover date. Amidst all the threats and fears, Obasanjo successfully handed over to the new president, Umaro Musa Yaradua, on May 29, 2007. President Umaru Musa Yaradua acknowledged that the election that brought him into power was majorly flawed and promised to work on electoral reforms. The president went ahead to inaugurate the Justice Ways panel on electoral reform made up by the best minds to come up with legal and administrative changes in the electoral space. President Yaradua also proposed a government of national unity in a bid to pacify the opposition and by late July of the same year, two opposition parties, the Progressive People's Alliance and the All Nigeria People's Party agreed to join his government. Two members of the ANPP were later chosen to be part of Yaradua's cabinet. As soon as he became president, Yaradua got to work. He started by declaring his assets publicly on June 28, 2007, making him the first president to do so. Although the declaration of assets is mandatory for all public officers, it doesn't need to be declared openly, but Yaradua set the trend for the public declaration of assets, stating that he had nothing to hide. The vice president, Goodluck Jonathan, also declared his assets, but later claimed that he was forced to do so by Yaradua. He argued that declaring his assets would not reduce corruption or stop terrorism in the country. Yaradua stated that he declared his assets publicly to set an example for other politicians to shun corruption. In August 2007, Yaradua's administration launched the seven-point agenda. The agenda encompassed 1. Critical infrastructure Declaring a state of emergency in the power sector facilitating industrialization and movement through the improvement and development of railways, road and air transportation. 2. The Niger Delta, rolling out amnesty programs to empower the people of the region. 3. Food security, enhancing agricultural and water resources to ensure adequate food supply for local consumption and export. 4. Human capacity development, reforming the educational sector. 5. Land tenure reforms and home ownership. Reviving land use laws and providing affordable housing. 6. National security and intelligence. Protection of lives and properties. And 7. Wealth creation. Diversification of the country's revenue base. Yaradua's administration had the hope that with the seven-point agenda, almost all of the country's developmental problems would be solved and Nigeria would become one of the 20 best developed economies in the world by the year 2020. In line with his promise during his inauguration, Yaradua formed a presidential electoral reform to look into legal factors and security issues that affect the quality and credibility of elections in the nation and suggest recommendations on the way forward. In June 2007, President Yaradua carried out a downward reverse of a hike in fall prices from 70 naira to 65 naira. This was an action that was widely applauded by Nigerians. He also reversed the sale of Nigeria's refineries to private investors, calling the sale a rip-off. Yaradua's legacies include initiating the Niger Delta Amnesty Program to empower the Niger Delta youths. Most of them had become militants and were blowing up all facilities in the Niger Delta region in protest of the backwardness and non-development of their region by the oil companies. So, instead of clamping down on the restive youths and using force, Yaradua chose to rehabilitate them. He believed that the continued deployment of soldiers and use of force would be ineffective in meeting the needs of the aggrieved youths. 
The NDAP commenced on August 6, 2009 and was a comprehensive system of dialogue, rehabilitation and development. The militants were encouraged to surrender their weapons, were reintegrated into society and were provided with appropriate social skills. This had a positive impact as the region once again enjoyed peace and oil production resumed fully. Another legacy was the inauguration of the Presidential Committee on National Minimum Wage, which was headed by the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Salihu Belgo, to recommend a minimum wage of 18000 for civil servants. The Senate later approved the new wage on February 22, 2011, after it had been approved by his successor, President Goodluck Jonathan. He also recommended the dredging of the River Niger but could not follow through with the project. Likewise, the Abuja Kaduna Rail Route was Yaradua's brainchild, but he did not live long enough to see its completion, which was commissioned by President Muhammad Buhari in July 2016. Also worthy of note was the release of federal allocations to Lagos State, which had been previously withheld by his predecessor, President Olusegun Obasanjo. Obasanjo had withheld the funds for four years because the then governor of Lagos State, Bola Tinobu, had created 37 local council development authority against his approval. While still campaigning for presidency, Yaradua's failing health was visible to all as he struggled to speak and looked weak. But former President Olusegun Obasanjo said Yaradua was medically fit to lead the nation. Yaradua's health was a source of attack from opposition parties who said he was too frail to govern Nigeria. Despite all odds, he emerged victorious, but his health failed him and he died after just about three years in office. In his book, my watch, Obasanjo accused Yaradua of deceiving Nigerians by keeping details of his illness secret and leaving the nation hanging. The Yaradua presidency remains a yardstick for other administrations in terms of transparency and upholding the rule of law. The late president was known for always putting the national interest of Nigerians above partisan consideration and promoting the notion that the law of the country was supreme and no one was above it. Although his administration had some flaws, like the hounding of Nuhu Ribadu, who was a chairman of the EFCC and the appointment of Farida Waziri as his replacement, which was frowned upon both at home and abroad. Also, the secrecy surrounding his illness, especially his last days at Aso Rock, and the refusal by some faceless members of a cabal at the Aso Villa to swear in Gulag Jonathan as acting president while his principal was receiving treatment in Saudi Arabia, remain a dent on the Yaradua's presidency. This confusion would last for more than 70 days until the National Assembly stepped in and confirmed Jonathan as acting president, on February 9, 2010. Good luck, Jonathan, as the Vice President of Nigeria, was supposed to act as President and discharge the duties of the office as Acting President whenever his boss, President Umaru Musa Yaradua, was not around in reference to Section 145 of the 1999 Nigerian Constitution. Unfortunately, the president, who had been battling with diverse life-threatening diseases, failed to transmit a letter to the National Assembly under the aforequoted section of the Constitution, which states that Whenever the president transmits the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives a written declaration that he is proceeding on a vacation or that he is otherwise unable to discharge the functions of his office, until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such functions shall be discharged by the vice president as acting president. Jonathan's lawyers and advisers argued that until the president transmits a letter, he had no power to act as president. Thus, according to them, 
Any actions he carried out as vice president that were required by the president, such as the signing of the budget and swearing in of the chief justice of the federation, would amount to usurpation of power, which is impeachable under section 143, subsection 11 of the constitution. To be fair to President Yaradua, he did write a letter to be transmitted to the National Assembly through the Attorney General of the Federation, Michael Aunduaka. Unfortunately, the latter, who was part of a kitchen cabinet or a faceless cabal, failed to transmit the letter to the National Assembly. They felt the power of the President is too immense to relinquish just like that. Besides, to hand over power to a minority, in this case Good Luck Jonathan, was a risk too high for them to take. Earlier in the tenure, Jonathan had been sidelined from the scheme of things as vice president, but the president's advisers kept stressing one presidency. However, Yaradua's sickness served as a distraction to him, and the cabal had their way. On Monday, November 23, 2009, President Umaru Musa Yaradua was flown out of the country to a hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, to receive treatment for pericarditis, an inflammation of the pericardium, the fibrous sac surrounding the heart. That was the last time the president was seen in public. He had left a power vacuum that nearly destroyed the country. The nation was at a standstill. The minister did not know who to report to or to answer to. Leadership was rudderless. The Nigerian Bar Association argued that the president should have transmitted a letter while some prominent Nigerians called on the cabinet members and the National Assembly to declare the president incapacitated and subsequently impeach him. Protests against the Yaradua presidency sprung up in the major cities of Lagos and Abuja, but the Save Nigeria group SNG, led by Pastor Tunde Bakari, Professor Wole Shoinka, and Dr. Joe Odumaking. They demanded the elevation of Vice President Goodluck Jonathan as acting president, pending the time the president would resume and discharge duties of his office. On December 25, 2009, Christmas Day, the failed terrorist attack of an American bound aeroplane by a Nigerian. Umar Farouk Abdulmutalab, the underwear bomber, further exposed the absence of the president. The United States of America did not hesitate to put Nigeria on its list of terrorist nations and travel restrictions were imposed on Nigerian travelers. Back home, the heat was getting more intense. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Idris Lebo Kutigi, was to retire as he was approaching the compulsory retirement age of 70 years. After the National Judicial Council had nominated Katsina Alu as the next Chief Justice of Nigeria and was to be sworn in on December 30th, unfortunately, the President was not around. He was in Saudi hospital and the vice president, Goodluck Jonathan, did not have the powers required to swear in a chief justice. When Aounduaka and other aides of President Yaradua approached Jonathan to swear in the chief justice of Nigeria designate, the vice president declined and did not give in to their pleas. However, they reached a compromise in Section 10, Subsection 2 of the Oath Act and argued that either the President of the Chief Justice could swear in the incoming Chief Justice. In the end, it was agreed that Justice Kutigi should swear in his successor, the first and only time in the nation's history. A relief to Yaradua's loyalists. Therefore, on Wednesday, December 30th, 2009, a day before he was due to retire, Justice Kutigi swore in his successor, Katsina Alu, as a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. It was a misnomer and there were some controversies over the ceremony because there has never been a ceremony like that, before it or after it till this day, in which the oath of office for the Chief Justice of Nigeria was not administered by the President or Head of State, or someone vested with the powers of the president. 
This was one of the ripple effects of the power vacuum left by the ailing president, Umaru Musa Yaradua. By implication, it meant that Nigeria had two chief justices the same day, December 30, 2009, as Kutigi himself declared during the inauguration, which witnessed the absence of seven out of 15 justices of the Supreme Court, that he was still in charge until midnight when he would clock the statutory age of 70. Nevertheless, the Minister for Information, Professor Dora Akunili, felt cabinet members should invoke Section 144 of the Constitution. However, many of them, especially the Minister for Education, Dr. Sam Egu, disagreed. They felt it would be unfair on the President to remove him from office. Besides, Section 144 was too hasty a decision at the moment. On the other hand, Section 144 of the Constitution wouldn't have removed President Yaradra from office per se. It would only have declared him incapacitated. But none of the ministers wanted to take the risk of being disloyal to his or her boss, except Professor Akunyili, who stood her ground that the vice president should take charge, pending the president's return on the basis that the nation was at a standstill. In light of the recent events, on Friday, January 22, 2010, the Supreme Court of Nigeria ruled that the Federal Executive Council, which was made up of the ministers appointed by the president, had 14 days to decide a resolution whether Yaradua was incapable of discharging his duties as president after an opposition activist, Farouk Adamu Aliyu, represented by his lawyer, Bamideli Aturu, brought a lawsuit before it which asked the judges to sack the president over his failing health and for failing to abide by the provisions of the constitution. Senate President David Mark was at an impasse with his colleagues and members of the then ruling party, the People's Democratic Party, about the matter. Many of the president's loyalists had thwarted any move the Senate might want to make in removing or dissipating the powers of the president. The president had not been heard from for weeks, and many rumors were rife that he had been dead since December 2009 in a Saudi hospital and that the nation was being run by a faceless cabal. With the fears that the power vacuum would lead to anarchy and a possible military takeover, Mark then had a meeting with the senators who had an educational background in law and they reached a compromise by adopting the doctrine of necessity. Therefore, on Tuesday, February 9, 2010, the red chambers of the Senate and the green chambers of the House of Representatives, like the hands of a clock at 12, joined hands and passed a resolution which empowered the Vice President Goodluck Jonathan as the acting president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. This act by the National Assembly members did not go down well with loyalists of the president and they protested their disdain on pages of newspapers and other media citing abuse of the constitution. They were right. There is no provision for such action in the Nigerian constitution which empowered the National Assembly to pass such a resolution. Nevertheless, Jonathan's lawyers had anticipated this. The acting president got wind that the embattled attorney general of the federation had been working behind the scenes to challenge the ruling in court, which, Ceteris Paribus, he was bound to win because the constitution does not provide for an acting president through a transfer of power to the vice president by the National Assembly. However, at the Federal Executive Council meeting the next day after the acting president had shocked everyone present by rejecting his seat and choosing to sit on the president's seat, Jonathan announced a minor cabinet reshuffle. 
He redeployed Aon Duaka from the Ministry of Justice to the Ministry of Special Duties and transferred the Minister for Labor, Prince Adeto Kumbo Kayode, as the new Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice. Everyone got the message. Jonathan was now fully in charge. The Yaradua presidency was coming to an end. Many of the ministers who were hitherto Yaradua's loyalists started gravitating towards Jonathan. But the president's handlers would not give in without a fight, and Saudi Arabia got the message. Around 3 a.m. on Wednesday, February 24, 2010, less than 15 days after Jonathan assumed the presidency in acting capacities, President Umaru Musa Yaradua made a surprise return to the country via the Nnamdi Azikwe International Airport, Abuja, to the president's villa. This was seen as a calculated move by his handlers to upset the growing influence and stability of a clear, fledgling Jonathan administration. As acting president, Jonathan bore the insignia of the office of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and also added the Commander-in-Chief, C in C title, to his name. In fact, the national anthem preceded any address he had to make as acting president. Would that change now that President Yaradua was back? In a reaction, President Yaradua's aide, the Special Advisor on Media and Publicity, Olushegwa Deni, made matters worse when he addressed the acting president as Vice President Goodluck Jonathan. In a counter move the same day, Jonathan's spokesperson, Imani Boro, issued a statement and addressed Jonathan as acting president. There was now a power play in the villa as the secrecy surrounding the return of the ailing president threw up questions as to who was really in charge. Jonathan's advisers warned that he could be shot by the Presidential Guard Brigade, whose responsibility is to protect the president if he carried on using the president's insignia since he was now around. However, the Minister for Information argued that Jonathan was still the acting president as he was mandated by the National Assembly and that the only way he would revert to the title of vice president was if the National Assembly revoked their endorsement of Jonathan. Not many activities took place for the next few months other than Jonathan, who tried his best to see his ailing boss, but was denied by the First Lady, Mrs. Turai Yaradua. In late April 2010, Christian clerics in the country who visited and prayed for President Yaradua reported to Jonathan that it would be a miracle for the president to resume and discharge the functions of his office. One week later, President Umaru Musa Yaradua died. He was the first elected president to die in office and the second head of state to die in Asurok after General Sani Abacha. It was not until after his death that Jonathan was able to see him. With Yaradua gone, all the controversies about who was president and who was not were laid to rest. The rest, they say, is history. The next day, Thursday, May 6, 2010, the acting president was sworn into office as the 14th head of state and the 4th executive president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. President Jonathan was now granted full powers of his office as enshrined in the Constitution. Twelve hours after the death of President Umaru Musa Yaradua, his vice, Goodluck Ibele Jonathan, was sworn in as a new president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria. It was the first time a vice president would succeed to the presidency due to the death of his boss. Before becoming the country's number one citizen, the new president had never before been elected to a public office by his own doing, but had somewhat always found himself in power 
after his principal has bowed out either through corruption charges or through death. In 2011, Jonathan would contest for a full term and win. He went on to rule in his own right for the next four years until his defeat in 2015. Good luck Jonathan's political career began in 1998 when dear Priye Alamesia, who was running for the governorship position in Bielsa State on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, invited him to join his campaign team. Jonathan later said he had joined Alamesia's campaign team to familiarize himself with the people in government. Alamesia then chose him to be his running mate. Their party won the elections and good luck Jonathan became the deputy governor of Bielsa State. They were sworn into office on May 29, 1999 and re-elected four years later in 2003. Jonathan ran a low profile and was fairly unknown as a deputy governor and was only heard of when he became the governor of Bielsa State following the arrest of Alamesia. Alamesia was on a trip to the United Kingdom for a health procedure when he was arrested and charged with money laundering. He was then impeached by the Bielsa State Assembly. Jonathan was reluctant to take over as governor but was compelled by the presidency to fill his superior's shoes and was sworn in on December 9, 2005 as the new governor of Bielsa State. He served the state for 18 months and remained loyal to the Alamesia family. However, a blight on his tenure as governor was when in September 2006, officials of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, seized $13.5 million from his wife, Patience Jonathan, at an airport. The Anti-Graft Commission ended up not reporting findings of their investigation on the source of the money to this day, and Jonathan was also not publicly charged, even though his name was on EFCC's list of corrupt governors. Notwithstanding, during the 2007 elections, Jonathan was picked as Umaru Yaradua's running mate by outgoing President Olusegun Obasanjo and his subsequent move to the center of power. While promoting Umaru Musa Yaradua as the PDP candidate for the 2007 elections, former President Olusegun Obasanjo chose Jonathan as Yaradua's running mate, not just because he was from the southern part of the country, but also because, according to him, Jonathan was loyal and honest. Obasanjo said this against the backdrop of how Jonathan reacted when his boss, Alamesia, was arrested. He was not hungry or desperate to take over, but was humble and still loyal to the governor. Obasanjo also chose him to somehow pacify Niger Deltans, who had been agitating for better representation and development in the region, and also find a lasting solution to the ongoing conflict by militants. Just like his usual self, Jonathan had at first been reluctant to become the vice president as he was content being the governor of his state, but later succumbed. His acceptance displaced former governor of River State, Dr. Peter Audley, who was deemed the party's choice of the vice president, but was rejected by Yara Dua. Though his appointment earned him political enemies, Jonathan was a source of pride to the Ijo nation and received their support. However, his campaign office, the Bielsa government house and even his family home were all attacked by perceived enemies who were against his emergence as the vice presidential candidate of the PDP. Jonathan was seen as an administrator and not a leader, but against all odds, he came out unscathed and went on to win the elections with Yaradua. On November 23, 2009, 
President Yaradua traveled to Saudi Arabia for medical treatment of pericarditis, but he did not officially hand over to his vice before leaving. A vacuum was created and the country was somewhat on the brink of a constitutional crisis. As expected, the Senate asked Yaradua to formally notify them of his absence so that his vice can take over as acting president. This was backed by calls from former heads of state, lawmakers and the Nigerian Bar Association. Also, the opposition was not left out. But some ministers allegedly opposed placing Jonathan as the acting president while his principal was ill and out of the country. Even the Attorney General, Michael Aonduaka, said at a press conference that Yaradua could rule from anywhere in the world as long as he was not incapacitated. However, the Minister of Information, Dora Akunyili, opposed Anonduaka's views and argued that the president's prolonged absence was damaging the country's image and threatening the economy, while she urged her colleagues to do the right thing. Jonathan was powerless to give orders as two commanders-in-chief could not function at the same time. He deployed soldiers to restore order in Jos Plateau State, where Muslims and Christians were clashing, killing hundreds. But this move was criticized by people who felt only the president was authorized to do such. The amnesty program initiated by Yaradua was also under threat of falling apart due to his absence and militants were on the verge of resuming attacks on oil facilities. On December 19, 2009, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta carried out their first attacks on an oil pipeline because of the delay in amnesty talks arising from Yaradua's absence. A lot of other scenarios played out across the country where the attention of the president was needed but unavailable, like the swearing-in of a new chief justice, which could only be done by the president and so many other cases where the government was helpless to do anything without authorization from their principal that was incommunicado. There were demonstrations from the Save Nigeria Group, Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, and others demanding the empowerment of Jonathan as acting president. The country's polity was heated up and on the brink of collapse. After seven weeks of silence, on January 12, 2010, President Yaradua spoke in a radio interview stating that he was recovering from his illness and would return home soon. This did nothing to ease tensions as he had given the interview in Hausa language and not English, which was the country's official language. The calls for him to either resign or hand power over to his vice intensified. Using the purported Yaradua's interview as a handover note, the National Assembly adopted the doctrine of necessity and vested Vice President Goodluck Jonathan the powers to act as president on February 9, 2010. After more than two months of stagnation, acting President Goodluck Jonathan took over the reins of government, albeit temporarily, and chaired his first cabinet meeting. Interestingly, the acting president sat on Yaradua's chair at the meeting. Jonathan then went on to remove his adversary, Michael Aonduaka, as attorney general and disbursed $2 billion from windfall oil savings to the 36 states and government agencies. On February 24, 2010, President Yaradua was smuggled into the country at 3 a.m. via the Namdi Azikwe Airport in Abuja. The alien president's handlers did this to check the burgeoning power of acting president Goodluck Jonathan. But Yaradua was still not well enough to rule as president. Unperturbed, Jonathan continued to lead the nation. He dissolved the cabinet and swore in 38 new ministers. He also signed a 2010 budget. Statements and counter-statements would erupt at the villa. There was now a power play between Yaradua and Jonathan's camps. This distraction would go on until President Umaru Musa Yaradua died on May 5, 2010. He was 58. 
with Yaradua dead, so did the storm at the presidential villa. The next day, May 6, 2010, Jonathan was sworn in by the Chief Justice of Nigeria as Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces. The new president was now in charge. President Jonathan vowed to fight corruption and promised to push through electoral reforms and organize credible elections in 2011. As the new president, Jonathan replaced the heads of the military and security services, thereby consolidating his hold on power. In September, he made known his intention to contest and run for president in the 2011 elections. Jonathan's campaign was hinged on his rags to riches story of him not having shoes as a child. Portraying himself as one who would understand the suffering of the masses, he encouraged the citizens, saying that if he could make it, so could they. He promised a break from the old and retrogressive ways things were being done in the country with the slogan, A Breath of Fresh Air. This was amid strong opposition from people who felt he was going back on his word of seven for only one term and others who felt he never merited the position he was given and as such had no real plan for the progress of the country. However, his aides argued that he had only completed the first term of his former boss, President Umaru Musa Yaradua, who had died whilst in office and was entitled to his own tenure. The election day came and Jonathan won, getting about 57% of all the votes against the 31% garnered by his major opponent, Muhammadu Buhari. While violence erupted in the north, the southerners were jubilant. However, Local and international observers judged the election as the fairest election the country had held since 1993. On May 28, 2011, President Goodluck Jonathan signed the Freedom of Information Bill into law. The FOI made public records and information more freely available. Growing the economy, creating jobs, providing happiness to all Nigerians, improving electricity and the healthcare sector, and providing efficient and affordable transportation and education for every child were the focus of his administration. Jonathan started work in earnest by unveiling his transformation agenda which sought to transform the country into one of the world's largest economies by the year 2020. Following up on his agenda, President Jonathan established nine new federal universities and strengthened existing ones. The target was to have at least one federal university in each state of the nation. To improve literacy in the North, 125 Amalgari schools were established across 13 northern states and girl education programs were introduced with 27 special girls schools in Adamawa, Akwaibom, Delta, Ebonyi, Ekiti, Nasarawa, Yobe, and Zamfara states. The Tertiary Education Trust Fund, TET Fund, was strengthened for capacity and infrastructure and over 8 million library resources were given to basic and secondary schools across the Federation. It was at this time Nigeria was rated as the largest economy in Africa and the 23rd in the world by both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund with a gross domestic product of $570 billion. The country also became the number one destination in Africa for foreign investors. In addition, the nation's labor force was impacted by the transformation agenda the National Youth Service Corps NYSC members saw an upward review of their monthly allowance from 9,700 Naira to 19,800 Naira. 
the minimum wage for civil servants was also increased to 18,900 naira per month. President Jonathan facilitated the country's space advancement by launching Nigeria Sat 2 and Nigeria Sat X satellites to provide internet bandwidth and provide early warning to prevent natural disasters. The National Space Research and Development Agency developed an indigenous synthetic aperture radar satellite to support security, secure coastal areas of the Niger Delta, and map out solid mineral deposits. Transformation also affected the country's agricultural sector. Food imports were reduced by over 40% in 2013, with an output of over 45 million metric tons. In 2014, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations ranked Nigeria as the world's largest producer of cassava. 120 million Naira grants were disbursed to 27 young farmers under the Youth Empowerment Agricultural Program and in 2015, 26 billion Naira was also disbursed for the Fadama Dry Season Farming Project by young farmers. The Bank of Industry also granted access to funds, grants, loans and other assistance to the tune of 25 billion naira to farmers in a bid to boost rice production which resulted in local rice production contributing 320 billion naira to the GDP of the country. Giving in to calls for national discourse, President Jonathan set up the Nigerian National Conference in 2014. It was headed by retired Chief Justice Idris Legbo Kutigi. Some recommendations made during the conference included the creation of state police and the drafting of state constitutions. However, Jonathan was unable to implement them before the end of his tenure. The transformation agenda also birthed the 35% affirmative action for women in politics. This led to more women being given top political positions. Notable among them is the first female Chief Justice of Nigeria, Miriam Aloma Mukta. Also worthy of note is the long dead and buried automobile industry in Nigeria, which was revived during the Jonathan administration. Nigeria's flagship indigenous automaker, Innocent Vehicle Manufacturing Company began selling their first made-in-Nigeria cars. Peugeot, Nissan, and Hyundai also started assembling small cars, trucks, and buses. A multi-modal transport system was introduced, which led to improvement in maritime safety and security, railways were restored, and water transportation was enhanced. 3,000 kilometers of rail lines which had been abandoned for many years were revived across the country. Intercity train services were also opened up. Despite the recorded successes, President Jonathan was accused of running one of the most expensive governments in the world. Allocations for feeding, refreshments and foreign troops were hugely budgeted for by his administration. President Jonathan created new ministries and split already merged ministries bringing the total number of ministries to 42, with each ministry being supervised by two ministers, that is, a substantive minister and a minister of state. There is also a permanent secretary, directors, personal assistants and special advisors. This action was contrary to the previous move made by former president Obasanjo when he reduced the number of ministries from 22 to 16 by merging some of them. Apart from the high cost of running the ministries, which led to high recurrent expenditure in the national budget, some of the ministers were accused of misappropriating funds. One notable example of such a minister was the former Minister of Aviation, Stella Odua, who the House of Representatives indicted for using 255 million naira to buy two armored BMW limousine cars for herself. Also, 
the Minister of Petroleum, Alison Madweke, was accused of spending 10 billion naira to purchase two private jets for her use. Another shortcoming of President Jonathan's administration was the frivolous budget allocation and budget padding that was being done. For example, in 2010, the budget reflected that 23 million naira would be used to maintain the presidential villa. 53 million naira was allocated for computer accessories at the villa and 1.19 million naira was approved for a canteen and purchasing kitchen equipment for the state house. The next year, all these allocations were expanded with nothing to show for it. 1.19 million naira was increased to 489 million naira for the same kitchen equipment. Computer accessories were boosted to 325 million naira and maintenance of the villa grew to 29 billion naira. In 2013, refreshments and meals had a budget of 327 million naira and the purchase of foodstuff was increased to 406 million naira. The vice president, Namadi Sambo, had his own allocation of 112 million naira for foodstuff, 123 million naira for refreshments, and 7 million naira for cooking gas. 72 million naira was also budgeted for fueling generators at the state house. The height of it all was a spending of 1 billion naira for President Jonathan's inauguration into office on May 29, 2011. It was a complete waste of money. Corruption was rife in the Jonathan administration and the president was slow to act in terms of prosecuting corrupt officials. In fact, Jonathan granted a presidential pardon to his former boss after the disgraced governor snuck back into the country dressed as a woman and evaded money laundering charges. Another big failure in President Jonathan's duty as Commander-in-Chief was his inability to curb insecurity issues in the country. On April 14, 2014, 276 schoolgirls were abducted by the militant Islamic group known as Boko Haram from a government secondary boarding school in Chibok, a town in Borno State. This event shook the nation to its core. Some of the girls were able to escape while others were released following campaigning efforts and government negotiations, but a lot more are still in captivity and yet to be accounted for as 16 of the girls were reportedly killed. President Jonathan also failed to put an end to the perennial clashes between Fulani herdsmen and farmers in the north-central region of the country. In 2013, over 100 police officers and other security agents were killed in a fell swoop by the Umbatse militia. The perpetrators were never brought to the book. Kidnapping became rampant in Bayelsa, Edo and Undo states. Targets included politicians, their family members and public officials. The country soon became one of the most dangerous places in the world to live in. Fuel scarcity was also a recurring affair during Jonathan's time in office. Existing refineries never worked at optimum capacity and no new refineries were built despite his promises of revamping existing refineries and building new ones. Reliance on imported fuel left the country at the mercy of oil marketers. Six trillion naira was spent on fuel subsidies unnecessarily. Nigeria, which had once been debt-free, was now swamped with an external debt of $9.377 billion and a domestic debt of $47.653 billion. Soon enough, citizens began to grumble and complain about the government. His many promises during the campaigns were not being fulfilled. Even former President Olusegu Obasanjo who was influential in Jonathan's rise to the presidency, wrote an open letter to the president condemning his administration. President Goodluck Jonathan had promised to work on the power sector, promising to do so within four years if he was voted in, but power dropped to less than 2,000 megawatts from the 3,000 megawatts that were operational when he assumed office. 
these failures would hurt the president in the re-election bid in 2015. The 2015 elections drew near and President Jonathan was getting set to run for a full second term in office. If he had won, he would have been the longest serving civilian president in Nigerian history. However, the president lost and he left the political scene quietly. President Goodluck Jonathan was greeted with stiff opposition as it was claimed that he had promised to only serve a term if he was chosen to represent the PDP in the 2011 elections, but Jonathan debunked such claims. Opposition parties took him to court, claiming that he had already served two terms and was not eligible to contest again. However, President Jonathan was cleared by an Abuja High Court, maintaining that going by the express provision of Section 137, Subsection 1, Article B of the 1999 Constitution, as amended, the president was eligible to contest for the 2015 presidential election. The court, presided by Justice Mudashiru Oniyongi, held that the president had only served his first term in office when he was sworn in on May 29, 2011, after winning the election, saying he only completed Yaradua's tenure following his death and it was not viewed as a term in office. The 2015 general elections were held on March 28 and 29, 2015. Unfortunately, Jonathan's good luck charm failed him. He lost to the former head of state, retired General Muhammad Buhari, who had 2.5 million votes more than him. With defeat staring at him in the face, President Jonathan did the unprecedented by congratulating his opponent on his victory, even before the results were officially announced. Two months later, the North returned to the seat of power with the swearing-in of Muhammad Buhari as Nigeria's fifth executive president on May 29, 2015. Before his electoral victory for the fourth time of asking, Muhammad Buhari had contested three times in two different political parties for Nigeria's highest political office in 2003, 2007, and 2011, respectively. But he lost in those three election periods. However, in 2015, he tried again and this time he defeated the incumbent President Goodluck Jonathan and was sworn in as Nigeria's fifth executive president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces on May 29, 2015. Buhari was the first opposition candidate to defeat an incumbent as president in Nigerian history. This was not President Buhari's first stint at the helm of affairs in Nigeria. Like President Olusegu Obasanjo, Muhammad Buhari, as a major general in the army, had ruled Nigeria as the country's fifth head of state from December 31, 1983 to August 27, 1985. Muhammad Buhari was 19 years old when he joined the Nigerian Military Training College in 1962 before undergoing cadet training at Mons Officer Cadet School in Aldershot, England. A year later, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant and made the platoon commander of the 2nd Infantry Battalion in Abeokuta, Ogun State. As a lieutenant, Buhari took an active part in the July coup of 1966 that ousted Nigeria's first military head of state, Major General Johnson Thomas Umunnakwe Aguyi Ronsi. Interestingly, Aguyi Ronsi and Buhari were the only military heads of state who were eligible for promotion but refused to promote themselves to the next rank while in office. Buhari rose through the military ranks to become a colonel and served as governor to the Northeast State and later petroleum minister under General Olusegun Obasanjo. In December 1983, 
Buhari overthrew the government of the democratically elected president, Shehu Shagari, thus bringing an end to Nigeria's Second Republic and returning the country to military rule. As head of state, Buhari was a strict disciplinarian and campaigned against all forms of indiscipline while leading the fight against corruption. Though his regime was initially welcomed, restriction on imports resulted in a loss of jobs and many businesses were grounded, leading to a fall in the standard of living and the citizens began to grumble. After 19 months as a dictator, Buhari was overthrown by his chief of army staff, Major General Ibrahim Babangida, on a Muslim holiday in August 1985. Muhammad Buhari contested elections under the All Nigeria People's Party ANPP in 2003 and 2007 and the Congress for Positive Change CPC in 2011. He finished as a runner-up in these elections. It was more or less frustrating for the former head of state and he was even quoted to have said that he would not contest again after the 2011 election. In 2003, Buhari's election bid was allegedly sabotaged by his political associates. He was defeated by the People's Democratic Party flag bearer, President Olusegun Obasanjo, by more than 11 million votes. The case was different in 2007, as his defeat was attributed to internal fractures within the ANPP because he had been so close to clinching the presidential seat if the party had been united but was knocked out by the PDP's candidate and his fellow kinsman, Umaru Musa Yaradua. Buhari had contested Yaradua's victory, but without the party's support, his case was thrown out. Even his running mate at the time, Chief Edwin Ume Ezioke, distanced himself from Buhari's claims that the results of the elections were bogus. However, President Yaradua acknowledged that his victory was bloated and got to work fixing the electoral system. Meanwhile, thoroughly upset with the actions of the officials of the ANPP, Buhari decided never to contest on the party's platform. He joined the CPC and was unanimously adopted as a presidential candidate for the 2011 elections, contesting against President Goodluck Jonathan of the People's Democratic Party. Once again, Buhari lost at the polls, getting 32% of the votes against 59% polled by President Jonathan. Although the elections were averred to have been the freest and fairest that had been held in the country since 1999, the results led to widespread religious and ethnic tensions in the northern part of the country, where Buhari had been the strongest support. As usual, a lawsuit challenging the results and asking for a nullification of the elections was filed at the Court of Appeal in Abuja, but it was struck out. In 2013, the Congress for Progressive Change CPC the Action Congress of Nigeria and the All Nigerian People's Party ANPP merged their parties to form the All Progressive Congress APC. While the ruling party PDP contended with internal squabbles, the APC waxed stronger, welcoming new members who had defected from their parties, the majority of them from the PDP. The APC presidential primary for the 2015 elections was conducted in a credible and transparent setting and was also televised live for all to monitor. There were four candidates vying for the position, but Buhari emerged victorious. APC's popularity grew steadily compared to the PDP, whose hold on the country had started to wane. The failures of the government were brought to the precipice and Buhari promised a new beginning for the country. Change became the motto of the APC and it was widely advocated on billboards, at campaign rallies, on television, through documentaries and in newspaper editorials. Social media was not left out. Facebook and Twitter proved to be very effective tools in gaining awareness, especially among the youth. 
apart from engaging in personality attacks against the opposition, especially Muhammad de Buhari, the PDP had a lot of misses with their adverts. An example was the disastrous Bring Back Our President, which was a parody of the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag. The presidency quickly dissociated itself. The height of it all was when the first lady, Patience Jonathan, while campaigning on behalf of her husband in Calabar Cross River State, asked voters to throw stones at anyone who talked to them about change. The APC swiftly reported the issue to the International Criminal Court and the National Human Rights Commission cautioned against making hate speeches. Running a more responsible campaign that capitalized on President Jonathan's weaknesses and that of the PDP, the APC slowly warmed their way into the hearts of Nigerians. Riding on the back of his achievements while he was head of state, Buhari was presented to all as an incorruptible and disciplined man compared to President Jonathan, whose government was described to be very corrupt. Buhari promised to provide 5 million jobs and 4 million homes through a flexible mortgage plan, fund small and medium-scale enterprises, and invest in entertainment, agriculture, information technology, and manufacturing and infrastructure in the six geopolitical zones in the country affordable food supply, uninterrupted power supply, and improvement in the educational sector were also part of his campaign promises. Nigerians happily lapped all these promises and stood solidly behind the retired general who proclaimed himself a reformed democrat. Postponing the election dates also helped to sway support from the PDP to the APC. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, headed by Professor Atahiru Jaga, were on their toes and accrediting voters while biometric voter identification was introduced. Election Day finally arrived on March 28, 2015, and despite some hitches, it was a more peaceful and smoother process than had been witnessed in the country and large turnouts were recorded. Aine collated the votes over three days, which was televised to inspire trust and confidence in both the incumbent and the opposition and show transparency of the process. Voting concluded on March 29 and results began to stream in with the APC in the lead. This was not unusual, as the same had happened during the 2011 elections, with the opposition leading before the PDP caught up and overtook the CPC by large margins. However, the same scenario did not play out in 2015 as the APC maintained their lead in both the presidential and legislative elections. By the third day, tensions had begun to rise as PDP supporters tried to frustrate the coalition process by protesting on live television and accusing the INEC chairman of bias and tribalism. Former Minister of the Niger Delta, Godde Orubebe, spearheaded the protest as APC's comfortable lead became worrisome. In the end, the APC polled 53.96% of the total votes, while the PDP polled 44.96%. After 30 years, Buhari had the opportunity to once more rule Nigeria, but this time as a democratically elected official. Buhari's I belong to everybody and I belong to nobody statement formed the basis of his speech at his inauguration on May 29, 2015. His choice of words indicated his gratitude to Nigerians for believing in him enough to vote for him and assured the citizens of his willingness to serve and fulfill his campaign promises which were summarized into three major points which were fighting insecurity, tackling corruption and reviving the economy. The new president promised a reasonable and accountable government at all levels in the country, adding that Nigerians would not regret voting for APC. He also thanked President Jonathan for his statesmanship in setting a precedent by humbly accepting defeat and handing power over peacefully. Welcoming him into his new role as the country's number one citizen, Nigeria shown signs of heading into recession just one month after. At first, 
The economic performance increased in 2015, but 2016 was the year the country went into recession. The story changed in 2017, but the economy was still quite shaky up until 2019. Realizing that state workers were not paid, President Buhari embarked on bailout programs, giving lifelines to state governors to enable them to pay the backlog of salaries being owed. He also instituted a well-coordinated program to disburse the Paris Club refund. Financing options available to the country were diversified by the president, and he opted for Sukok to finance road projects all over the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. In 2017, 10 new standard rail gauge routes were identified in President Buhari's rail development plan, and the agricultural sector received a huge boost as the Central Bank of Nigeria, through the Anchors Borrowers Program ABP, supported rice farmers. Although violent clashes between herders and farmers overshadowed these great investments, the federal government also introduced a school feeding program to boost enrollment. The NPAR program was rolled out to absorb unemployed graduates and participants were transferred to primary and secondary schools in all the 774 local governments in the country. All of these achievements paled in comparison to realities evident all around the country. The rate of unemployment was on the rise, foreign reserves dipped, and inflation was affecting the prices of goods and services while insecurity caused by banditry and terrorism persisted. Nigerians were beginning to lament the change they had been promised. Apart from the somewhat economic woes, President Buhari's health was a source of concern. In June 2016, he traveled to the United Kingdom for a medical checkup. He also did the same in January 2017. Both times, his vice acted in his stead as president. Despite the outcry from the people, President Buhari contested elections for a second term in 2019 and was re-elected after defeating Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, winning in 19 states while Atiku was victorious in 17. The PDP rejected the results, accusing the APC of manipulating the votes. There were concerns over the conduct of the administration, like the suspension of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Walter Onoge, by President Buhari just before the election, an alleged colluding with INEC to rig the elections. Electoral violence, which had previously waned in the last general elections, reared its ugly head again, and there was a low turnout of voters due to the populace having no faith in the country anymore. Insurgents in the northeastern part of the country, Boko Haram seemed to have reinforced their efforts in causing terror across the region as there was an increase in banditry and kidnapping as they freely attacked villages and schools without any restrictions. So many events took place during Buhari's second term in office. Notable among them was the banning of the social media platform Twitter for seven months and the NSAS protest in October 2020. In October 2020, Nigerian youth embarked on an NSARS protest to demand the disbandment of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, SARS unit, as well as other reforms in the Nigerian Police Force, NPF. The protest, which began as a peaceful gathering of thousands of young people, quickly devolved into chaos after being hijacked by hoodlums. The hijacked protest subsequently led to mob attacks on security personnel, killings and vandalization of public and private properties. Set up in 1992 to mainly combat the rise of armed robbery in Nigeria, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, SARS unit of the Nigerian police, has since become notorious for kidnapping, random arrest, extortion, torture of suspects, gruesome extrajudicial killings and running detention facilities, which some survivors had called an abattoir. The unit was investigated several times in response to protest, but without results. Reforms were then promised in 2016, 2017, 2018 and 2019. However, 
The unit was eventually disbanded on October 11, 2020, after worldwide protests moved the government to act. The NSAS movement started in 2017 when Nigerian youths protested against the defunct police unit. However, the movement was revived in October 2020 after a viral video emerged of police officers thought to be members of the SARS unit allegedly killing an unarmed young man in Delta State. He was later said to have survived the assault. This prompted Nigerian youths to troop to social media, especially Twitter, calling on the federal government to put a stop to the menace. Unfortunately, on October 20, 2020, the Nigerian security forces, according to reports, killed at least 12 peaceful protesters at the Lekki toll gate, a temporary end to the protest. The hashtag NSARS reached its highest engagement on social media, especially Twitter, in October 2020. It was created to demand the disbandment of the SARS unit of the Nigerian police force, which was notorious for its alleged brutality and breaches of human rights. Although the government reportedly made structural reforms to SARS, exploitation and other human rights violations persisted. Many celebrities and activists organized a support campaign on social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and within a few days, Demonstrators were lining the streets of Lagos and Abuja, calling for the end of SARS. The protests soon spread to other major cities in the country. On Sunday, October 11, 2020, the Nigerian government, under pressure from the worldwide media attention the protests had brought forth, quickly declared the dissolution of the notorious SARS unit. However, in light of similar statements made by the government in the past, this action did not go far enough to placate the demonstrators. For instance, the Inspector General of Police declared on December 2017 that SARS had been forbidden from conducting stop and search operations as a result of several harassment reports. The IGP openly reannounced this restriction in 2018 and 2020, demonstrating the futility of earlier directives. The announcement of a centralized FSARS Federal Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which would be overseen by the Inspector General of Police rather than State Commissioners of Police, as was the case with the previous iteration, was made shortly after this declaration. Only a few weeks later, the IGP stated that FSARS would be shut down and that it would revert to its previous decentralized structure under the control of State Commissioners. In light of previous actions and setbacks, protested added to their list of demands, requesting reparations for SARS violence victims, police officer retraining, and trials for convicted SARS executives. According to reports, SARS and other Nigerian police divisions often imprison detainees without charge or trial for months or even years at a time. In Nigeria, pretrial detention lasts on average three years and ten months. A holding charge which allows the police to file a charge against an accused before a lower court that lacks the authority to hear the case while waiting for the director of public prosecution's opinion is typically used to implement such protracted detentions. Despite being declared unconstitutional by the Nigerian court, this practice continues. Indeed, before 2020, there had been anti-police brutality demonstrations in Nigeria. But the 2020 NSAS demonstrations were notable for their scope, duration, and scale. Numerous instances of SARS officers and other NPF employees violating human rights have been extensively recorded by advocates and researchers over the years. Amnesty International claimed in a 2016 investigation that SARS personnel often tortured and mistreated detainees, many of whom were arbitrarily imprisoned, forced to confess or paid bribes to be released. The organization corroborated its claims in June 2020. However, protests erupted in early October and got more intense as famous people around the world showed their support for the protesters. 
A government crackdown on marches in mid-October sparked additional protest. Many activists criticized President Muhammad Buhari's dissolution of SARS on October 11 as being insufficient, comparing it to earlier reforms that largely failed to reduce SARS misconduct. In fact, NSARS evolved from a demonstration against police violence into a campaign for social justice and political change. The protests have been referred to as a vector for larger dissatisfaction with Nigeria's political class. The 2020 demonstrations against police brutality shook Nigerian cities. The U.S. State Department described some organizations as credible international organizations and claimed that these organizations had previously accused SARS members of committing serious human rights violations, confirming the allegations made by the Nigerian people. The effectiveness of the NSARS protests may have been one of the reasons behind the decision of the Nigerian government to ban Twitter on June 5, 2021. Governors in numerous states, including Lagos, enforced curfews or forbade protests while the disturbance persisted. The protests would come to a temporary end with a reported shooting of unarmed protesters by Nigerian security forces at the Lekki toll gate. According to reports, on Tuesday, October 20, 2020, the Nigerian security forces used live fire to disperse protesters in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial metropolis, at the Lekki toll gate, killing several people and injuring many more. The shooting was said to have begun around 6.45 p.m. and lasted until after midnight. Many protesters were reported to be hurt, while some others lost their lives. Local hospitals reportedly treated injured demonstrators from the Lekki toll gate. Throughout the protest, demonstrators were confronted with disproportionate force meted against them. They had been beaten, humiliated and arrested. Crowds were also dispersed with water cannons and tear gas. Authorities targeted anyone seen as a financial supporter or leader of the NSAS movement. To keep them in the country, some had their bank accounts frozen or their passports taken away from them. A good number of world leaders condemned the government crackdown on protesters. On October 22, 2020, the United States, through its Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo criticized the use of excessive force by the Nigerian security forces that opened fire on peaceful protesters in Lagos and demanded that they exercise complete restraint and respect fundamental rights. Following reports of attacks on police stations and prisons, as well as instances of violence directed specifically at particular ethnic groups, some crowds engaged in violence and looting. Nigerian authorities have accused criminals of co-opting the protest and promised to put an end to further unrest. Meanwhile, opposition leaders and activists claimed that security authorities had hired or allowed armed gangs to disperse peaceful protesters. The theft of food from retailers brought the financial predicament of many Nigerians to light once more. Government officials came under fire from critics for hoarding COVID-19 relief supplies rather than distributing them to those in need. It appeared that the lucky tragedy caused a significant collapse of law and order. Three of the country's most famous news organizations were punished for airing social media footage of the NSAS protest and security forces allegedly shooting protesters. The NSAS protests pushed the Nigerian authorities to dismantle the Special Anti-Robbery Squad Unit and states throughout the country established judicial committees to probe the unit's crimes. On Saturday, October 24, 2020, the NSAS protests actively came to a stop with the announcement of curfews all over Nigeria. 
However, Nigerians in the diaspora continued with protest in Zurich, Paris, New Zealand, Berlin, Toronto, Brussels, and other cities around the globe. Until October 2020, Nigerians had been content with whatever the system offered. The country's leaders took its citizens for granted. However, a generation that has learned to do things differently spoke up about their demands for justice and a better society and insisted with grim determination on a reform in the security architecture of the country. Those youths decided to stop playing the ostrich and took the bull by its horns. At the top of their voices, they only wanted one thing. End SARS.